Ayan, magandang magandang umaga po sa ating lahat, sa ating mga participants. Welcome po sa ating 27th Sinism. Hello po. Ayan, so naimbag. Nga, naimbag. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so naimbag na bigat. Ayan, so na nakita ko po kasi na meron tayong mga taga-Cagayan Valley dyan. At isa po kong ibanag, ang tatay ko po ay ibanag, Mapa, Mapia nga umawawahi! Ayan! Hello everyone! And we are 
here live and alive streaming from UP Baguio, the University of the Philippines Baguio. So medyo malamig-lamig po pero maaraw. Ang ganda po ng araw ngayon. And welcome to this 27th Cinism. We are so happy personally. I'm so happy to be here with you all. And to begin this Summer Institute in the, of, in the Natural Sciences and Mathematics, let us begin this program, of course, by singing our national anthem. And this will be followed by the singing of UP Naming Mahal. Bayang magiliw, pero sa silang anan, alam na puso sa titay mo'y buhay. Lupang inirang, kaya ka lang makiting Sa manlulupit, ikaw pa sisiit Sa lagat at pungtok sa simulan Sa langit pa baha, may dinag kong tumatawit Sa pagtayang minamahal Ang kisat ng mataw at mo'y tagumpay na nagtitig Ang bituwing nataro ng kailan Mamay di magdililing Lupa ng araw ang wala Ating pagsinta Mula'y langit sa piling mo Ang inigaya na pa Ay mawaki Ang mamatay ng dahil sa'yo And welcome to this 27th Cinism. So we are streaming live dito po sa City of Pines at the University of the Philippines, Baguio. And I am Ethel Ruth A. Bakiran, kapwa niyong guro, kapwa niyong nagma-masters, kung sino man po dyan ang kumukuha ng masters, and kapwa niyong plantita. So ako po ang inyong lingkod for this morning uh, as your host, MC and moderator. So... Isa po akong Cagayano, isa po akong anak ng Ibanag at Ilocano. At gusto ko po sanang malaman ano, kung saan galing yung mga participants natin ngayon. So you may key it in here in our chat. Ayan, so nag-start na po yung iba na mag-greet from their respective provinces. And that's very fun to know. That's very exciting to know, honestly. Ayan, so meron tayong mga taga-Cagayan Valley, Davao, Bicol. 
Kay Pangasinan, Lawag, La Union. Ayan, so naimbag nga bigat. Um, bilang kabilang tayo sa iba't ibang probinsya ngayon, bilang nasa iba't ibang parte tayo ngayon ng Pilipinas, I am sure we are very much aware how rich our biodiversity is in this country. And we have a lot of endemic species, okay? Pero at the same time, there is also rampant destruction of our natural um, habitats and all these natural resources. And bilang kakalabas lang din ng IPCC assessment or yung intergovernmental panel, on climate change, binigay nila yung mga different parts ng assessment nila and lately lang lumabas na kung paano natin mamimitigate, paano tayo makakapag-adapt sa climate change. And dito, talagang inamin nila na tayong mga developing countries, tayo yung nakaka-ramdam nung brunt, nung impacts ng climate change kahit na kukunti lang yung nai-contribute naman natin sa carbon footprint, okay, sa global carbon footprint. And that is what we call yung unjustness ng climate change. But it is too late then to um to blame, you know, yung kung aling kung aling generation it is to blame because this is an intergenerational problem and this is also um this needs to be addressed by everyone okay so i would like to commend this year's cynicism and of course the department of biology as well in bringing into the conversation these sustainable development goals and in this year's cynicism the department of biology brings to us the sub theme rekindling appreciation of biodiversity from classroom to community so it is our goal na at the end of this three-day workshop ay maiba, may maibaon tayong mga ways sa pag-aaral ng biodiversity at conservation na makakatulong din sa community at schools kung saan tayo nabibilang. Okay? So gusto ko po sanang itake in time na to, to acknowledge the efforts of the Cynism Committee sa pamumuno po ni Ma'am Mayje Bagangaw ang Department of Biology, of course, at ang Systems and Networks Office na patuloy na sumusuporta sa mga gaitong events ng kolehiyo at syempre ng universidad. Maraming maraming salamat po sa inyo. Now, to proceed with our program, let us first hear from the Dean of the College of Science, UP Baguio, for her opening remarks. Let us welcome Ma'am Dimfna Javier. On behalf of the College of Science, I am delighted to warmly welcome all the plenary speakers, resource persons, facilitators, and the lifelong learning participants of the 27th Summer Institute in the Natural Sciences and Mathematics. Since the 1990s, Cynism has trained thousands of mostly secondary and tertiary level teachers from the Cordillera region and beyond. The Cynism aims to promote and enhance understanding of science and mathematics concepts for the purpose of clarifying the workings of the natural and built environments and interrelationships therein. The spirit of the Cynism is aligned with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number four which is to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. The Cynism also aims to give inputs to other SDG goals, such as ensuring good health and well-being, promoting sustainable economic growth and decent work, advancing sound infrastructure, industrialization, and innovation, taking action to address climate change and its impacts, and conserving and sustainably using terrestrial and marine resources. This year's cynicism is Yuri Baguio's contribution to celebrate the International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development, or development that meets the needs of the present while enabling future generations to meet their own. 
Carrying over the theme from last year's cynicism, the 2022 theme is Grading Senior High School Science and Mathematics Education, Content and Competency Part 2. Over a 12-day period in April, there will be more than 40 insightful online lectures and engaging workshops in a wide variety of topics in mathematics, statistics, computer science, physics, chemistry, climate change, earth science, health, biodiversity, and physical education. We are sincerely honored and privileged that despite the pandemic, you are here devoting time to the cynicism. We applaud our participants' continuing efforts in upgrading their capabilities in science teaching and learning. We hope that each of you will learn and relearn concepts and appropriate techniques that will further enrich your roles as educators and or science practitioners. We also hope that the knowledge and skills you gain will help strengthen your abilities to improve lives and prospects for everyone and everywhere. Let me take this opportunity to applaud the energetic team of the College of Science faculty, staff, and research assistants. Their steadfast, collective, and creative work has made possible the conduct of this event despite the challenges of COVID-19. I wish everyone productive and safe cynicism. Gandang araw at maming salamat po. Thank you so much, Dean, for such an empowering message. Thank you po sa pag-acknowledge din ng efforts ng ating respective committees as well as faculty, staff, and yung mga kapwa ko din na research assistants. So, mula pa noon ay nagbibigay serbisyo na pala ang Sinism Committee ng UP Baguio. With that, before we start this um, three-day workshop of lectures and workshop demos, let us first hear a few reminders and netiquette before we begin with the lecture proper. Good day, participants, and welcome again to the 27th Summer Institute in the Natural Sciences and Mathematics. Before we start with the lecture per se, here are a few reminders for this webinar. First, the entire proceedings of this webinar will be recorded for documentation purposes. All attendees of the webinar, except for the moderators and speakers, should keep their cameras switched off and their microphones on mute during the webinar and the subsequent open forum or Q&A. In case that the webinar is interrupted due to a technical problem, all are asked to wait for 10 minutes to give the meeting hosts time to resolve the problem or in case that the problem cannot be fixed to announce that the webinar has been suspended and will be rescheduled. During the open forum, all those wanting to ask questions should send their queries via the Q&A function of the Zoom webinar or in the comment section of the YouTube streaming. The moderator will determine if follow-up questions can still be accommodated or not. After the web webinar, Participants are enjoined to accomplish an evaluation form and the link for the said form will be posted on the chat feature of the Zoom meeting and the comment section of the YouTube streaming. Before we proceed to the next, the College of Science Cynicism Committee wishes to thank the UPB System and Network Office for their enormous support to this event. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the lectures. Ayan. So, let us be reminded of all these uh, reminders and this netiquette, please. Okay, so for our first speaker this morning, he is a graduate of UP Baguio, and he took his MS degree at the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, majoring in zoology with a minor in animal science. Here, he worked extensively on nonvolent mammals and their ectoparasites. So, very fascinating ang kanyang line of interest. At dito po siya na-expose ng husto sa fieldwork. 
and field methods. So he just recently finished his PhD in biology at UP Diliman just last July, and he has come ba back from his study leave, okay? And now he is teaching again here at UP Baguio, and he is currently our college secretary. So here to give a lecture on rodents and associated parasites is the current college secretary and fieldwork biologist, Dr. Ar Aris Reginaldo. Okay, good morning. So for this session, I'll be presenting to you a topic on the rodents and their parasite. For, for this uh, uh, presentation, these are the topics that we will be covering. We'll look into uh, basic definitions or just an overview about rodents and parasites. We'll also, uh, I'll also present at, uh, techniques on how to collect rodents or the host. Also, a topic on how to handle rodents. Um, also, there are also two topics uh, that will cover identification of rodents and uh, basic things that you need to know about the identifications of the parasites. Okay, so let's begin by first looking at the uh, general definitions of what rodents are and what parasites are. So let's begin with the rodents. So the word rodent is actually uh, the first uh, the first image that comes into your mind probably is this animal. It's furry, it has long tail, and probably you could call it ew, or maybe because it's always associated with um, with canals or with trash. So this species of rat, okay, uh, uh, is one of the one one example of rodent. So, but the, take note also that there are other species of beautiful species of rodents, such as this one. This is um, an endemic to the central cordillera. We call this the Crotomys whitehead eye or the striped shrew rat. Uh, one distinct characteristic that you could you could easily see in this um, in this animal is that it has uh, a white lining or maybe light brown lining that start from its forehead down to the base of its tail. Also uh, notable about this animal is the relatively large uh, uh, ears compared to its uh, the size of its body. Okay, uh, in contrast or uh, for the parasite, so worms would probably the first image that you could also think about when you hear the word parasite. But the group of uh, parasite would also include uh, much larger species of parasite. We call them ectoparasites, such as this one. So, kung tititigan niyo yan, makikilala niyo na ito ay isang species ng flea. Okay? So, I hope... Um, these are uh, basic information that you already know. So we are just uh, taking time to refresh ourselves so that we can appreciate more uh, the other sections of this presentation. Okay, next. So to be more technical a bit, because this is biology, so rodent comes from the, 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 biolo the biological group known as the rodentia, or this is an order. So if you know your, cl your classification from kingdom, uh, phylum or order. So this is a large group of, uh, of species called rodentia. So dun din galing yung uh, word na rodent. So rodentia or rodents technically or formally, okay, would include several other species such as squirrel, the beaver, or even the porcupine. Okay. Ngayon, yung, yung common uh, term natin na rodent, uh, mas nag, parang ginagamit kasi na natin siya to pertain to the rat or the mouse because these are more uh, common uh, species under the order Rodentia and in terms of even of the abundance, okay, there are also many species that are uh, cosmopolitan or commensal, so they live with humans, so you always associate or at least kapag binabanggit natin yung word na rodent, we primarily refer to the rat or the mouse, but again, technically, uh, the rat, uh, rat, the rats or mice are, are, are part of another family or just one family under the order of Densha, the family of Muridae. So, sila talaga, ito talaga yung pamilya that contains, okay, the rats and the mice. And more formally, uh, 
it's more appropriate to call rats and mice as the new reads then. Okay, so among taxonomists, taxonomists yung nagamit, pag sinabi natin mu reads then, ito yung, ito yung um, uh, mas tamang terminology to refer to the rats and the mice. Okay, so ito yung mga examples ng rats and mice. So ang isang madalas tanungin sa, sa atin ay yung difference daw ng rats uh, or the rat or the mouse okay uh, so morphologically wala namang difference yun kasi again they belong to as the same family they share similar characteristic pero na associate lang yung uh, often the 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 definition or at least yung common definition na ginagamit to differentiate rats and mice is the, the size so rats are generally uh, generally large whereas mouse are generally small so dito, para makikita nyo, pinagpare-pareho po yung mga sizes nila. So hindi mo na malalaman kung mouse or rat. Pero meron ding mga, so because we are referring to body size, sometimes makikita natin na parang medyo maliit yung, maliit, maliit yung, yung size niyan. So that's probably a mouse. So for example, the, this upper um, top photo here, you might probably call this as a rat because it looks big. Okay, the middle photo then you might refer to this or initially identify this as a mouse and you are right when you've um, you've thought so okay because this is also considered as as a mouse tapos ito whether in mouse or rat or of course cloud rats are rats but take note that in in the philippines for example meron din mga cloud rat tayong dwarf so kung may giant cloud rat because these are big uh, meron din mga mas maliliit na parang ganito so um as uh, dwarf cloud rat naman ang tawag doon okay so in the philippines pwede natin gamitin yung word then na uh, rodents in the philippines because most of our species na ng, that and that is that are under rodentia consist of rats and the mice or the murids mangila sobrang ilan ilan lang na mapapangalan natin uh, there once there's one species in palawan for uh, uh shrew for example Okay, tapos dun sa Mindanao. Pero sa Luzon, wala tayong species ng ibang uh, rodent, kundi yung rat and mice talaga. So, kaya pag binabanggit mo talaga yung rodent, so parang more likely nire-refer natin siya as the rats and the uh, mice. Okay, so let's take a look uh, briefly uh, on the, I mean, the several species, representative species of the common rodents in the Philippines. So they are generally classified into two groups, the native and the non-native species. Okay, so when you say native, so they are, uh, they live uh, in the Philippines for a very, very long time. Probably they've, I also, they've, some of them I have spatiated here. They're a product of, of evolutionary processes. Non-native on, on the other hand are, uh, some of them have been brought to the Philippines deliberately. So ito yung hindi ito yung talagang natural nilang home. So for example, so these are the common species of non-native. Sometimes uh, we also call them as pest species because of the, the agricultural damage that they, they, they cause. So this image here on the uh, lower, I mean, the bottom left uh, image is called the Ratus Tanizumio. This is the oriental house rat. This is more common in higher elevation, at least on Luzon. And then there's a counterpart. Ito yung katawag nating rice field rat, which is ito yung talagang common sa mga rice, uh, rice field. Okay. And then a much smaller species of ratus, which is the ratus exulans, about 20 to 30 grams, about this size. Okay, para lang alam yung scale niya. So that's the ratus exulans. Okay, yung mga itong dalawa, itong uh, Argenti venter saka Tanezumi, mas malalaki sila about this one that some of them, some individuals may reach up to uh, 250 to 300 grams. Okay, compared to this one, uh, 20 to 30 grams lang, para lang may imagine nyo. And then several other um, species, most of them are endemic to certain island uh, on the, in the Philippines. Okay, so the isn't it they are beautiful? So ito yung pinakita ko sa inyo kanina, the Crotomys whitehead eye. So most of the other uh, two, generally the mayroong dalawang grupo ng native or endemic species sa Pilipinas, yung earthworm group and uh, um, the cloud rat group. Okay, so ito makita nyo, for example, this Rincomys. 
Okay, so kumakain sila ng forests, uh, species ng mga earthworm din. And marami pa, so apat lang yung pinakita natin dito. So we can call this as also rodents of from the Philippines. Okay, now, do they have parasites? Uh, 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 yes, I could say that. Kasi yung ibang sample din na nakuha namin from uh, nagaling sa endemic species, may mga parasite din. But for this activity and this exercise, we'll just be focusing on the parasites that we, we can collect or we can observe from the pest or the non-native species. Okay, um, and then take note of this, not the species. There is one species that is very common uh, from lowland to the upland. This is a rat-looking animal. So, mapagkakamala nyo. Siyempre, tayo iba-iba. So, yung dialect natin, ang tawag natin dyan, iba. So, siyempre, uh, sa Ilocano, sabihin namin, bao. O kaya, uh, meron din, ang tawag ito, ewan kung ginagamit yung word na sangyu. Okay? But of course, this is not a uh, member of neither, uh, it's not a rodentia or not, it's not also a murid, but this is uh, a shrew. Okay? under the order uh, Soricomorpha. Okay, there's just an error here. This, this should be sor uh, Soricomorpha na yung um, order niya. Okay, so hindi siya rat or uh, mice. Next, let's also uh, look at uh, briefly yung group ng parasites. So the first thing that comes to mind probably um, is the general classification of parasite, the informal classification of endoparasite or ectoparasite. This definition or, or characteristic is based on uh, whether you find them inside the body of the animal or the host, or whether they are found or they live or they feed on the surface of the skin. Okay, so ecto pag nasa labas din. Now, one thing that we can note about uh, parasite as a, of course, as an, as an important information that we need to consider whenever we do class activity about these organisms that they are morphologically diverse. So unlike yung sa rodentia kanina, which is just, which is just one of the, the, the probable host of many parasites, okay? Yung, yung, feature, yung feature ng mga parasite ay iba-iba because, of course, they're represented by various phyla from the, um, from the unicellular from the unicellular phy uh, phylum to the, uh, the to, to the other larger taxa, yung mga macro uh, organism, parang um, Okay, and then so yung mga representative natin dito ng um, ng ng phylum, okay, like for example, yung group ng amoeba, Apicomplexa, Ciliophora, uh, micros microspora. Then, meron din yung group ng helmets and worms. So, you're more familiar with this probably. Yung group ng trematoda, cestoda, at saka nematoda. And then, there's another group, yung arthropod group. Okay? So, yung either these are represented by the arachnida or the insecta group. So, alam nyo naman siguro yung mites, the ticks, uh, uh, lice, and the uh, fleas. Okay? Next, um, uh, another feature that adds to the, the diversity in form of, of parasite is the presence of several life stages in some groups, especially yung mga helmets. So there, there is a, there's an egg stage and then there's an adult stage. And between the egg stage and the adult stage, meron pang mga larval or larvae stage. So depende dun sa gusto nyong observe okay? Uh, kailangan nyo malaman kung ano yung stage na nandoon sa, for example, if you have fecal, fecal sample, then more likely that you'll find there, well, several stages of larvae, yung maliliit pa lang na nag-hatch na, or uh, uh, eggs yung makikita doon. So, ngayon, kung adults yung target ninyo, so puntahan nyo yung kung saan yung talagang nag-grow na yung adult form, and when they, um, they, they sexually reproduce. So, for example, sa intestines, yun yung dapat target na tissue mo kung gusto mong makita ng adult uh, uh, parasites. Okay, but of course for the arthropoda, meron din sila maganyan, meron din stages din sila. Yung iba nandun sa soil, okay, dun lang muna sila. Tapos yung adult nila, when they, when they feed, dun yung matichempuhan nyo na nandun sila sa, uh, sa body ng host. But uh, there's one group ng arthropod din, yung, yung, yung lice or the louse. So gaya sa human, siyempre yung itlog nandun din sa buhok natin. So sa ulo, hanggang iba-ibang stages, hanggang kahit hanggang adult, 
Okay, nagfi-fit nandoon pa rin siya sa 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 body ng animal. Okay, pero yung mites and then the ticks and then even the fleas uh transient lang sila doon. So they could move move to and out of the uh the body of the animal depending on the on the stage. Okay? Next so ito lang yung overview of the the things or maybe the the, the parasites that we can expect or that we can use as part of our class activity to upgrade our uh, level of the way how we teach uh, biology in our classes sa high school. So the, the the protozoa group is represented, for example, by amoeba, the trematoda. So alam niyo na din yung fluke. Okay, so these are uh, large to small uh, animals that, that may be found in, the, for example, dun sa lungs. Yung tapeworm, alam na alam niyan because it's also common in humans. So represented by yung group ng cestoda. Nematoda is also known as the roundworm and this uh, the, the photographs on the left are examples of arthropods. So, yan yung peak and then the light, the louse and the flea. Here are some other photographs photographs of uh, ectoparasites that we collected in, in, in our field works. Okay, so ito, tick ito, this is um, uh, an earlier stage dun sa life, life cycle ng tick. Kaya para mapapansin nyo, parang anim pa lang yung kanyang appendages. Okay, kasi dapat uh, ano yan, uh, walo, kasi it's, it's arachnid. And then the two the photographs labeled as B and C are possible different two different species of, of lice. So you can see the pattern on the abdominal or maybe the, the lines on the body of the animal. Magkaiba sila. And even itong D and E, so magkaiba din yung form nila. Okay, but this could also just be male or female. But um, the Philippines... Wala kasi tayong expert on ectoparasite din kasi kaya hindi makamove on, move on yung uh, science natin sa ectoparasite. So even me, even when I work on small mamas, um, di ko pa rin ma-publish yung work kasi walang mag-verify mag ng mga identifications natin. Okay? And then, but if you are interested, so if you want to pursue masters in biology, for example, then if you're interested with parasites, then you could always pursue and we could direct you to other experts from other parts of the world para mapurso natin yung uh, science na yan. Okay, now another one that uh, we use to, to distinguish or at least look at the relationship between parasite and the animal is we call the animal as the host because as we know, parasites are dependent okay, on, the, on the animal for its um, nourishment. Most of the, you know, especially yung, yung adult stage nila, talagang nakadepend sila sa host nila. So I, I, I show you this because I would also want to mention that the host, which, for example, a rodent could be what we call a definitive host or an intermediate host. But most of the time, um, yung, yung rodent are definite, uh, rodents are definitive hosts. That means to say these are the, this is the, the host in which the sexual reproduction uh, takes place. So more likely, dun yung nakikita yung adult stage ng, uh, ng mga parasite kung mga helmets yun. But of course, ectoparasite, parang just like any other mammal, makita nyo sila sa skin nila. Okay? Um, so because I mentioned about definitive hosts and intermediate hosts, so it, let me also just give you briefly or this review that this is an example ng life stage. So iba-iba sila na itsura. So sexual reproduction happens in the definitive host and then eggs are laid through, of course, the mammalian feces, including rodents. Okay, and then that will trans uh, that will grow into um, into another form, various stages. Then so and then, kung kailangan nila magfeed ulit, so dun sila mag mag invade or yap pupunta sa ibang host. For example, in this case, ng cystosoma, snail yung kanilang uh, kanilang intermediate host, and then another form will be released will be released on uh, on the water, and then that's the time that when when an animal, rat or human iinom siya doon or pupunta siya doon sa, sa, sa tubig na yun so magpe-penetrate and then the adult will again grow um, in the definitive host. Okay, um, next. So, that's the overview. Now we can ask specifically this question. How can we upgrade our lessons or class activity para naman uh, mag magkaroon tayong tinatawag na innovation doon sa mga class activities natin? Okay, so the next sets of slides that I'll be presenting to you beginning from this Okay, I'll teach you or I'll give you some techniques and specific things that you can do in class uh, or you can do as part of class activity. So 
uh, please uh, you can I mean take take down uh, magno notes kayo para mas makita ninyo kung ano yung mga pwede ninyong gawin. So one good strategy of course is the development of laboratory exercises okay in class kasi alam niyo naman yung difference of just speaking and lecturing and the actual uh, demonstration and even your first an experience of understanding um, organisms especially sa biology napakahalaga yan yan yung tinanggal nung pandemya sa atin sa mga higher education so uh, yun yung nawala sa mga students natin but hopefully uh, mayroon pa rin tayong mga nagawang paraan para um, um, matutu matutu pa rin sila but we because if we because we are now going towards babalik tayo hopefully dun sa normal so pwede na kayo mag-create ng ibang set of exercises that involves collection of organisms and of course uh, activities that allows them allow student to see and study actual organisms i know don't need to elaborate on this because probably mas alam nyo yung uh, the principle behind uh, laboratory exercises as activities in class so the first thing that we need that i'll, I'll teach you or I'll share with you is how do we collect the host? So this is specific lang para sa rodents, okay? Uh, so doable ba siya, sir? Definitely, okay? Um, as long as you have the basic uh, basic materials, so kayang-kaya nyo mag-collect ng host uh, para maaral nyo din siya. At saka siyempre, para makollect nyo yung parasite. Kasi the first step is, of course, to collect the animal um, hosting, okay? Yung parasite na yun. Okay? Although pwede nyo naman skip. So sabi nyo, oh, magdala kayo ng parasites. Sabi nyo lang dyan sa mga estudyante nyo. But of course, you need, still need to teach them how to to, uh, to get those parasites. And dahil nga nandun sa host sila, so kailangan nyo din silang turuan at least yung mga pwede nilang gawin on how to collect the host. Okay? So collecting host or the rodents is a form, I mean, the, the general term is called trapping. This is also a scientific term. So we use this in our publications, in our research. So trapping is an example of what we call in research or in ecology as biotic sampling. So in research, we follow standard small mammal trapping techniques. So for example, mayroon kaming uh, a standard na bilang ng traps na iseset, bilang ng araw na gagawin namin yan, uh, yung pagtatrap namin. And even our use of the, the types of traps and even yung paggamit namin ng baits. So dalawa lang yung ginagamit namin na bait. Okay, standard dapat yan when you do uh, research. Okay, um, and then it's also critical that we select our site of trapping. So, depending on the objective of research, mo, so gagawin mo yan. But for class activities, okay, so um, you can do what we call or what we can call as backyard trapping. Okay, so you only need to at least have one individual of host or rodent to be able to at least. Uh, marami ka na makukuha doon from ectoparasite to, to all sorts of, of, of the species of parasite. Pwede mo na silang silipin. Hopefully, but of course, hopefully uh, may parasite yon. Pero likely, meron laging parasite. At least one individual. Kung walang ectoparasite, punta ka sa intestines nila, meron at meron yan. So, but to be sure, maybe one to three uh, individuals, okay na. Kaya hindi mo naman kailangan ng extensive um, na na probably the budget or materials para gawin ito. So ano ba yung mga kailangan ka pwedeng gawin? So it, overview lang ito. Uh, uh, the other uh, facilitator or yeah, for this session, Miss Kim, Kim Paglingayan will teach you later on how to, uh, I mean, a, a more detailed um, presentation of, of this, about this. Okay, and then, so kukolektan lang natin ng native species. Okay, pero may forest kasi sa likod ninyo. So medyo mag-ingat kayo kasi pwedeng makahuli kayo ng um, endemic species doon. Okay? Uh, so kung, kung involve ang endemic species, kailangan nyo magkaroon ng permit from the DNR. And of course, you can not just kill that uh, endemic species. So uh, target nyo lang ay ng native species. Okay? So may specific site naman kung saan sila makita. So doon nyo lang ilagay yung trap ninyo. And then you'll just use locally available traps. Okay, marami yan. Punta kayo sa palengke or maybe hardware. They have uh, they have available traps. Could be cage trap or snap traps. And you can also use commonly used baits. Okay, so doable itong backyard trapping para makuli yung host niyo. Okay, now, so just an overview also of how we collect uh, hosts through backyard farming. Um, so these are just photographs of 
uh, of traps that we used on the on the left uh, is an, an example of gauge trap and this is a large gauge trap but there are smaller versions of this snap trap on the right okay magingat lang kayo dyan. so nag picture lang may estudyante ka dyan para kunwari naka gumagtatrabaho sila pero uh, magingat kayo dyan kasi pwede mag snap yan and then uh, yung baits na ginaga pwede niyo gamitin any human food okay common food na kasi lahat naman kinakain ng rats di ba kahit nga damit nyo, di ba? So, pero ang recommendation namin, kamote tuber, so pwede siya kasing slice into small, uh, parang uh, tips, uh, sorry, small uh, ano yun? sizes para pwede siyang itusok doon sa lalagyan, doon sa, ano, sa bait. So, hindi pwede super soft yung food na gagamitin nyo. Pwede naman kung isasabit nyo siya, ilalagyan sa isang container, din, isasabit nyo siyang ganun, so pwede. So, mag-innovate na kayo. So, hindi naman siya nangangailangan ng super... Uh, super uh, strict na methodology to do that because even, for example, yung mga magulang niyo kung farmer sila or kahit sino, basta lagyan mo lang trap, nag-work yung, yung lock, yung, yung trap na yan, makuhuli mo sila, okay? Um, so, the details will be later. And then, yung the site of trapping will be critical. So, especially if you have forest, uh, yung backyard ninyo pala ay forest pala. So, wag nyo lang munang ilalagay doon. So, doon lang malapit sa bahay ninyo or in any areas kung, madal kung saan madalas nyo sila makita, like for example, yung tabi ng kanal, mga ganyan, or kung may mga taniman kayo doon, gulayan kayo, ilagay nyo lang uh, doon. O kaya kung may garden kayo, tapos may garden edges, di ba, may mga damo doon, so you, could play, you can place the, the, the traps there. So maybe one is enough, or maybe kung marami kayong pambili, like for example, if you have snap traps, then uh, uh, Pwede kayong bumili. Ang snap trap, I think, sa province, makakuha ka ng 20 pesos or 30 pesos na yan. Yung cage siyang medyo mas mahal. Uh, I think this one, this, this size is about 250 pesos. But there are, there are smaller sizes which may be about 90 pesos to 100 pesos. So, uh, uh, madali lang siyang uh, bilhin. Okay? Next. So, as I, as I said, the, the detailed presentation about trapping yung tuturuan kayo on how to set the trap yung yung anat yung yung basic uh, feature ng mga traps ng cage at saka ano will be discussed later on next how do we handle the host so after you collect the host ano namang paano mo siya gagawin paano mo siya i-retrieve para makuha mo yung parasite niya kasi ang goal mo talaga it's not the host but the parasite so um depende yan okay but uh, if whatever choice or maybe activity that you will that you will select okay you must adhere to ethical standard in handling or especially sacrificing an animal especially if you are doing this as part of class activity so kung class activist activity siya it's an official school activity and so therefore yung ethical standard na sinet ng school ninyo dapat sundin ninyo okay especially sa sacrificing ng animal hindi yung basta lang example lulunurin mo yung animal or biglang sasakalin mo na lang yung animal para mamatay siya hindi tama yon um, kung siyempre kung uh, kung part ng population control ng barangay ninyo so kahit sila ad, dapat mag-adhere sila sa sa tamang ethical ano so i think ay isang acceptable uh, yung ginagaw ginagamit okay you be surgical dislocation but of course you need training to do that yung hawakan mo dun sa leg and then hihilain mo dun sa buntot para uh, uh, mahiwalay yung nerve ay yung spinal nerve niya bandang neck tapos mamamatay so mas may hindi mga you uh, yung papaamuyin niyo sila ng certain chemicals so pwede rin gawin uh, yon okay pero hindi naman kailangan i-sacrifice lagi yung animal to observe that pero uh, so yun depending nga sa pa-collectahin din yung parasite Another one, always appro use appropriate laboratory materials. So again, this is a class activity. So teach them, okay, magwamit kayo ng gloves and even face mask. Okay, kasi there, there are other organisms like uh, microorganisms that are pathogenic na pwede nito lang makuha. Tapos again, pagka makagat kayo ng animal, so mas problema yun. Kailangan nyo magpa, magpa-inject ng um, anti-rabies. Okay, so kaya mag-ingat kayo sa pag-handle. Yun din na siguro kaya ayaw din gawin sa high school kasi yung mga risk na kasama nito pero may mga may mga pwede tayong gawin na hindi na mababawasan naman yon yung uh, tendency na makagat okay or for example pwede yung sabihin magpakuha kay sa mga farmer or dun sa mga local uh, uh, people natin okay kung may makita ka ng daga bigay mo nga sa amin so gamitin namin sa class activity so kung may nakita din kayo na matay na daga okay pwede yung i-conduct sa necroscopy pero kailangan niyo muna siyang uh, 
Okay, for example, ibabad sa, sa isopropyl or maybe ethanol para ma-disinfect siya and you, you dissect the animal. Okay? Now, so ito yun, ito lang yung kailangan i-consider lagi whenever you you collect hose and even yung sa parasite kasi two-stage two kasi siya. So, may mga kailangan nagre-require na buhay yung animal. Meron ding uh, mga method on collecting parasite na okay lang na patay na yung animal. So, Take note that if you use snap trap, it will always kill the host. Cage trap, it will keep the host alive. So, tandaan niyan kasi uh, consideration niyan whenever you collect certain group of parasites. Okay, so as part of a classroom activity, if you are collecting ectoparasite, the host must be alive. Okay, so the recommended is to use cage trap. Okay, the good news is you you can you do you do not need to move the host out of the cage whenever you uh, collect ectoparasite kasi ito kaya ito yung parang nirerecommend ko na class activity ninyo sa class so kahit nandun so papakita ko sa inyo mamaya yung isang technique on how to handle this and even collect the uh, parasite and then uh, maganda ring maging a class activity niyo yung photo documentation which will eventually lead to identification of the the host Kasi you also prepare the student to appreciate yung science of taxonomy and even anatomy. So you start teaching them how to record observations, anong itsura niya, anong kulay niya, um, gaano siya kalaki, gaano siya kabigat, mga ganyan. So that's, all, that's also a good exercise for taxonomic purposes. Now, if you tend to, to preserve the animal, kung meron kayong lesson on taxonomy, pwede nyo din gamitin yon. Kaya part ng aking presentation today, kung kompletuhin ko na, meron din, meron din mga recommendation later on on how to um, identify the host. Okay? Next, if you are collecting... Um, uh, eggs, mga ganyan, or reverse certain stages. So, you need to collect specific sample. So, ang pinaka-common yung you collect eggs from a sample of feces. Okay? Madalang, meron din yung blood uh, collection, pero masyado ng ano yun, technical yon. So, feces, madali lang din kunin. Pwede rin gawin yan. Kasi, hindi rin kailangan um, buhay or patay yung animal. So, either trap may be used. Pwede snap trap or um, pwede rin cage trap. So, kung patay na yung animal, Pwede nyo collect. So, minsan, pag namamatay yung animal, natrap siya doon, may mga nahuhulog na feces around the, or nearby the, um, the, the, the trap. So, collectin nyo yun. Tapos, so, yun na yun. Yun na yung gagamitin ninyo. Uh, kung wala man, so, dissect nyo yung bandang rectum ng animal na patay, kunin nyo lang yun. Tapos, kung buhay naman yung, yung, yung animal, so, hintay mo lang siya mag-poop doon sa cage. Tapos, pag may nakita na kayong pellets doon, collectin nyo yun, tapos yun na. Okay. Uh, so, yan. And then, again, i-document din ninyo yung uh, tsura ng, ng host para ma-identify ng mga bata or mag, pwede siya maging part pa rin ng uh, isang class activity. Okay? Next, next kung mag-collect naman kayo ng endoparasite, ito yung medyo mas technical ng konti pero doable pa rin siya. Okay? Uh, kailangan, so, you either use uh, either trap, okay? Pero ang ating kailangan dito ay dead host. Kasi ito yung isa-subject mo sa autopsy or necroscopy, which should be done uh, immediately. So kung meron kayong dissection exercise, hindi naman laging kailangan palaka. Kasi baka nga sa elementary, ginagamit na nila yung palaka as, uh, as, a, as, a, as a model uh, to do dissection. Okay? But hindi tayo gumamit ng rat. So kung may nahuli na kayo, nahuli na kayo dyan, so... Uh, with, with, with proper protocol, pwede niyo siyang gamitin na part ng dissection exercise ng mga, or, ng, ano, ng, mga, ng mga estudyante ninyo. But at the same time, while they are studying, for example, the GI tract, uh, so from the esophagus to the stomach to the intestines, pabuksan niyo na din yung uh, small intestines nila tapos pahanapin niyo na sila ng endoparasite. Okay? Kaya ang daming pwedeng uh, gamitin sa host. So you could use it for taxonomic purposes, dissection purposes, um, and even for paras, uh, parasite-related activity. Okay? And then, as uh, just a reminder lang, we need to follow proper handling also of dead animals. So hopefully, alam nyo naman na yung mga yan. Okay? Next. So I've taught, taught you how to collect the host. Now, how do we collect specifically the parasites? So parang overview lang din ito. Uh, papakita ko sa inyo yung mga pwede nyo gawin, pero ang mas bibigyan ko lang ng DN ay yung pagkolekta ng ectoparasite. Okay? So, we call it collection. 
Yan. So because we are collecting sample, the other one is direct collection of parasites. So if you are some collecting sample, so that's either tissue or feces. The pinaka common na, na tissue na kina collect natin are visceral organs, which includes um uh, the small intestines, sa ganyan. Yung yung muscle tissue madalang natin yun na madalang na natin yun nagamitin. Okay. Um. Tapos ang isa pa yung yung feces. Okay. So pwede niyong collectin yan anytime as I mentioned already. Tapos yung isa pa, uh, parasite collection. This is direct collection of the parasite. So pwede mo yung gawin uh, sa ectoparasite or sa endoparasite. So if you're collecting um, endoparasite, so again, you need to do an autopsy of the animal. So pinaka-common naman na location ng mga endoparasite is sa small intestines, but you can also try to observe if there are endoparasites um, in the stomach of the animal. Tapos pasadahan nyo na hanggang um, la large intestines. Okay? And then for ectoparasite, meron tayong parang dalawang pinaka-common ano, lang, yung brushing or peaking. So brushing, for example, kung dead na yung animal, tapos pwedeng na-preserve na siya, meron kasi din mga naiiwan na parasite pa rin doon sa body ng animal. So using a, a, a toothbrush, for example, so pwedeng i-brush nyo, i-brush na ganun, tapos uh, papunta sa solution, yung uh, liquid solution, tapos isilipin nyo sa microscope pero kayo makikita ng mga, uh, mga organism na nakuli na doon. Or kung buhay yung animal, sa buhay yung ectoparasite, you can also do peaking. Except, of course, if that's flea. Kasi alam nyo naman, tumatalon yung flea, di ba? So yung flea yung pinakama uh, crucial na mahuli kasi kailangan mo siyang kabulin talaga. Pero meron tayong mga pwedeng gamitin na chemical Ay yung powder, yung naphthalene balls to at least um, slow down yung activity ng mga parasite, even the flea, pwede mo siyang makuha. Okay? And then, so for, for full appreciation of the of all groups of parasite, I, for full appreciation ng buong activity, I recommend that all groups of, of parasite uh, be collected from the host, especially kung dead yung animal. Pero kung buhay, the ectoparasite lang yung gagamitin ninyo. Okay, pero ang isang requirement nitong klase ng activity na ito would be microscope. So hopefully yung school naman ninyo uh, mayroon na mayroon ng mga microscope. May mga mura na ding microscope ngayon kahit yung mga toy microscope, uh, you'll be able to appreciate already for example the yung tapeworm for example. So kung pa-observe yung kanyang hook and even yung sub segmentation ng katawan niya, okay nang gamitin yon. Ectoparasite okay na rin gamitin. At least makita lang nila yung uh, ma-enlarge lang konti yung body ng, ng ectoparasite then in in that way enough nang gamitin yon. Okay? So as part of your class activity, okay? Um how do we collect ectoparasite? So again, so we'll be using a hose that is alive and that is inside the cage para again mabawasan yung risk na kailangan mo, pa, kailangan mo pang ilabas yung animal. So hindi na. So pag nahuli na yon hawak-hawak nyo na yung cage, okay? I, 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 kunin na natin yung parasites niya. So ito yung mga materials na uh, gagamitin nyo. So you need white pan paper, forceps, vial contain alcohol, naphthalene powder. Okay, I think mayroong... Yan. Okay. So yung naphthalene powder is is optional. So dudurugin niyo lang 'yon. I hope alam niyo ito. And then uh dalawa yung pwedeng yung gawin. So maglalagay kayo dun sa ibabaw nung um nung band paper na, na white. Okay? Para tapos pag ipapatong niyo yung cage doon, doon parang maamoy kasi ng ectoparasite 'yon. But wag masyado marami kasi maiirritate naman yung animal and again you could you, we could be questioned about the ethical conduct kung kung, kung sobrang maapektuhan naman negatively yung buhay na animal so konti lang kasi yung yung ectoparasite naman yung target natin maging patient lang tayo then for some time wait maybe for 2 or 3 to 5 minutes sisimula na yang lumab umalis yung mga ectoparasites so at the time that you you begin picking up yes it's just picking up the parasite and then put it in a container Okay, pero kung wala naman yun, so kung wala kayong naphthalene, pwede rin naman. So, so, uh, so lagay mo na yung, yung, yung band papers on the surface of the table, for example, or on the ground. So place the cage on top of the band paper. Observe any crawling ectoparasite on the skin and the hair. So minsan kasi pag itatagtag mo ganun konti yung cage, medyo pwede may mahulog na eh, kasi talagang naggagalawan yung mga ectoparasites, especially yung mga mites. Okay, yung mites, at least makakuha ka lang ng species ng mites, okay na yon. Now, tapos yung forcep, 
So basahin mo lang 'yon tapos pagka may nakita kang gumu- uh, gumagapang na doon sa ano so dikit mo lang yung ano kasi surface tension didikit na siya makukuha na 'yon tapos ilalagay mo siya doon sa container tapos pum- I mean pa dip mo siya ulit doon sa container na may alcohol so mapupunta na doon sa vial yung ano uh, parasite for later uh, viewing So ganoon lang siya kasimple na pwede na siyang gawin basta importante may makuha ngayon yung mga estudyante s'yempre mga playful yan basta so as Uh, hindi sila makagat ng animal okay na kasi mama, mag ex, mag ano yan uh, mag ano yun mag explore explore nung nung paraan yun yun pwedeng dalagdagan nila na naphthalene so pwede rin gawin actually basta konti lang itak, ilagyan mo ng naphthalene powder yung mismong katawan ng animal bandang likod na lang para hindi niya masyadong maamoy so pagka nalagyan na yun alam nyo din ginagawa I think sa aso yan or maybe sa pusa talagang tatakbo yung mga parasite so bilisan yung kunin na yung mga uh, parasite okay so ganun lang siya kasimple So ito lang yung mga gagamitin. So ganyan yung itsura ng, ng rat na nasa loob ng cage. Okay? So, so yung nap, uh, alcohol. So sa bahay natin, pwede natin gamitin yung isopropyl alcohol lang. But if you have ethanol, then you can, you can use that. And forceps. Kung wala rin forceps, so gamit lang kayo ng stick. Okay? So kasi parasite lang. Ectoparasite naman yung gagamitin natin. So while well, stinking, for example. So ganun mo lang. Tapos ilalagay mo. Importante, makuha mo yung parasite may ilagay mo dito. Tapos kung i-view na siya sa slide, So, kailangan mo i-drain yan. So, yun din yung challenge na discover you later on. Masyadong marami yung laman. So, i-drain mo siya sa Petri dish if you have Petri dish. Tapos, sa viewing, pupulutin mo lang din at ilalagay mo siya sa, sa glass slide. Okay? So, kayo nang bahala dun sa microscopic technique kung paano gagawin yan sa class. Okay? Next, how do we identify the hosts? So, ito na. So, this, are, this is another extra activity that you can do Um, kasi uh, sayang naman kung nandun na yung host o kaya patay na yung host so paano mo siya i-identify so what you can do in, in, in your classroom is this one so keep a record of the morphological body measurements weights and then sex of the animal I think Kim will also be teaching you or at least showing you a video on how to record this okay um, that I'll also show you later on kung ano yung mga kailangan nyo kolektahin And then, if you now have the measurements of, of, of the animal, special example, tail, yung length ng tail, magayon yung length ng ear, o kaya yung length ng hind foot, kung meron na kayo yung data na magayon, compare the measurement against those data in literature, okay, or dun sa mga nasa databases na yan. So, sir, access po ba namin yung mga yan? Yes. So, one good reference that we have now, your library, should have this. So at least kung yung school ninyo, high school ninyo, uh, uh, malaki yung school ninyo, probably naka-receive yung library ninyo ng isang kopya ng The Mammals of Luzon. Okay, if not, you can um, buy this uh, online. So para reimburse na lang sa school ninyo na pwede niyo siyang gamitin. This is actually a textbook about clim- Philippine climate and biogeography and natural history of Mammals of Luzon. So Uh, marami siyang gamit itong libro na to so you can also buy it for about 2,500 yung kanyang PDF copy pwede rin hardbound yung pinibong bilhin nyo another reference that you can use is um, this website which is uh, can easily be accessed it's called the Synopsis of Philippine Mammals so i-type nyo lang sa Google and then maglalabas na siya um, tapos ito yung specific na link so for demonstration purposes I'll be showing you the feature no, ating, yung website na yan Uh, created by the Field Museum uh, to aid us in, uh, in our identification of mammals from the Philippines, including the, the pest. So um, if you could see here, there are options dito. For example, if you want to search the species, because you know already if it's a ratus yun or what, so you can click the search species. You uh, can search by order. Okay, Rodentia, ganyan, or then you can appear the family. Din nila. Or you can also search by location. So when you click search by location, ito yung makikita nyo. So mag, may mag-appear na map. So ikiklik, for example, taga Luzon ka, ikiklik mo lang yung Luzon, mag-appear yung mga various, um, the various provinces on Luzon. Tapos, ikiklik mo yun, for example, Ilocos Norte or Benguet, ikiklik mo lang yan, may mag-appear, may mag-appear na ganito. Okay, yun nandito sa left. So yan yung mga species na, na probable na nandiyan sa inyo. So i-click mo lang so medyo alam mo na ratus tanizumi so i-click mo yung ratus tanizumi. And then may magpapakita na na, na isa pang ganito. Testing na niyo yung ito, identification. So look at the image on the 
uh, an enlarged portion of that. So, for example, may total length. So, total length, yun yung length between the tip of the tail and tip of the snout. Yung tail length, ito yung range niya. Hind foot, ito din yung range niya. Tapos size of deer. So, pwede yung gawin niya. Ngayon ko nahirapan kayo kasi ang, ita, ang, ang isang kailangan i-take note niyo dito ay bata ba yung animal or adult? Kasi kung batang ratus tanizumi yun, baka kasi yung size na yung ratus exulan na adult. So, pero kung may measurements kayo, madali lang naman siyang tinan. Kasi kahit batang ratus tanizumi naka-size ng adult na ratus exulans, mas malaki pa rin yung hind foot niya. Okay? So kung hindi kayo sigurado, pwede nyo naman akong i-email uh, so that we can help you in, uh, in your identification. Okay, can we preserve the host? So if it's dead, yes, you can prepare it as a voucher specimen and you can store it in um, ethanol. Okay. And then, um, keep the record, as I mentioned, your morphological body measurements. So, ano uh, yun it Inote nyo yun. Okay. And then also, add labels to the container. So, kung para lang mabigyan nyo din ng a credit yung mga estudyante nyo, so isulat, isulat ko sa kanila yung the name of the collector, yung date of collection, site of collection, tapos yung scientific name, kung ma-identify nila yung animal. Okay, now how do we identify the parasites? So, yung parasite, mas mahirap siyang i-identify, pero doable naman siya. So, mga pwede niyong gawin, is also, you note the general morphological feature of the parasite, kasi parang larger taxa naman yung pinag-uusapan natin, madali lang malaman kung helmith yun, Okay, arthropod. So even at that level, pwede na kayo okay na yun activity nila. Pero this, uh, even consulting a general biolo biology book, oh, pwede na yun. Kasi i-describe naman, tapos pag na-identify lang nila na tick yun o kaya might, then okay na. Okay, uh, so take note na pwede din siyang i-identify yung taxonomic uh, identification nila into the family level and even up to the genus level. Pwede yun. So, by, base lang doon sa itsura, yung kanyang form, uh, makukuha nyo kung ano yung genus ng um, uh, parasite na yun, especially kung ectoparasite. But of course, if you're, you're identifying eggs and helmets, this requires more um, uh, skilled uh, 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 knowledge about microscopy and even knowledge about the, uh, the eggs of the parasite. Now, do we, can we use a material in our identification of parasite? Yes. So, ito yung pwede nyo gamitin the material um it's also this is a website okay so just go to this website cdc um and then search nyo lang i-type nyo yung specific species or genus ng parasite na yan so ito yung magpapakita so just to show you for example if you click the image gallery then mayroon na dyan yung sort of uh, species of parasite that you can you can check so may mga eggs and then adults mga ganyan so nandyan na sila now, if you go to laboratory diagnosis, if you click that and then scroll down ninyo hanggang dun sa dulo, meron kayo din makikita ng mga ganitong material and reference. So, meron dyan yung mga scale kasi in identifying eggs, importante yung size. Kasi minsan puro dumi yung nakikita ng mga bata sa microscope. So, kala nila yun na pero debris lang pala yun. Okay? Okay, kaya material kasi siyempre galing yan sa PC. So, may, could be plant material yun. So, um, size matters whenever you identify the eggs. So, kung for example, alam nyo that Tricuris is, I mean, within this range, 60 micro, micrometer. Just for reference, the red blood cell is about 10 micrometers. So, this is much larger. These eggs are much larger than the RBC. So, pwede nyo gawin, uh, pasilipan, pasilipin muna nyo sila ng red blood cell, okay, para ma-adjust yung mata nila at, at malaman nila kung ano yung hinahanap nila. Okay, that's hookworm, just about that size then. So, kung makita sila ng mga rounded material doon na parang may embryo sa loob, tapos within the range, so posibleng uh, parasite egg yung uh, nakuha nila. Okay, pwede nyo din gamitin ito. The, may libro din. And I think this is uh, this can also be downloaded free. Ginawa nilang free ito. It's called the Flynn's Parasite of Laboratory Animals. Ito yung contents niya. So, all sorts of descriptions of all parasites that are found in laboratory animals, which include rodents. So, pwede yung tingnan, i-review yung biology nila. And then, you can also go immediately to chapter or number 11, which is the parasites of rice and mice. So, makita nyo agad kung ano yung mga hinahanap ninyo at least na mga parasite. Okay? So, at yun lang yung mga general groups. As I said, at this level, pwede nyo na siyang maging exercise. Importante, ma-identify nila kung tick yun o kaya flea o kaya laos or lice. 
Ngayon, as I said, pwede din naman siyang identify up to the family or genus level para dagdag activities sa taxonomic, uh, as part of taxonomic uh, um, exercise din sa class. Okay, so so far, uh, that's what we've covered in um, about rodents and parasite. And so, um, just to summarize, so in order for us to upgrade or level up yung classroom activity natin, we need to make students appreciate um, animals as hosts. We need to let them um, handle species or organisms the way that they've never experienced before. Mag-level up na tayo sa puro halaman na example natin sa biology class. Why not use moving organisms such as fish or rodents? So this is an opportunity or a good way to really level up the way how we do things. So as I mentioned, ito yung mga pwede niyong gawin. So that you could do an exercise about trapping of the host, uh, handling the host, and also identifying the host. And the other one, also would like to encourage you to, uh, to join us in inspiring our students to appreciate also parasites. While they are harmful to humans, many of them will cause uh, serious diseases. As biology, we need to allow them or make them appreciate that these are also beautiful animals morphologically um, designed by God or by evolution. By making, by letting them know, appreciate form, yung size, etc., yung adaptation, mga ganyan. So, and then, so the best way to do, to allow us, to allow our animals to appreciate organisms is for them to actually see this by beginning, by collecting the specimen. Kasi, pag kasi ganyan, meron na tawag natin owning doon sa, doon sa experience. So, doon nakakadagdag, doon na natututunan na mabuti yung mga estudyante natin, yung mga tinuturo natin. So, once you've collected them, you can also have an, an exercise about examining parasite. And then, I've also taught you about how to identify these parasites. Okay, so with that, thank you so much. So, I hope you learned something. If you have questions about my presentation and um, and the next uh, activity that we will have. So just feel free to ask us. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Ayan, maraming maraming salamat po, Sir Aris, for that very fascinating, very interesting, and very much applicable na way in studying rodents and these parasites so for for our participants right now before we head on to our short break ano so gusto ko sanang itanong ano yung part dun sa lecture kung talagang nakinig tayo ano yung mukha siyang rat pero hindi siya rat ano po yung tawag natin doon it starts with the letter s okay it really caught my attention ano so it's a it looks like a rat but it is not a rat, as mentioned by Sir Aris kanina. Do we remember what it's called? Ayan, sige, tignan nga natin. Ayan, thank you, Ma'am Mary Jane. Thank you, Sir Mark. Ma'am Alma, ayan, very participative ang ating mga um, audience, ang ating participants ngayon. Salamat po. Thank you so much. Yes, it's, it's a shrew. And maybe that's where shrewd na word comes from. Ano? So, ang galing kasi... Just to summarize, ano, um, the lecture then of Sir. So we talked about the rodents, their ectoparasites and endoparasites as well. And na mention nga ni Sir Aris na it's a very good field, yung ectoparasites na field, okay? So as well as, ano po yung dapat na state ng ating host um, when we're studying ectoparasites? Should it be alive or dead? Ayan. Sige nga, para ma kung naaalala natin. Yes, tama, Ma'am Hana. Yes, Ma'am Ma Beatriz. Sir Mark, Ma'am Maria, Ma'am Alma, alive. Tama, Ma'am Nelma. Okay, so um, I'm very glad na nakinig po tayo ng mabuti. And ewan ko kung fitting ba or, or it was a mistake for me to introduce myself as a host. MC na lang po, ayan, kasi very used yung word na host today. So, later on po, we're going to have an open forum, ano, before I, I let you go for the, for the short break. Ayan, so please list down your thoughts. I'm sure marami po tayong mga katanungan, ano. So, i-reserve po natin yung mga kakulitan natin at katanungan later sa ating open forum because... Ako din, marami po akong tanong ano, na bumabagabag na sa, ating, sa aking isipan. So aside from that, uh, we're going to 
to try to request as well ano our speakers ganyan for their powerpoints okay so kanina may mga na mention na si Sir Aris si Dr. Aris Reynaldo na mga open source materials very nice diba so meron na tayong mga open source available so tiyaga lang siguro sa paghahanap um i'm sure nag screenshot din tayo ng mga ng powerpoints ni Sir but we will try po to request from our speakers ano their powerpoints para naman po mas maging available sa ating mga guro ang pagtuturo at paggamit ng um, host ng live animals sa ating classes. Ayan. So, very interesting, very exciting po yan for us. Ayan. So, for those who are joining sa YouTube, okay, so please comment your uh, thoughts, your questions. Uh, Inunote po yan ng ating mga masisipag na technical team for today. And we are going to try to address them as much as possible ano, within the given time period yung mga questions natin later. And we will be um, um, answering them live with Sir Aris and Ma'am Kim later. Okay? So, ayan. So, I, I hope natuwa tayo sa discussion because I'm very much... Um, satisfied and very much filled with so quest so much questions and na address po yung aking curiosity as your MC today and I'll see you later po in our short after our short break okay so kape po muna tayo um kain po muna tayo ng breakfast kung hindi pa tayo naka breakfast and I will see you po again later at 10:30 bye po
para po sa mga nagtatanong ng evaluation link. Later po siya i-link dito, isi-send sa chat at sa YouTube as well yung link for our evaluation form after po ng ating Q&A. Maraming salamat po! Ayan, magandang magandang umaga ulit and we are back okay, with the demo portion of our program. Ayan, so just before we proceed with our program, I would like to remind everyone again, mga ma'am and sir, we can now key in our questions, okay? Diyan sa ating Q&A tab, sa ating Zoom, you may also comment it in our YouTube um, channel, ayan, kung if you're joining us. Sa ating YouTube, hello po. Uh, you may key in your comments po, your thoughts about the lecture a while ago and even sa ating demo later, okay? So, for for those asking po for the evaluation link, ano po, uh, please wait until our technical team, our Cynism com Committee will key it in the chat. 
Okay, ililink po nila later. And then sa ating YouTube live stream, it will be placed in the chat as well, in the live chat. So please wait for that as well. Um, ito po ay maibibigay later after the demo. Okay, so are, is everyone excited? Because I am. Okay, um, I would like to be a part, you know, active part of this demo. And I'm really excited how we are going to apply this sa ating classrooms. Ayan. So, accompanying Sir Ari, Sir Hinaldo, is a very dear colleague of mine. Ayan. So, hindi po siya um, stranger sa akin. We usually have tea time together. Okay. She is also taking masters in conservation and restoration ecology like me. And maganda po na na meron siya ngayon na pinaunlakan niya ang ating invitation ngayon dahil siya po ay may prior experience na sa secondary education na setup because she already taught at Philippine Science High School before. Ayan. So buti na lang at pinaunlakan niya tayo today. The floor is yours, Ma'am Kimberly Paglingayan. Thank you, Ethel. Malinaw po ba yung audio ko? Ayan, no? okay po. So, we'll proceed with the workshop proper of this morning session. So, as mentioned earlier by Ethel and Sir Aries, for the workshop, we will be focusing on techniques, tips on rodent trapping. So, just so we have... Parang a common expectation kung ano yung discuss for this part of the program, let's have an overview of the topics that we will be covering. So first, we will discuss or at least revisit with it ano yung different types of traps that are at least commonly used in the Philippine setting. Then we will proceed to its different parts. We'll have an overview and then we'll have a bit of understanding of how each of these traps work. Then we'll go to the process of preparation and setting of traps. Medyo overview lang po to, pahapyaw. Though later on sa Q&A, if you have further questions, you may entertain them. So pwede namin sagutin ni Sir Aris. And then lastly, paano ba yung pag-retrieve ng rodents once na catching na siya using traps and how do you process it? Ayan. So we'll proceed with first the types of traps. So as I have said, in the Philippine settings, we have these commonly used traps. Siguro familiar na sa inyo yung ilan sa nandito, lalo na yung nasa lower right picture ninyo. So the one on the upper right portion of the screen is known as a cage trap kasi it looks as such. So uh, I have here three different sizes. So uh, dito sa Philippines, we use three different sizes. So we have here a larger, the uh, Standard yung kanyang size, but we just commonly refer to it as the large size cage. Ayan, kita niyo ba? Ganyan siya kalaki. And then we also have the medium size. Ito, slightly smaller siya. And then we have the small size. Ayan, so compared sa other two, it appears to be more elongated. And so yan yung cage trap. And then the second one, the one that is siguro familiar din sa mga students ninyo kasi nakikita niya siya sa uh, cartoons, for instance, that is known as the snap trap. So, it is called as a snap trap because of its mechanism. So, ano nga ba yung similarities and differences between these traps? So, we'll uh, first proceed with the cage trap. So, primarily, ang difference nila is paano nila hinahandle yung specimen. So for cage traps, I think this was also mentioned by Sir Aris kanina, uh, this trap allows your specimen to be alive. So kapag sinet nyo, sinet nyo yung trap, kinabukasan, niretrieve nyo siya, expect that the rodents inside na na-trap are still alive. Thus, they are commonly used for population estimates, habitat use studies. Basically, uh, research studies that uh, require either extended periods of observation ng specimen ninyo, yung behavior niya, or repeated observations. Ayan. And then, your snap trap naman, ayan, mukhang deceiving na itsura niya, pero Medyo forceful kasi yung pag-snap niya. Thus, expect that the rodents that will be trapped will essentially be dead once you retrieve them. And thus, they may be used for other types of studies such as diversity studies. Yung tipong gusto niya lang malaman kung ano yung nandun na species. You do not really have to capture and recapture them. 
you can use the snap trap or if you want to collect voucher specimens which was already introduced by Sir Aris kanina. Aside from voucher specimens, kung gusto nyo rin mag-collect ng tissues, except for blood, we commonly use the snap trap. Okay lang na dead na yung rodent kasi essentially you will kill din, uh, kill din naman yung specimen nyo for tissue collection. Ang exemption lang dito ay yung blood collection kasi may tatlong different types tayo or tatlong different methods of blood collection for rodents. So, isa doon is cardiac puncture. So, directly, kinukuha yung blood from the heart of the rodent. So, uh, that is quite invasive. So, we prefer na rodents that were trapped using the snap yung gagamitin. But if you'll be collecting blood from the orbital, uh, sino, uh, orbital area, meaning sa mata, we can use the cage traps also if you want to use less invasive methods such as getting the blood from the base of the tail, we can use cage traps. And so although itong pinipresent ko, kumbaga ito lang yung preferred na methods of trapping based on the objective of your study. But you can actually interchange them. For instance, hindi available sa inyo or hindi accessible yung isang type ng trap, you can actually... Uh, use them interchangeably. So this one is, kumbaga, this is just the preferred method given the objectives that are set in your studies. Yeah, so, ganun din, pagdating sa size, so sa cage traps, as I have mentioned earlier, we have different sizes. We have three. And so, you can actually use a combination of this when you go to the field. Pwede niya pa rin namang mahuli, essentially, basta kakasya dun yung specimen. So, does not mean na large trap yung gagamitin mo, yung malalaking rodents lang yung makukuha mo. So as long as kasha doon yung rodent, you can capture them using the cage traps. So in practice, what we usually do sa field ay we use a combination of all the three sizes. Kung available sa inyo, uh, that would be recommended. So sa snap traps naman, you also have different kinds. So what I have here is a metal. Hindi ko alam kung kita nyo. This is a metal snap trap. Yung kanina, yung nasa previous slide, it's wooden. So, essentially, they work the same. Ayan. Uh, it just falls into in a uh, matter of your preference. Tapos, uh, dun sa previous sa figure, papansin nyo, parang simpleng board lang siya. While others, such as the one I'm holding, will have teeth dito sa area na to. So, dahil dyan, dahil dun sa force ng pag niya and the presence of this, ayan, essentially namamatay yung rodents na natra-trap using this one. Ayan, so, other differences, ayan, so, kung papansin ninyo, very obvious, mas malalaki, kahit yung pinakamaliit na size ng cage, relatively, mas bulky siya compared to the snap trap. So, ang um, implication nito will be on the logistics. Yeah, so imagine, let's say you need, for instance, lang 20 traps for your classroom activity. Imagine, bibit-bit ka ng 20 na ganito. So, siguro may bit-bit kayong isa o dalawang saho ng cage trap pagdating sa field. So, kung mas marami pa yung kailangan nyo, like intensive research talaga siya, expect that you'll need a, a method or you'll have access to transportation, may access din kayo sa mga pwedeng magbuhat, so you may have to hire additional personnel. Ayan, so yun yung isang, siguro, not a disadvantage, but kumbaga challenge lang in using cage traps. Ayan. And then, they are also relatively mas mahal ng konti, which was already mentioned by Sir Aris kanina. So around hundreds, yung price sa 100, 100. 50. While your yung snap trap, it's relatively cheaper. So around 40, 50 pesos, meron ka ng isang snap trap. Ayun. And it's also more or less bulkier. So mas madali siyang bit-bitin pagdating sa field. So again, kapag gagamit kayo ng traps, it will be uh, consider the objectives of your activity or your study and then Primarily, it's a matter of preference and then accessibility. So, yun yung primary na differences ng ating cage and snap traps. So, again, siguro reiterate ko lang, cage traps are preferred when you do live trapping. 
And then snap traps, kapag snap trapping naman, uh, expect that your specimen, the rodents, will be dead upon trapping. Ayan. So additional info na lang, uh, both or these traps are primarily used on ground kasi we expect that most rodents are uh, existing sa my ground level. Although, when you want to capture arboreal species, pwede rin naman. But please take note that you have to report. You have to take note of this when you write your paper. So, and so ira-report nyo kung ilang cage traps kinamit, anong sizes, ilang snap traps, ilan doon yung nakaset sa ground, ilan doon yung nakaset sa may up, atop ng logs or rocks, etc. Yun, so, yun yung background natin sa cage and snap traps. Now, we'll proceed to the next part, which I think is on the anatomy of the traps. So, obviously, dun sa pinahay pa kanina, magkaibang magkaibang itsura nila. So, they have distinct parts. So, let's start muna with the cage trap. So, I have here a photo in front of you. So, nakalagay na dyan yung parts, but let's just revisit them. So, siguro yung mga pinaka-import parts that I did discuss for this. So obviously, your traps will have to have doors. Ayan. So ito yung door niya. And then, uh, meron din tayong door lock dito. So ito siya. Hindi ko alam kung makikita nyo. So, ugutin ko lang saglit. Ito siya. Kita nyo ba? Para siyang uh, may dalawang loop sa end. So, basically, baka lang siya na may dalawang loops na sa end. Then, naka kabit siya dun sa door lock ring. So, dito sa gilid ng door, may dalawang baka ulit. Kung saan, naka-anchor yung inyo uh, door lock. So, aside from that, of course, you have here yung uh, lalagyan ng bait ninyo sa loob. So, merong hook dito. Ayan. Andun sa loob. And then you have here the spring. And medyo mahirap makita sa camera. But you should have here a spring. So may mga traps din na walang spring. Like this one, the smaller one that I have. So, ayan. So wala siyang spring. So in cases na ganito, walang spring yung cage trap nyo, you can simply substitute the spring with a rubber band. So ikakabit nyo na yung door dun sa mismong body no cage trap ninyo. Ayan. So, since we already have an idea of what the parts of a cage trap are, paano nga ba nag-work ang isang cage trap and paano tayo nagsaset up? So, of course, we have to have a bait for your cage traps. So, you can actually use a wide variety of baits, pero at least based on the studies that have been uh, conducted in the Philippines, ang nakita nilang effective ay uh, earthworms and then uh, yung coconut, yung nyog, yung medyo matigas na, na ni Rose and then kinot sa peanut butter. Ayan. So, uh, usually, uh, we use both types of baits para ma-capture natin halos uh, kung ano man yung nandun. Kapag kasi gumamit lang tayo ng earthworm, may possibility na ma-exclude natin yung mga omnivores which, or herbi uh, omnivores which may prefer yung uh, peanut butter and then coconut. Tapos nabanggit din ni Sir Aris kanina yung paggamit ng kamote. So, uh, actually, you can do a separate study on this if you want, kung ano nga ba yung effective na bait sa lugar ninyo. But for most studies in the Philippines, we use yung dalawa nga. You have the earthworms and then yung peanut butter and roasted coconut. So you simply, and <laughs> sarap daw ng bait, oo. Usually, mga students, after maglagay ng bait, minimeryanda na dyan yung naiwang peanut butter. And so, bale, ilalagay mo lang siya dun sa hook Medyo mahita, mahi, um, mahirap mahita, pero you have here a hook kung saan isasabit mo yung bait mo. So, yun nga, you have coconut. Tapos, earthworms. For earthworms, typically, we use yung earthworm na nakukuha din sa area kung saan kayo nagtatap. So, we do not really use yung earthworm like those used in vermiform uh, composting kasi may chance na hindi siya kainin ng mga uh, mga small mammals na nandun. Kasi 
it's not really kumbaga, it's foreign to them yung earthworm na yun. so as much as possible before you set the traps uh pwede siguro mag set aside kayo ng time to collect earthworms from the area itself so ang ginagawa usually kasi medyo malambot nga yung earthworms tas they're wriggly so may tendency na tumakas sila kapag tinali mo lang so to para mas ma-ensure na hindi nakakatakas yung inyong bait na earthworm, what we do is we use yung perdible, yung safety pin. So, tinutusok siya dun sa perdible, tapos yun yung nilalagay sa loob ng trap. Okay? Tapos, syempre, you will have to leave the trap open. Ayan. So, Paano nga ba siya nag-work? So, yung door lock na sinasabi natin kanina, itong metal na to. So, kapag in-open nyo yung cage, it has to lay flat on top of that cage trap. Para kapag nagalaw, wait, set up ko lang. So, ayan, may, uh, yung other end kasi nung nalagyan ng bait natin, may parang kawit din yun. So, yun yung ikakawit natin dun sa pinaka-handle na nasa door. So, kapag may pumasok na rodent, hinila nila yung bait, ayan, mag-close yung inyong cage trap. So, ayan. So, ganun din sa snap trap. Although medyo iba yung itsura niya, but basically the same principle, we use the same types of baits. Ayan, so that's a uh, figure ng different parts ng snap trap. This one naman, uh, although mas madali siyang bitbitin sa field, pag pinagamit niyo sa students niyo, please be careful kasi nga malakas yung force ng pag-snap niya. But essentially, dito, ayan, kita niyo may parang patusok dyan. Dyan, uh, sinesecure yung bait ninyo. Ayan. So usually, medyo uh, iniiba natin yung form, medyo binibend natin para tusok talaga siya dun sa bait ninyo. Hindi makatakas yung earthworm. Or hindi rin basta-basta maalis yung ibang bait ninyo. Tapos, yung arm bar na nakikita nyo dyan. So, sa, nandito, kapag hindi nyo pa naset yung snap trap ninyo, nasa same side yung hook at saka yung arm bar. So, what we do kapag nasecure nyo na siya, so, ilagay nyo muna yung bait kasi you don't want to accidentally snap your fingers uh, kapag nagsiset kayo. So, iset nyo muna siya, secure it. Tapos, once secure na, then, so, hilain nyo yung arm bar, hold it with your thumb, tapos please make sure na yung kamay ninyo or ng students ay malayo dito sa part na to. Remember, dyan tatama yung arm bar, tapos may mang mga ngipin pa tong parts na to. So, you don't want to accidentally uh, snap your fingers. Tapos, kapag nagalaw na siya ng inyong rodent, so, magbabalik yung arm bar nyo. Ayan. So, ganun kalakas yung force no arm bar ninyo. So, dahil nga medyo mas uh, kailangan ng precautions sa paggamit ng snap trap, actually, even if using cage traps, we recommend that you use gloves. Hindi po siya yung gloves na nagagamit sa lab, yung latex. Masyado po siyang manipis. Uh, maiipit pa rin yung kamay nyo or pwede pa rin siyang mahagat ng rodent. So, what we recommend is use thick na gloves. So, uh, di ba mayroon po tayong gloves na gawa sa cloth, yung medyo makapal. So, yun yung ipagamit natin sa student. So, again, in every field and laboratory work, dapat priority yung safety ng ating personnel. Yan, lalo na kung students natin yung mga yan. Okay, so, yun. Yun yung dates and then the parts. So, next question, kailan at paano tayo nagsaset up ng mga traps? Kunwari, meron na kayong mga dates. Ayan, so, ah, uh, Usually, we lay them in parang grids or in transect. Again, uh, we can discuss that more when we go to Q&A. But ayun, uh, you, lay, you identify kung paano yung layout ng pag, uh, pag-layout ninyo ng traps. Tapos, typically, nagsiset or naglalagay tayo ng traps dun sa study area kapag bago mag-sunset. So, depende sa area, pero usually around 5, 6 p.m. Ayan, nagsiset tayo. Tapos, medyo inaayos natin kung saan natin siya ilalakatag. Uh, usually, we, kung meron kayong makitang parang signs na may mga rodents doon, like yung trails, 
Uh, kunwari may fecal matter, siguro kayo nakita, it's good siguro if you can put a trap near that one. Ayan, para lang mas, um, kumbaga may chance na ma-trap natin sila. Tapos inaayos natin, usually pinaflatin natin yung area, ayaw nating gumulong yung traps. Tapos, lalo na kapag maulan din, like dito sa Cordillera, malamig, maulan usually. So kapag may mga dahon-dahon doon, usually we cover the trap, lalo na yung cage trap, kasi nga buhay pa na matya-trap yung rodents niyo So you, we usually co cover it para hindi naman inuulan, nilalamig yung rodents niyo So although we're trapping them, of course we have to treat them ethically. Ayan. So, yun. Tapos kailan natin siya Nire-retrieve. Nire-retrieve natin siya kinabukasan, usually around dawn, kapag medyo magliliwanag na. So again, around 5 a.m., 6 a.m., again, depende sa area. Um, kunwari, if you're trapping sa mas loob ng forest, so expect na medyo mas madilim. So you may want to adjust the time. Ayun. Tapos, every time na mag... So naset nyo na siya ng hapon, i-retrieve nyo siya dawn of the next day. So, make sure, syempre, check nyo kung may mga na-trap pa, i-record nyo. I-check nyo rin kung okay pa ba yung mga traps ninyo. May mga wala bang na-trap pero na-alis yung bait. So, you have to take note of those. So, every time you do that then you also have to rebate. So, kahit na sabi na natin karamihan ng traps ninyo ay nandun pa rin yung bait, we have to rebate. So, kaya magdadala kayo sa field ng kung gagamitin nyo ay coconut and then peanut butter. Ayan. Please make sure that you have uh, materials to bring with you. So, usually portable stove, yung nyog, yung peanut butter. And so, i-re-rebate nyo siya, papalitan nyo siya. Tapos, uh, ayan. So, yun yung sa cage traps. And then, for snap traps, essentially the same, same time ng trap setting, trap retrieval, siguro caution na lang dun sa paggamit. So, kapag may hindi nag-snap, tas ire rebate mo siya, syempre. So, ayaw mo namang hawakan siya ng ganun-ganun lang kasi baka ikaw yung matrap. So, uh, please instruct your students or your colleagues na kunwari kung may stick dun sa field, yun yung gamitin nyo para ma mag-snap yung trap ninyo. Para hindi yung daliri, daliri ninyo yung natatrap. Ayan, tapos rebate niya na lang siya ulit. So, bait muna. Again, bait muna bago uh, hilain ulit yung arm bar nung inyong trap. So, that's a precautionary measure. Ayan. So, yun. So, basically, yun yung basics ng pag-set ng trap at saka basics ng ano yung different parts ng trap. So, I hope we're okay with that. So, for the next one, next part, paano ngayon kapag may natrap na? Paano mo i-retrieve yung rodent and then paano mo siya ipaprocess? So, dun man na tayo sa specimen or dun sa uh, rodent retrieval. So, sa field, aside from the traps, we also bring these cloth bags. So, yung cloth bag ninyo, uh, pansin nyo, tapering yung kanyang shape. So, what we usually do, Ayan, kunwari ito, meron na siyang na-trap. So, uh, wag mo siyang basta-basta bubuksan kasi tatakbo yung uh, rodent na nandun. So, what you want to do ay ito, yung cloth bag, it's of different sizes than usually. And so, open mo lang ng kaunti yung inyong cage tapos saka mo ilalagay yung cloth mo. And then, kapag okay na, so supposed to be ganyan. As pag medyo okay na, medyo naurong na siya. Ayan. So, let's say naurong na siya. So, from that position, medyo itatayo mo yung trap para hindi mahatakbo yung rodent. Tapos, slowly, pag mong alug-alugin yung trap, pag mong hiluin yung rodents, we have to treat them ethically. You try to lead them paloob dun sa bag. So, until nasa dulo na siya ng bag. So, essentially, dahil nga tapered siya, medyo limited na yung mobility ng inyong rodent. And so, yun yung sa cage trap. So, sa snap trap, retrieve mo lang. 
uh, as you usually do. Just be careful with the unsnap traps. Ayan. So, uh, in relation to this, my isha share lang po kong video, which was actually recorded by Sir Aris then sa mismong field work niya. So, ide-demo niya yung uh, binabanggit ko kanina sa inyong retrieval ng inyong rodents. Let me just play the video. Ayan, so this is actual situation sa field. Where is it? Wait, tanapin ko lang po. Uh, sorry, tech team <laughs> might need help. Uh, can we play yung video on demo on the photos? Hindi siya nag a appear dun sa share screen ko. Ayan, thank you. And so, ulitin ko lang habang hinihintay natin. So, for that one, uh, Crotomys ay isang genus ng rodent. So, papakita ni Sir Aris yung actual na pag-retrieve niya nung na-trap niya using the cage trap. Ayun, thank you. Okay. So, day 21 ng aming huli. First time na makahuli kami ng bagong individual ng bagong species para dito sa uh, buong area na to. Crotomys. Uh, di ko pa alam kung anong species ito pero baka yung Crotomys ng Cordillera which is the Crotomys Whitehead. So, mag-mark na namin siya gamit itong customized bag na to. Um, first time ko na mag-handle ng ganito live, live capture. So, hindi ko alam kung ano yung magiging behavior niya. So, mas magandang magiging dahan-dahan na lang. So, dapat nakapatong itong ilalim ng cage din dito sa isang end. Tapos, unti-unti natin. Iyan ako muna. Uh, Iangat ko kanti ito. Tapos, ipapasok ko lang sa glit itong bunganga nito para dahan-dahan ko yung itutulak. Hindi maliit naman siya. So, So, sir, puro patay pong crotomis ang nakukuha nyo? Patay. Hindi, meron na lang kami. Na-snap, ganun? Ganun. Bakit first time, sabi nyo? Na i-live, i-mark. Oh, I -mark. dito? Dito sa area? Na i-mark na ganito. Pero napapakain na namin dati ito ng um, earthworm. Umanda nga sanang ma-video pa yung pagkain. Meron akong video nito. No? So, yan. Tapos, dahan-dahan lang natin yung ito. Pwede pa describe yung amoy. <laughs> Hindi ko na matolerate. Amoy eh. daga. Hindi. <laughs> Pero iba sa ito. Hindi kasi naamoy ng viewers. Yan. So, ready na yan. So, nakas naka dapat nakasilin. So, dapat papasok siya dito sa cloth na to. Tapering naman to. Pero since ninibago pa siya. So, hindi ko alam kung anong magiging behavior niya dito sa cloth na to. Wala na ba siya. So, Umamo naman siya. Hello? Ito. Oh, go, go, go. Go, go. Oh. Doon ka, doon ka. <laughs> Ayan yung pumasok sa cloth. Yan, balik tarin mo sir. Yan yan, yan na, yan na. Ay. Huwag para tumakbo siya doon para pumasok siya doon sa dulo. So, pumasok mo siya doon. Ay, ayaw niya. So, bumalik po siya. Okay, nahuli na po. Yan, so, nahuli na po. Okay lang. Hmm. Ayan, ayan siya. So, ayan. I hope na visualize nyo ko. Ayan, so, medyo alalayan lang natin yung cloth bag, and then yung uh, door lock. And so, ayun. So, sa snap trap, uh, ulitin ko lang, uh, siguro, please take note of uh, precautionary measures lang. Please take note kung alin yung na-snap at hindi na-traps. 
But ayun, essentially, yan yung pag-retrieve ng specimen. So siguro yung inan sa inyo question, bakit kailangan kang i-retrieve yung specimen? Eh, di ba, diniscuss ni Sir Aris kanina, when you're uh, parang obtaining yung ectoparasites, pwedeng sa loob na lang siya ng cage, using naphthalene, etc. Ayan, so uh, most likely kasi, you'll also have to identify kung ano yung inyong host. Ano yung species ng rodent? Kasi uh, ectoparasites or parasites in general, marami sa kanila ang medyo specific sa species ng host nila. So you may want to report that. Although may ilan ding generalist. So when identifying, ayan, so when identifying rodents, uh, usually we take note of the sex of the rodent male, female, and then yung kanyang developmental stage or yung kanyang maturity. Juvenile ba siya? Uh, rep, uh, reproductive, mature, may reproductive maturity na ba siya? And aside from that, we also take, nabanggit din to ni Sir Aris kanina, morphological measurements, morphometrics. So, for identification of rodents, ito yung mga typically minimeasure natin. So, you have body weight, so, kung cage trap yan, pwede mo nang iwe yung habang nasa bag siya. And then, uh, we have total length. So, dito sa figure sa right ninyo, will, it will illustrate paano yung measurement natin. So, for total length, nagme-measure tayo mula sa tip ng nose. So, dapat pag minimeasure nyo yung rodent, naka-flat siya, laying on its back. And then, we measure from the tip of its nose to the tip of the tail. So, gaya na nakikita nyo dito, we use basic, yung basic na ruler lang and then your calipers, especially for the skull measurements. Ayan, so again, for total length, we start from the tip of the nose to the tip of the tail. Dito. Though, take note, minsan may mga species ng rodents na merong terminal hairs sa may tail. So, yung dulo, hindi yung mismong tip ng tail. Meron ka pang mahahabang hairs. So, when you measure the total length, ang ime-measure mo ay yung tip ng mismong tail. But you have to take uh, separate measurements for that terminal hair. So, yun. So, that's one. And then, you also have length of its individual parts. So, you have head length. For that, we have to use caliper. And so, skull measurement. Again, as with the total length, we always start with the tip of the nose. Tapos, uh, yung isang end ng caliper mo dapat nasa base ng skull. So, nasa mismo likod siya ng skull. Uh, please make sure na wala siya sa bandang ibabaw or uh, medyo naka-disorient. Please make sure i-locate nyo using your finger saan yung base ng skull. So, doon nyo siya in-measure. And then, you have the body length. Ayan. So, again, from the base of or sorry, from the tip of the nose, dun sa my base nung ano, uh, anus, basically. So, dito naglagay sila ng pin, marking yung tip ng nose, then nasaan yung anus, tapos sa tabi nun, naglagay sila ng pin, and then from this point to that point, yun yung measure nila. And then, you also have tail length. So, again, from this point, yung kung saan yung isang dulo ng body measurement natin kanina, up to the uh, dulo ng tail, that will be the tail length. And then we have ear. So basically, dun sa tip ng tail, tapos may parang uh, yung pinaka-base ng ear mo. Ayan, you'll have to measure that. And then hind foot length. So ito yung hind foot. So ito yung measurement niya. So we start from the heel of the... So one end, uh, we'll measure from the heel of the uh, foot, the hind foot, specifically up to the tips. Pero do not include the claw, just as the one illustrated here. So yung mismong foot or yung pes lang yung minimeasure natin. So please take note then that for morphometrics, lalong-lalo na sa tail and then sa ears, please take note then kung meron bang uh, natapyasan na cut na part. For instance, sa tail. Putol ba yung tail? You have to take note of that kasi that will affect your measurements and thus will have a consequent effect dun sa pag possibly pag-identify nyo ng inyong uh, species.
So yeah, so ulitin ko lang po, this is yung basic morphometric measurement. Tapos, uh, these morphometric measurements uh, together with the identification of the sex and then the maturity, these are what we use to identify the rodents. So aside, of course, the markings, then sa characteristic ng fur niya, uh, yung habitat, etc. Ayan, ito yung pinaka-critical, yung morphometric measurements natin. Ayan. So uh, in relation dito, kapag sometimes, in, lalo na in handling yung live na specimen, you might need to have an aesthetics review. And so uh, we use uh, anesthetic gases. Minsan, we also use carbon dioxide. So basically, we put them in a container, pwedeng improvise, tapos uh, we fill, essentially, we fill that container with carbon dioxide. Then, ayun, so it will, kumbaga, basically euthanize yung in yung uh, rodent. So uh, we may also explore those ano yung, ano yung different methods to euthanize the rodents. But the one that we commonly use ay nabanggit na ni Sir Aris, yung cervical dislocation. Cervical dislocation siya kasi you use a brief and quick force to separate the skull from your cer uh, cervical vertebra. Essentially euthanizing your your uh, the rodents. But again, just as mentioned earlier, this requires training and so kung uh, medyo hindi kayo comfortable doon, you may use other methods naman. But usually, ito yung ginagamit kasi you don't have to carry around with you and aesthetics sa field. Ayan. So, yun yung morphometric measurements. Meron pa ba? I think that's it. Uh, siguro play lang natin yung isa pang video from Sir Aris on voucher specimen preparation. So, that will show uh, yung iba pang, uh, dun sa video na yun, nag-measure din si Sir Aris, nung rodent, at the same time, pinakita niya rin paano yung pagkuha ng tissue samples for uh, identification. Ayan. Uh, ayan. Check team, thank you. Naman sa inyo yung pag-prepare ng voucher specimen dito sa field. So, usually, um, kapag ka mga sa diversity study, gumagamit kami ng snap trap so may mga ilang individual na nahuhuli ng snap so namamatay sila so pre-prepare na voucher specimen as evidence din na nakahuli ka na ng ganung species so after nyo mag-check ng trap ng umaga uh, usually ang mga ang trapper na nagdadala sila ng um, bag mamal, small mammal bag na ito ilalagay nila dito sa loob so saka ipaprocess namin yon dito. So, yung typical lang naman na ginagawa muna, so kukunin muna yung morph morphometrics nitong um, daga. Saka, syempre, dapat isusulat mo din lagi yan sa ano. So, may mga ilan din akong gagawin ngayon. After ng morphometrics, kukuha din ako ng tissue sample nitong species na to. So, may nakaredy na kami dito na mga ito. May nakaredy na kami mga vial dito. Ito yung para ilalagay dito sa muscle yung sa smaller container na tatas dito yung um, isa pang lung sample so make sure na bawat bawat na bawat individual na gagawin nyo nakaredy muna at nakalabel na agad yung mga vial ninyo para hindi magkapalit-palit importante din na yung tag para doon sa daga ay nagawa na rin para siguradong hindi kayo magkakamali sa ano so tig isa lang bawat daga so, morphometrics muna tayo. Okay, yung pareho lang din yung kinukuha dito. So, kukunin mo lang din yung measurement ng hind foot. Uh, itong species pala na ito ay apomis, I think this is apomis musculus. Ayan, so maliit lang siya. Um, usually, white yung... Pero i-verify pa na. Baka ito, ito yung microdon. Uh, ang karakteristik ng mga musculus din. So, mahaba yung tail nila. Relatively longer than the body. Tapos, um, itong kanilang tail, yung ventral side niya dito ay kulay puti. Tapos, black dito sa ibabaw niya. So, kunin natin yung hind foot. So, usually na, hind foot ay makamang ito. This is 22. Down, 
press tape, press down natin na ganyan tapos saka tatapat lang i-stretch lang pa to papunta pa taas dito sa kanya so ano, ito ay 100 ito 115 yan 115 tail yung isa pang kinuka namin ay yung ear length so dito i Babamon lang na ganito yung metal ruler. Tapos tinitin mo kung saan siya dito magtatapan. So, 14. Yan. 14 mm. Ah, saka yung huli ay yung kanyang, ay yung isa pa ay yung total length. So, usually uh, pinapada pa yung animal na ganito. So, doon sa tip ng snow, doon sa tip ng metal ruler, saka ni stretch out dito sa buntot. Yan ang mahama. So, nasa 198. Ito. So, um, titin na din kung anong sex nung daga. Um, may isang palatandaan minsan. Uh, by the way, itong mga puti dito ay mga itlog na yan ng mga flies nakita, ba? nakita na yung uh, itlog ng flies dyan tapos makita nyo yung dede nya dito so medyo visible na siya so mukhang so adult ito na babae tapos ito rin yung um, sa reproductive uh, parts nya so yung anus, ito yung area ng vagina tapos ito yung ihihan nila so female ito na adult Tapos saka kinukuha din yung weight niya. So, pwede rin doon sa bag kinukuha yun. Okay, ano. So, stop. Ayan. So, hopefully na-visualize nyo po paano siya gagawin. So, reiterate ko lang din yung sinabi ni Sir. Dapat pag nag-measure tayo, dapat siya doon sa ruler. So, you have to stretch out para mas accurate yung ating measurements. And then, yun. So, hindi uh, na pinakita doon, but it's good to have a uh, data sheet with you for you to record yung mga measurements. Wala naman standard na uh, form ng data sheet. A simple table will do. So, ayun. So, uh, should you have any questions, we can entertain them later when we go to the Q&A portion of this session. Thank you. Ayan, thank you so much, Ma'am Kim, for that demo. Sobrang ganda nung uh, naging flow ng ating demo. Ano? Parang dun sa unang video, um, nafe-feel ko yung thrill nung pagkuha nung rat, ganyan, parang kung nasa Nat Geo, habang sineset yung trap at habang nire-retrieve yung host, okay? So, thank you so much for that, Ma'am Kim. Um, if you don't mind me asking po, Ma'am Kim, uh, how, how hands-on are you dito sa rat trapping and rat retrieval natin. Have you had first-hand experience? Kasi mukhang maalam po tayo sa uh, mismong parts, yung use ng parts. Share your experience in using these uh, traps. Snap traps, cage traps. Ayun. Uh, actually, uh, dun, at least dun sa project, for the most part, we have yung RAs talaga na nag a assist kasi sila yung usually nasa field. Ayun. I so, see. So, meron po tayong project na need yung pag-retrieve ng ganitong mga specimens. Ayan. So, kung hindi nyo na itatanong, ano, ganito lang kami ni Ma'am Kim dito, on cam, ganyan, sa office. Pero pag nasa field na po kami, naho, Lumalabas na po yung ano, blood ng ancestors namin, ganyan. Lumalabas po yung pagiging ibanag ko, ganun. Hunter, ayan. So, hindi po kami ganun kaselan pagdating na sa field, ayan. So, uh, to continue with these fruitful discussions, ayan, kanina may napansin akong participant natin na nag ng hand. Very excited na to, to shoot their questions, ano po. So, 
to continue with this fruitful discussion, we will have later si Sir Aris, okay, for the open forum with Ma'am Kim. Ayan. So, to remind po our participants, uh, when you're asking questions, lalo na sa YouTube live stream natin, and also dito sa Q&A, please try to, uh, please state your name first, okay, yung sa ating mga teachers. State your name first, your affiliation, and then your question. As well as when you want to um, shoot the question by yourself, okay, you may raise your hand, you may unmute, state your name, affiliation, and then the question that you'd like to ask our speaker. So you may you may um, direct it to Sir Aris or to Mam Kim or to both of them, okay? So again, please state your name, your affiliation, and then the question that you'd like to ask. And then try to direct it if you if you want a particular speaker to answer that question, direct it to them, okay? So, ayan. So, let's, let's try to um, organize our thoughts. Ayan, I know you are very excited. But uh, while you're organizing your thoughts, dear participants, ayan, so I'd like to invite Sir Aris if he could be could come on board as well in this open forum to get ready for our open forum. So before we start shooting our questions, siguro I would like to ask personal questions naman muna. Ayan. So um, I've listed some thoughts of mine during this. Okay, so realization lang ano realization lang during the demo the lecture this is really not for the faint hearted we have been talking about parasites and rodents and this is not really for the faint hearted ano so sana okay pa yung mga sikmura natin diyan especially magla-launch na tayo later and another realization for this is Failing to plan is planning to fail. Remember, so um, yung mga procedure natin, yung mga traps na kailangan natin iset, ano yung mga locations na yan, di ba? So, kailangan we have this basic plan, yung flow ng procedure na gagawin natin, and be ready for um, any failings, ano, dun sa traps, dun sa pag... Siyempre, hindi naman natin yan mapaperfect sa unang try natin. So... Failing to plan is planning to fail. Isa yun sa mga realizations ko, ano. So, um, kay Sir Aris, ayan, kay Sir Aris, um, just a personal question, sir. I'm just really curious to know. During po dun sa field nyo, um, may mga instances po ba na, uh, for example, yung mga fleas, ganyan, may mga instances po ba na lumilipat siya sa damit nyo, sa mga gamit nyo, or nakikerry nyo siya, um, Mula sa field back to the back to the lab ganyan po were you were you affected by yung mga ectoparasites na encounter niyo on field just a curious question yeah. um hindi naman kasi gaya ng emphasis ko doon sa umpisa nung nung presentation kanina i-collect niyo na siya so uh, doon sa research ko talaga gumamit kami ng naphthalene powder talaga doon to really mobilize konti yung mga parasites so talagang uh, they, they've been moving around, pero we are quick enough to to capture them. Okay? So, mas mal hindi lang actually isang piece lang ng ano yon ng band paper. Could be cartolina din kung malaki talaga yung, uh, I mean, kung marami kayo. And then, so pagka tumatakbo na sila, so mag-improvise na lang kayo, so itataas mo lang dun sa isang side ng ano, ng edge ng band paper, so itataktak mo na mahulog lang siya ulit dun. Tapos pag sa tingin mo, wala nang gumagalaw, Doon mo na, misanan mo, ilalagay lahat yung, uh, for example, ito yung papel, igaganan mo na siya, tapos ilalagay mo na agad sila sa, sa vial. Okay. Yeah. Thank tapos, you, sir. Uh, when, you are if, when you are trying to do this as part of your research, huwag mong pagtabi-tabihin yung mga individual animals mo kasi i-record mo yung makukuha mong species and even the number of individuals para doon. Kaya minsan, marami kayong several bugs kayo nung, nung para doon sa daga. Tapos kung ginamit mo na yung isang bug doon, huwag mo nang gamitin ulit. So balik na rin mo yun, ipaaro mo, ipagpag mo, and then use another new bag. So kung ganun yung, yung uh, level ng research na gagawin niya. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, on a on an academic level, siguro, I would like to ask what fascinated you the most in studying this specific field, and what were the things 
what were the difficult parts or the things that you did not like dito sa pag-aaral ng rodents and their parasites? Yes, sir. Um, I have always been fascinated about form, the design of organisms. Yun yung isa kong in-emphasize kanina. So whether you believe in God or not, whether you see this, these organisms as, as product of evolution or product of creation, still you have a reason to appreciate yung kanilang uh, adaptation, yung diversity ng form nila. Uh, pero ang isa pang nakapag-incurse sa akin to pursue rodents is because I have... Um, people who can really identify rodents up to the species level for free. So, although these are foreign collaborators, so si Dr. Larry Heaney, one of the authors of the Small Mammals na, na book, di ba? Um, or Mammals of Luzon na book, talaga napaka-generous nila. So sabi niya, oh, sige, padala mo sa amin yung kopya, let's try to identify yung mga ganon. So, kasi parang yung ibang taxa naman, kaya hindi dahil ayaw ko sila, kundi parang I cannot move forward move or move uh, move on uh, with them yung study kasi hindi ko sila ma-identify. That's always been the hurdle in the scientific community, especially in taxonomy. You cannot proceed understanding ecology, mga ganyan, kung hindi mo alam yung species mo. Yun na rin yung na-experience ko actually para sa ectoparasite. Kaya hindi siya maka-move on, okay? Hanggang dun na lang muna siya. Actually, wala pa nga ako napapublish din na paper. Nag-attempt na ako dati, but uh, reviewers would say, we are hesitant to review the paper because of the possibility that there are endemic species affect the parasites that you've collected from your from your specimen. So, dun yung nag, napuputol. So, kaya ako tumutuli na lang sa rodents kasi kilala ko na sila. Pwede ko nang aralin yung community ecology ng mga species. And now, I'm studying behavior. Now that I see that I saw form, it's time to level up din for me for me. Anong kinalaman nung hind legs niya na ganun? Anong kinalaman nung kulay niya ganun? Bakit may stripe? Bakit mas maliit, maiksi yung buntot niya? So it's all part of the desire then to learn even more. Because for example, for me, I believe in God as the one who, do, who did, did these things. Diba? The more I understand the organisms, the more I understand my creator. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. How about you po, Ma'am Kim? Um, ano yung nag-fascinate or patuloy na nagtatap into sa curiosity mo in this field. Thank you, Ethel. Medyo ibahang ng circumstance ni Sir Aris kasi ako ngayon lang. <laughs> Kung pag bago-bago pa lang ako. So, feel ko talaga, my practice is more on botany and ecology. So, sa ecology part, one thing that interested me ay yung distribution patterns and ng mga parasites. Kasi usually, kung titignan natin mga biogeographical studies, they focus more on the uh, the host means no. So, uh, kung bagay naging entry point ko dito ay yung interest on their parasites. So, aside kasi sa ectoparasites and then yung mga endoparasites na nabanggit ni sir, we also have the microparasites, yung mga microorganisms that essentially cause disease. So, it interested me Ano yung dynamics niya with uh, the host, different species of host, and then how does, uh, ano yung rule na piniplay nila when it comes to uh, movement or kumbaga exchange of disease between uh, human-dominated areas and then dun sa, mas, uh, dun sa areas where you have more wild, uh, wild na populations, kumbaga ng rodent. So, yun, medyo... Uh, what really took me uh, into this, yung uh, pag-aral ng methodology, how to trap, is yung parasites. And yun, uh, siguro gaya din ng most of our students, factor din siguro yung, yung, yung sabi nga ni Sir Aris, yung design ng uh, rodents. So, akala kasi natin dati yung rodents lang ay yung mga nasa bahay, yung mga, uh, mga black na rats na nakikita natin. But yun, as you try to read into the, uh, into these makikita mo meron pa tayong maraming ibang species ng rodents that unfortunately i think kokonti lang yung nag-aaral yan so sina Sir Ari, sina Dr. Hini ayun yeah thank you so much ma'am Kim for that in relation to that uh, just briefly lang um what is the implication of yung yung paglaki ng urbanization natin as human species sa parasites and rodent communities natin. Just briefly lang. 
Ayun, Since, basically, uh, ayun. <laughs> so that urbanization, binabago kasi natin yung mismo, kumbaga, yung landscape. So you're actually increasing, pwede niyang i-increase yung areas na kung saan nagkakaroon ng interaction yung iba't ibang populations, like yung wildlife populations interacting with agro-synanthropic species, and in return, those agro-synanthropic species interacting with your human population. Kaya nakakaroon tayo ng emergences ng zoonotic diseases, which we have obviously experienced, na highlight siya ngayong pandemic. So, yun. Ayan. So, nakikita natin kung gaano ka-interdisciplinary ang issue ng biodiversity and conservation. Ayan. So, to, to go now to our questions from the participants po, let me um, read yung kanilang mga questions. Ayan. So, salamat uh, technical team for collating the questions. Uh, question po from Sir Mark Villarubia. Magandang araw po. I am Mark P. Villarubia from the University of the Philippines, Baguio. This is for Dr. Reginaldo, I- Re- Reginaldo po. For instance po, we would like to know the sex of our samples and we have collected a juvenile male and female rodent with similar features. Is it possible po to use the anogenital distance, AGD, to determine their sex if hindi po namin sure if sexually dimorphic yung rodent species collected. Do you like me to um, repeat, Sir Aris? Yeah, and also, okay. I'm reading it uh, also. Okay. So, okay. Um, yes, so that's that's another way to determine the sex of the, the, the host or the animal. Uh, pero kung is voucher specimen na lang din yung ipeprepare mo, so pwedeng mas di- direct na lang. So you dissect into the reproductive structures ng animals and maybe you, you, can, you can get a hint from, um, from that. Yun lang. Tapos ano naman sa mga rodents, I think hindi naman ganun kahirap din i-identify. Although tama nga, sa, sa mas mga bata hindi pa din masyadong na-identify yon Pero gumamit na lang tayo ng multiple methods to determine the sex of the animal, para sure. Okay, so thank you, Sir Aris. And I hope na address ng maayos, Mr. Uh, Sir Mark Villarubia. Okay, so uh, another question, or rather a concern po of one of our um, participants, si Ma'am Alma. Good morning po. Do you have available laboratory manuals on taxonomy for sale po? Thanks a lot. Ayan. So kanina po nagpakita si Sir Aris ng uh, open source materials for laboratory manuals regarding this. But do we have any available laboratory manuals on taxonomy for sale? Uh, correct me po if I'm wrong. I'm not. I'm not aware of any um, materials for sale right now from the university. You know? um, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Setting speakers. Um. Yeah. Wala tayong material niyan. Pero if we're dealing with uh, common species, we have. You, yeah, we have several materials already available that you can search. Sabi nga cagaan lang talaga yan. Um, even um, I think the ERI or maybe the uh, yung isa pang, ano nga, isang office na nasa UPLB din, meron ding mga guide din to identify best species of rodents. So, hindi lang yung pinakita ko sa inyong synopsis kanina. So marami pang ibang material na pwedeng gamitin. Okay? Um, tapos yung pag-identify ng parasite, kung yung mga common na lang din na parasite yan, so kaya nung pinakita kong libro sa inyo na reference material, pwede na actually gamitin agad yun. Uh, pero even for us, admittedly, um, because we are still learning about all of the, all of these things, so dinagde-develop pa rin kami ng mga materials din namin. So halos ngayon parang nasa utak lang namin yung mga information na yan. But of course, the, the, bear, the, the best way or the quickest way to share what we know is through, through this kind of workshop, mga ganyan. And um, because we, we, we have also other um, things that, that we are doing, talagang nahihirapan din kami to develop. Pero yung mga exercises namin sa UP, for example, yung mga pang-student namin, na-incorporate na namin din unti-unti yung mga, uh, mga techniques na yan. And even if we have laboratory exercises that are designed for us, we, I don't think na pwede nyo, I mean, maka mahirapan kayong gamitin. So, yung mga present ko kaninang class activities sa inyo, yun yung suggested na 
na, na mga activities lang na pwede niyong gawin at the level of um, high school. Kung sa yun, para, para pagdating nila, if they would want to pursue those kinds of research, uh, leave the work na to us and just inculcate early on the passion for these students para pagdating nila sa tertiary, hindi yung ano nga bang thesis topic ko? Doon ko pala makakikilala ko palang yung organism. So parang medyo late na. So ang goal namin is to really help you um, by trying to 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 simplify din yung mga ideas. Kasi akala natin pagka eto yun, parang complicated. Stomata na lang, ang ipapakita natin, leaf na lang, mga ganun. Pero ang dami pa palang pwedeng, pwedeng, pwedeng gawin. Okay, kasi nga naniniwala kami na dapat early on uh, nandiyan na. Pero going back to the question, uh, specifically, so wala din kaming pang mga ganyang material. So pare-pareho tayo. Ayan, maraming maraming salamat sir for clarifying that. Um, may nagtatanong po and I would also like to uh, shoot my question related to it. Ano? Um, how life-threatening is this ba, in th this conduct of these exercises, these laboratory exercises? So a question from Ma'am Maria Feliciana Benita Eloreta. Ayan. So this is Ma'am Minette po of PSHS BRC. Will you recommend vaccination for handlers of rodents? Anti-rabies, anti-tetanus, ayan pa. Uh, ayan po. And in your field collection, uh, do you, ito naman po, for, sige, so unahin po natin siguro yeah, yeah. yung um, question niya for vaccination. Yes. Uh -oh. Okay. Now, so kung, may, kung kaya na ng, ng mga mag-handle ng field work to get anti-rabies uh, and then some other uh, vaccines, pwede nang anuhin yun. Pwede nang i, pwede, I think pwede nang i-take, pero itanong nyo lagi sa medical health worker or maybe doctors know about this. Pero definitely, kapag ka nakagat kayo ng animal, especially yung mga invasive, at least yung pest rodents natin, if you're dealing with the animals around us, within the immediate, um, yung sa urban area, kailangan-kailangan talaga nyo magpa-anti-rabies shot. Dapat hindi yun. Kasi hindi, more likely, meron, meron yan. Di ba? Na mga, mga microorganisms. So, uh, we all, we always recommend that. So, pero kung in for precaution din, kung matagal kayo sa field, mga ganyan, so I think pwede naman ng, uh, may mga nagre-recommend sa amin noon na magpa-inject sila. Okay, yun, yun ma'am. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Ma'am Kim, how about you? Uh, the, are the research assistants po that are affiliated with the project, they, did they also have to get vaccinated against rabies, rabies or tetanus? Uh, they're not really required, but ayun nga, meron na silang, I think prior the project, they already had earlier vaccinations. So yun, kung kaya naman ng budget ninyo, and then uh, accessible naman siya, uh, we recommend that. Kung, ayun nga, kung recommended din ng medical doctors niya, as mentioned by Sir Aris, it's good to have yung prophylaxis then as part and, of yeah, the prophylaxis. Okay, so take note po ano yung mga different na um, preparations that we need to get for ourselves, for our safety then, before we conduct these um, field sampling and exercises. Okay, so another question po from Ma'am Minette. In your field collection po, do you request for gratuitous permit from PAM BDNR? Or when po tayo, kailan po tayo nagre-request ng permit? Yeah. Um, so yes, it's uh, definitely, especially if you are surveying or conducting your sampling sa mga forest because there's a chance that you get or you capture an uh, uh, sorry, uh, an endemic or possibly na native species. Okay? Kahit uh, sa, in the DNR, kasi parang first time na makara-receive sila ng request that uh, there will be no collection. Kasi para ano lang, so cage trap yung gagamitin. And then huli, huli pa rin kami ng, uh, ng, non -native, ay, ng native species, they still require us. Kahit sinabi namin sa project na capture and release yung project namin. So as, as far as the, the DNR car is concerned, yun yung parang naging agreement. Basta magtatrap ka ng, ng basta may involved na native species doon, kailangan nyo ng gratuitous permit. Pero again, kung backyard ano lang yan, uh, activity, uh, or sorry, backyard backyard trapping activity or kaya doon sa school nyo lang, hindi na kailangan kasi more likely ang makukuha nyo dyan ay yung invasive rodent. But in, in, in any way, like kasi sa Cordillera, backyard namin forest, nakahuli kayo ng posibleng endemic species, 
Dahil wala kayong permit, so you should always release the animal. Ngayon, kung namatay na yung animal, then at gusto nyong kunin siya na, 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 na voucher specimen for demonstration sa school, magre-request pa rin kayo ng permit from the, from the DNR. Ngayon, kung para wala nang ganun-ganun at namatay yun, o di ihukay mo na lang yung animal. Kasi dun lang din naman sila sa backyard uh, ninyo nakukuha. Ayan, so take note po. Thank you so much, Ma'am Minette, for your questions. Ayan, I'm sure yan din po yung mga uh, na, naiisip ng ating participants. And ayan, so please, please, please take note, ano, kapag backyard, maaaring hindi na mag-request. Pero kapag large scale po, uh, better po na nag-request din tayo from DNR Pambi. Ayan, so thank you so much for that. And another question, ayan, so... Um, I think medyo nadaanan din to, na napadaanan din yung sagot for this, but uh, I'll just, on behalf of Ma'am Minette, I'll just shoot it. Have you encountered invasive species of rodents po in your field sampling? Yeah, so she's curious to know. Yeah, um, so in all, in, uh, because I'm involved in a research project that, under, that tried to understand the, interact, the interaction of native and non-native species, I always capture invasive, uh, I'm sorry, maybe, well, the word invasive may be debatable uh, among us, but I can say that they are non-native uh, na non species. Two of them are uh, pest species. Well, with the adjective invasive, that remains to be invest investigated. That's actually part of what we are doing. Uh, hindi kasi lagi na pag sinabi nating non-native species or the pest species, automatic na invasive na sila. But because we already have initial findings and these are published, I can say that the pest species tend to only stay in the more disturbed areas of the landscape. Even there are less, um, uh, even if there are less uh, disturbed sites in which endemic species are more common, hindi sila pumupunta. So what we are seeing in our study is that pest species or the non-native rodents tend to stay where there are humans or at least the activity of humans are maintained. So, yun, so hopefully na-answer ko po yung tanong ni Ma'am. Ayan, so very alarming ito ano, kasi growing in urbanization natin, build, build, build projects from DPWH, ayan, and hindi lang yan, most of the carbon emissions ano, ay galing sa construction activities natin as humans, um, 30%, sa US lang, 30%. Ay, ng carbon footprint natin ay galing sa buildings, sa pag-construct ng building. So, this is really relevant to know. Thank you, Sir Aris, for sharing yung mga lessons learned, findings nyo po yeah. sa inyong maybe, studies. Yeah, maybe Kim can share also uh, based dun sa nakita nilang mga species dun sa project nila, kung ano yung mga encounter nila. Although, ang target ni Kim ay pest talaga, di ba, Kim? Um... Not necessarily po, pero yun nga po, mala uh, yung focus po kasi ng study namin ay agro-synanthropic species. So those, ito yung mga species na nakikita talaga sa mga uh, residential areas, uh, dun sa mga backyard farms. But uh, gusto ko lang i-reiterate yung sinabi ni Sir na yun nga. Interestingly, when it comes to non-native species, they really tend to thrive in disturbed areas. Ayun. So, yung mga nakikita rin natin sa mga bahay natin, those are examples of what yung mga na-mention ni Sir Aris and yun din yung usually natra-trap namin. So, yung mga common house rats, those are not really native sa Philippines. They were introduced, I think, through trades. Tama po ba? And so, ayun, naging until they become, they are non-native and they became, became pest pagdating, na, uh, pagdating nila dito sa area natin. Ayan. Thank you so much, Ma'am Kim, for sharing that as well. And thank you po sa mga discussions natin. Ano? Thank you so much for our participants for shooting these questions. Um, just a practical question po siguro for on my side. Ano? Um, gano po ka dami yung nagagastos natin for say one go of this? Sabihin natin backyard. Um, how feasible it is from the traps, yung pagbili ng traps, yung gloves. 
magkakano po kaya yung estimate natin na magagastos? Ano? I'm asking for our teachers out there sa mga probinsya din natin. Ano? So, do you have po an estimate siguro magkano yung kailangan? Okay, so if you are just using Snapchat, I think hindi yung tataas ng 200 pesos yung magagastos nyo for a class activity. You can assign someone who will do the trapping sa class. Bigyan mo na lang ng bonus, ma'am, sir, yung, ano, yung tao na yun. Kaya para hindi na kayo mag-alala din sa kung either makakagat ba siya nung parasite or hindi siya yung mag-ano nun. So pwedeng you live to the adults yung collection na lang. Basta sabi nyo, bring to class. Um, live rodent, parang ganon. So, nabagit ko sa lecture ko I think yung mga presyo, except kung tumaas na sila, yung maliit na cage trap na nabibili namin, I think may 90 pesos na ganon. So, if you have one, then pagtsagaan mo lang na, na lagyan ng bait, umaga, hapon, gabi, ganyan, hanggang may mahuli ka. So, at least pag may isa, okay, dalhin mo na, padala mo na yung si estudyante mo sa school. And with one individual, sabi, assume na natin ang dami niyang kuto sa ectoparasite, that's for the entire class already. Okay, mites pa lang pwede na. Okay, so hanggang ganun lang. So kung siguro damihan nyo konti yung cage, cage ninyo, uh, hindi yan tataas ng 500 or 200. Kaya pwede, pwede, pwede siyang gawin lang. Okay, so uh, take note po ano, sa mga gustong mag-request for added funds, ganyan. Or if you have personal funds you can you can use for your classes, ayan, nasa 200 to 500 pesos lang po. Um, Pwedeng-pwede nyo na siyang gawin sa class, ayan. So, um, just a general question na rin po for both speakers. Uh, I'd like to ask po, the tips, siguro, again, to reiterate then to our teachers, the tips on how to present these fields of interests ano, to our students to tap into their curiosity rather than their aversion from, um, from rodents, parasites. How, um, siguro, we can tap into our um, experiences sa class natin, ano, and yung mga field lessons din natin, how can we tap, how when can we present this study in a way that it would tap into the curiosity of our students rather than their aversion? Siguro, uh, Sir Aris can go first and then okay. Ma'am Kim. Um, so, gaya nung in-emphasize ko kanina, and even basing from my own experience as a student also and who, who, who loved biology as early as second, second year high school when I, when I started uh, learning biology, excited ako dati dun sa so yung one by one quadrat sampling namin. Tapos hindi pa natuloy, so sobrang disappointed ako dun sa biology teacher. Ay, baka, baka nandito pala siya. So, sir, sana wala ka dito. Pero sobrang excited ko na. Because so, ang strategy, I think, it should, number number one, the inspiration should at least start from the teacher. Huwag tayong magpapakita ng, ano ko, kadiri naman yung dagana. Yan, ano ba yung mga kuto na yan? Parang kinakati ako. Huwag tayong sana nagpapakita ng ganun. Uh, okay lang nun, gawin mo yun sa bahay niyo. But because there are students watching us and trying to learn from us, then pwede tayong maging neutral lang into into things. Okay, so, okay, sabi mo, beautiful naman talaga yun, pero kahit sabihin mo, subjective yung, yung, yung beauty. But indeed, more for, if we are teaching science and if it's biology, then all forms are beautiful because they are there. It's part of their adaptation. They survive and they survive um, yung kanilang challenges. So, dapat magsimula yung inspiration sa atin. And then the second level is, yun nga, yung importance of when we let them do things on their own, the activity now becomes part of their experience. And so therefore, learning now becomes part of the owning ng experience na yon. Okay? So, kung nakahuli silang daga, matatandaan nila yan, yung panguhuli ng daga na yan. Kung nang, nagsumilip siya ng ectoparasite sa microscope at hindi yan stomata lang, okay, magiging part ng memory niya yon. Okay? And then, also, i-reinforce nyo, kasi... High school yan eh. Kailangan minsan pilitin nyo din sila kahit ayaw nila. But of course, sometimes even in disciplining our kids, di ba? We tend to give them uh, requirements na pwedeng ayaw nila. But when we ask them to draw, for example, o oh, sige, drawing nyo yung ectoparasite na yan. Kasi, or pa-drawing man nila, ganyan. So at least involved dun sila sa process. Matatandaan nila yan. And well, hindi naman natin mag-guarantee and medyo old na rin ako dyan. Parang, parang 15 years ako sa service. Pero I also know na 
may, may mga ilan lang na ano tayo. But important is we plant seeds. We plant information. And mal, malay nyo, di ba? May maka, mat, mayroon tayong isa o dalawa na ma, ma, ma-appreciate ito ngayon. And so, yun din yung nangyari sa akin. Although I think yung sa akin, dahil nga I'm a, I'm a kid from the rural, na exposed ako sa akyat kami ng bundok, punta ka sa ilog, maligo ka doon. So, parang early on in my life na ano ko na, na parang na-appreciate ko na yung nature. So, sabi ko, magiging biology ang ipupurso ko. Sabi ko, agad, nung, kahit na elementary ako, tapos nung high school, tapos na UP ako, ganyan. So, yun na. So, yun lang. So, tuloy lang natin yung dalawa din. So, let them appreciate and then let them, uh, i-inspire natin sila by our own actions din. Maraming salamat, Sir Aris. Ayan, so, importante na nagmumula sa atin yung interest, yung curiosity, yung drive to study these um, fields of interest para din ma-encourage yung ating students to do the same. Thank you, Sir Aris, for that. Ma'am Kim, would you want to add more on that? Ayan, so, I agree dun sa mga sinabi ni Sir Aris. And to add siguro, I have two or three points. So, I think, unang-una, dapat equip din tayo as teachers. Ayan. Kasi primarily, tayo yung pinagkukunan ng knowledge nila. So, mahirap ipa-appreciate sa kanila kung sa atin mismo na medyo hirap tayong intindihin yung principles ng mga ginagawa natin. But at the same time, we should also be open from learning from them. Kasi, maaring may mga alam sila na di natin alam and they really appreciate when we really listen to them. Tapos, siguro second is ipaintindi, pakita natin beyond the measurements, beyond the description sa mga species, ipaintindi rin natin sa kanila yung roles ng mga species na to. So, roles in terms of epidemiology, yung mga pinaka-relevant talaga sa kanila, epidemiology. And then, in terms of maintaining yung sinasabi natin, ecological balance. So, yung mga parasites na sinabi kanina ni Sir Aris, although we view them negatively, we should be able to make them appreciate that these parasites actually do uh, have significant roles in maintaining certain populations and so things like that. So kapag nakita nila yon, mas makoconnect nila sa nangyayari sa kanila sa araw-araw. I think mas aside from yung nabanggit kanina that they should uh, parang they are owning their learning by doing things themselves. I think it will also be really helpful if they can link it with what they encounter every day, I think, must may retention in that way. Thank you so much, Ma'am Kim. And yes, so na- natackle ng ating speakers ngayon, ano? So, meron na silang tips for everyone here, our dear participants, those joining over YouTube. Meron na silang tips for us to embark, to start um doing these in class. And ang galing dahil pati yung relevant issues na i-coconnect na natin ngayon dito sa study ng uh, rodents and parasites, okay? Yung nangyayari na um, impacts ng climate change as well as urbanization actually that really affects yung population, yung distribution ng ating rodents and parasites. And I hope um, our high school teachers out there, mga kapwa naming guro, ay nagkakaroon po tayo ng fruitful discussion ngayon. And thank you so much for all your questions. Ano po. So again, please try to get equipped. Okay, marami po tayong resources online. May mga open sources na tayo online. And um, to request din from our speakers right now, ano, um, we would, if they would let us, okay, if they would let us share their PowerPoints, we will gladly let you know, ano, dear participants. We will gladly let you know if they would uh, allow to allow us to share their materials for this session, okay? So, thank you so much, Ma'am Kim and Sir Aris. And thank you so much for our participants today. Ayan, malapit na po tayong mag-lunch. But before uh, letting you go, okay, I would just like to somehow summarize the the lecture proper and the demo for today. So, today we learned so much about... Um, our rodent species, how to try to identify them, as well as our ecto and endoparasites, setting traps, retrieving traps, okay? So, and dami po nating natutunan in just a half 
day session of this cynicism. And so I would like to congratulate um, our, our cynicism committee as well. And of course, we can head over to um, awarding the certificates for this for this lecture and demo workshop. Ayan. So again, um, our evaluation link po for the lectures, I think it's it's going to be given by our Cynism Committee. Ayan po. And dito po makikita natin yung QR code. You may scan that. Pwede nyo po yung scan. And then we will be redirected po to our evaluation link. If you are joining from YouTube, you may scan that. And please give us a good review. Ayan, yung sa ating... Um, yung nag-organize as well as yung mga speakers natin, please do give us a give re good review over sa ating evaluation survey, okay? So, please do go to our evaluation link. You may start evaluating now our speakers, their lectures, the demo, and the cynicism proper, okay? Ayan. So, habang ginagawa natin yan, okay, yeah, so thank you po sa mga speakers. Ayan, so the teachers here sa chat po natin, they are, uh, pinaparating po nila ang kanilang um, gratefulness sa ating speakers. And I would just like to reiterate that on their behalf. So we have Ma'am Jennifer, Sir Mark, uh, Ma'am Minette, uh, Ma'am Lori, Ma'am Divina. Ayan, so Sir Christopher also commends the talk, very informative daw. And Mom Joanna, she's also thanking our dear speaker. So thank you daw so much. Uh, Mom Renalyn as well. Ayan. So bumubuhos po ng thank yous ang ating chat. Ayan. So again, um, please take note of the evaluation link. Ayan, na post na po sa ating chat. And um, those joining over at YouTube, Nanjan na rin po, you can scan the QR code nakatabi ng um, profile picture ni Sir Aris here on the slide. You may you may join through that. You will be redirected. You may also click the evaluation link. Okay, ayan. So please give us a good review over there. Uh, try to evaluate the speakers and the organizers for this. Cynism. And so, to continue with our program, syempre, hindi dapat natin makalimutan ang pag-award ng certificates to our speakers for today, okay? So, I would just like to read ano, the content of our certificates that would be awarded. Um, this Certificate of Appreciation is presented to Professor Aris A. Reginaldo for serving as a resource speaker for the talk entitled Rodents and Associated Parasites during the virtual 27th Summer Institute in the Natural Sciences and Mathematics with the theme Upgrading Senior High School Science and Mathematics Education, Content and Comp Competency Part 2 and with the Department of Biology sub-theme Rekindling Appreciation of Biodiversity from classroom to community, held April 25, 2022, signed by the chair of the Summer Institute in the Natural Sciences and Mathematics, Professor Meiji Bagangao, and of the Dean of College of Science, Professor Dimfna N. Javier. Ayan. Thank you. Thank you, Sinesem. Thank you, sir. Maraming maraming salamat po. Ayan. So thank you also for everyone's participation. And again, this has been your resident environmental ecologist and conservationist, Ethel Ruth A. Bakiran, your host for today's Cynism proper in the biology department. Ayan. So thank you so much, Paul, for everyone's active participation and for the, the questions. And also, most especially to our technical team, to our systems and network office, UP Baguio, and of course to our dear speakers. Maraming maraming salamat po. For the next certificate of appreciation, this is presented to Miss Kimberly P. Maglig Paglingayan, sorry, for serving as a facilitator for the workshop entitled Method Demonstration, 
trapping rodents, and collecting parasites during the virtual 27th Summer Institute in the Natural Sciences and Mathematics with the theme, Upgrading Senior High School Science and Mathematics Education, Content and Competency Part 2, and with the Department of Biology sub-theme, Rekindling Appreciation for bio of Biodiversity from Classroom to Community Health, April 25, 2022. Signed by the Chair of Summer Institute in the Natural Science and Mathematics, Prof. May J. Bagangao, and of course, of the Dean of the College of Science, Prof. Dimfna Javier. Ayan. So, thank you so much, Ma'am Kim. Thank you po sa patience natin to um, uh, communicate to our participants yung demonstration kahit na virtual siya. Ayan. So, thank you so much, Ma'am Kim. Okay, and ayan po, um, this concludes the first half muna of our cynicism. Ayan, and I'm, I'm sure magkakaroon tayo ng more fruitful discussions later on. Again, please don't forget to give us a good review sa ating evaluation form and so that ma-improve pa lalo namin ang aming mga services next year sa ating cynicism ulit. Ayan, so... Again, this has been Ethel Ruth Bakiran, and thank you, mga ma'am, mga sir, and I hope we enjoy our lunch. And later, para ma-energize po tayo ulit for the second half of today's cynicism. Thank you so much, and goodbye.
audio track po tayo. Medyo mahina, ma'am. Yes po, ma'am. Mahina, mahina, ma'am. Pwede kayo mas mapit tayo sa center. better ma'am pero mahina pa rin po uh, mag ito okay yeah. 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 clear ma'am loud and clear na po imaging ka eh. <laughs> yes ma'am <laughs> at your service um, hi ma'am oh, hindi naririnig yung speaker ko kanina ma'am nung unang trial natin pero Pag- ngayon okay po. naman na po pa default na ngayon siya sumasabay wala ma'am wala po ikaw lang po naririnig Ah, okay. Medyo may tama kasi yung speaker ko. <laughs> ah, okay. Clear naman, ma'am. Wala namang noise sa background. Okay lang. Ah, okay. Sige nga, Rod. Okay. Salamat. Okay, ma'am. Gusto mo, ma'am, i-try mag-share screen? Sige, sige. Sige, ma'am. Try natin. Ikaw lang naman, ma'am, yung naririnig. Mm, good. May topak yung speaker eh. <laughs> Ayan, okay na siya? Okay naman, ma'am. Sige, I'll try and mag-share screen pero naka-disable pa rin. Kayo, wait lang, ma'am, ha? Oo. Okay. Okay na po, ma'am. Try po ulit. Ayan. Okay. Try ko po, ha? Ayun. Okay. Pumasok po yung screen ko. Ayan. Meron naman, ma'am. Hindi lang siya naka-PowerPoint proof. Presenter na lang. Oh. Siguro. I'll try. Okay lang, Mage. Okay naman siya, ma'am. Yeah. Ganda. <laughs> um, mas maganda ikaw. Wow. <laughs> Ma'am, may participants na tayo. Huwag na tayo magbulahan. <laughs> Sige nga, road off ko muna. <laughs> Sige po. Bali, Ma'am, 1.30 po tayo. Hello din po sa mga participants natin. Start po ulit. Resume tayo ng 1.30 p.m. po. So, ayun. Kung gusto niyo po ulit ng another cup of coffee, tara po, kuha po tayo. Magandang hapon po sa lahat. Stop ko muna sharing, Mage, ha? Sige, ma'am. Kahit later na lang po ulit, mga 1.30. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Salamat din. Steph, pa-video loop muna ulit tayo. Sorry. Hanggang 1.30. Five more minutes.
And uh, good afternoon, po. Welcome back to our 27th Cynism with the Biology Cluster. And so again, I am Kimberly Paglingayan, and I will be your MC and moderator for this afternoon's program. Ayan, before we proceed with the program, lahat po ba ay nakapag-lunch na po? Mangyaring press like if you're satisfied with your lunch. Mukhang, ayan. So we have a few responses. And so, uh, sana po ay na-energize kayo sa inyong lunch dahil for this afternoon, we will have another fruitful discussion, this time with Professor Magdoto. So before we proceed to the lecture proper, of course, it is my pleasure to introduce her. So uh, Professor Lizel M. Magdoto is an assistant professor here at the Department of Biology. University of the Philippines, Baguio. She has an MS degree in biological science, but is also currently finishing her dissertation for her PhD, PhD degree in botany. So, si Prof. Magtoto ay malapit na pong maging Dr. Magtoto. As a researcher, she has developed a keen interest and adept skills in plant taxonomy, traits which she carries wherever she goes. In fact, when we go to the field or even simple walking lang, expect that Prof. Magtoto will be looking at something interesting. She will be taking photos of different plants. Ayan. Uh, aside from being uh, aside from being a member of the academe, of which she has already been 18 years now. So 18 years na, uh, 18 years na pong nagtuturo si Ma'am Magtoto. She has also published several articles, many of which focus on Philippine native plants. And these works were instrumental not only to create awareness of taxonomy and conservation of our native flora, but have also incited appreciation especially among her colleagues and students. So that being said, di na po natin papatagalin. Please uh, join me in welcoming our afternoon speaker, Professor Lizelle Magtoto. Thank you, May. I thank you, um, Kim. Thank you for the introduction. So I will proceed with my sharing now. So I hope every uh, my screen is clear sa inyong lahat yes, and my audio too. as well. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, so first, um, okay, so this is um, our topic for today's afternoon. So introduction to floristic biodiversity or uh, rekindling our appreciation in our students. So this is actually um, something that is significant nowadays because um, we have lost somehow in the, um, the, this past few years, we have lost our interest sa mga plants, sa mga biodiversity studies. But recently, upon, uh, after experiencing some of the um, consequences of loss of biodiversity, such as the recent pandemic, we um, again need to reassess ano nga ba yung dapat natin gawin with our biodiversity. So when we talk of biodiversity, according to the UN conference, um, this refers to a variability among living organisms and the ecological complexes of which they are part of. So that includes diversity within species or what we um, usually call as genetic diversity between species or somehow, um, sometimes we also call this uh, species richness. So gaano karaming species in one area. So for example, in a certain plot, um, how many species of grasses or ferns or bryophytes, trees are there. And among these, uh, um, these trees, for example, there's one species of trees, gaano karami yung variability na nakikita natin within this species. And of 
um, diversity of ecosystems as well, because different kinds of ecosystem would cater different um, kinds of organisms. So the more diverse the ecosystem there is in a one place, um, definitely we will be catering more um, various organisms, different species, and different um, genetic variability within species. So this um, biodiversity concept has been popularized um, in the 1990s. It was introduced in the 1980s, however, popularized after a decade. And then lalo na when they had this convention on biological diversity, um, lalong na enhance yung interest on conservation of biodiversity, assessment of biodiversity, and not only worldwide, I mean, not only at certain areas of the world, but particularly nagkaroon ng agenda to promote this um, this goals worldwide. So there is also target, um, may mga target dates, then target years uh, para ma-accomplish yung mga um, assessment of biodiversity as well as conservation of this biodiversity. So when we talk of biodiversity, as I've mentioned a while ago, this refers to three levels. So for example, genetic diversity, taking for example, yung ating mga beans. So when we talk of um, beans, Pwedeng nandiyan yung mongo, nandiyan yung string beans, bagyo beans, lima beans. So may mga red beans, black beans. So the, they may belong to the same um, group, pero if you look at it, different patterns of spots, different colors, different sizes. So lahat noon are actually exp um, ano to, phenotypic expressions ng kanilang genes. So iba't ibang phenotypes ang nakikita natin. That means they have different um, genetic makeup, although they be they may belong um, belong to the same species. At the same time, in one area, we can have different kinds of organisms, different kinds of plants, for example. So that is a species diversity. So in just a single family, for example, um, we can have different genera. And under one genus, we can have different species. At the same time, within a species, we can have different variations or forma if um, there are distinct um, characteristics that would separate one form or one variation from the other. And we have also ecosystem diversity. In here, I included um, terrestrial ecosystems, although um, we have to uh, remember na meron din tayong mga aquatic ecosystems. We have um, river system, we have ponds, lakes, we have the marine environment. And for the terrestrial ecosystem, I've here included lowland rainforests. So, nag-cater yan ng iba't ibang um, klase ng organisms, not only plants, but also animals. Um, mga kasama na din dyan yung mga microbes and lichens. So, nandyan lahat. And uh, in the Philippines, we have a lot of this kind of ecosystem kasi nasa, since nasa tropics tayo, we are being favored in terms of precipitation, in terms of temperature. So nasa atin yung um, mga magagandang conditions of the environment to, to, um, ano to, to grow or to propagate this tropical species of plants. And we also have mossy forests. So in the Cordilleras, we have a lot of um, mountain peaks where uh, we can observe different vegetations, especially mga sub-mountain to mountain, vegeta mountain type of vegetations, kung saan makikita mo yung mga liliit na trees. At the same time, nababalot sila ng mga bryophytes, mga mosses, orchids, ferns. And we also have um, forest over limestone or karst forest, uh, characterized, uh, characterized by and nga, may mga limestone formation, rock formation, and then you have vegetations on top or surrounding it, such as those in Bohol, Palawan, in the picture is Palawan, you also have in Pangasinan, in Sagada. And then we also have here grassland in the picture is uh, Mount Pulag, the, the uh, peak, um, peak portion of Mount Pulag. So you have, um, of course, predominantly mga grasses, but all, um, other than grasses, may mga um, high elevation species din na mga angus, uh, other angiosperms or other flowering plants 
na makikita, although these are very small in size. And we also have um, uh, San Jun ecosystem. In the picture, we have the Pauai in Ilocos Norte. So San Jun is also a distinct type of ecosystem kasi uh, sandy yung, yung, yung lupa, so definitely ma, ma, uh, porous siya, so ma, mabilis yung pag-drain ng water. So the species that are adapted in this kind of environment are those na medyo dry tolerant, drought tolerant, or at the same time salt tolerant since nasa coastal area itong um, San Jun na to. And then we also have pine forest, which is one of the um, predominant type of forest here in the Cordillera, especially in Benguet. Um, so we have a lot of pine forests here, characterized naman, of course, by the presence of pine trees, the Pinus Casilla, and uh, um, some understory vegetations like alnus, uh, ficus, and other species. So the more ecosystems you have, the more different organisms you can um, you can house. And at the same time, the more different genetic variations can be observed in such habitat. Now, in the Philippines, katulad na, naman, na, na mention ko, lahat na itong mga type of ecosystems that are present sa country natin, in, in, in addition to the aquatic um, environment or aquatic type of ecosystems. So just imagine gaano ka-rich yung biodiversity ng Pilipinas. So we also have island biodiversity. The Philippines is composed of different um, islands, small and big islands. So meron din mga island biodiversity na tinatawag for in, um, certain species composition can only be found in one island na hindi mo makikita in its neighboring island because of um, barrier, the physical barrier between these two islands. So again, that promotes biodiversity. So just imagine how rich the Philippines is in terms of biodiversity. Now, when we, um, when we include biodiversity in our discussion to our students, it it is always good to include why do we need to discuss biodiversity or why do we even promote conservation of biodiversity? If they do not see the link between um, studying biodiversity and their daily life, then wala nga silang magiging pakialam pagdating sa biodiversity. Kahit sabihin pa natin mga definitions of biodiversity and all its aspects, kung hindi natin ipapakita how significant this um, biodiversity is in their daily life, then um, hindi natin sila may encourage na i-appreciate yung ating biodiversity. At the same time, i-conserve yung ating biodiversity. So biodiversity provides different um, support system, ecosystem services, such as supporting that is, um, for example, in in, in the nitrogen cycle, carbon cycle, water cycle. So different type of ecosystem can have different um, ecological parameters. So nag um, pwede natin ipakita sa kanila how biodiversity controls this um, nitrogen cycling that would enhance or enrich yung, yung soil surface that further consequently enhance um, growth of vegetation that will eventually recruit or other organisms such as animals. So, paano nag-increase yung biodiversity at the same time? Ano yung kinalaman ng biodiversity in supporting other organisms? And then, provisioning services. Siguro ito yung pinaka- um, pinaka aspect, ay, ito yung aspeto na nakaka-relate sila mostly, the provisioning services as biodiversity provides um most of our drinking water. So forest, for example, doon nang gagaling yung ating mga inuming tubig, tubig na ginagamit sa bahay. At the same time, tubig na pumupunta sa mga ilog where we, we, uh, we catch fish and other um, aquatic organisms. So without our forests, so without our forest, wala tayong ganito ka-reach na water system. And at the same time, if we look at a forest na medyo um, isa or dalawang species lang ang nandun, then that will 
change the conditions of the environment. Like, for example, pine trees lang nakalagay doon, walang ibang understories. Then the soil will become acidic. Um, totally acidic siya mag, kung walang ibang organisms such as alnus. So the alnus somehow um, neutralize yung, yung pagiging acidic ng pine forest natin para at least makapag-grow pa rin yung ibang organisms. Pero kung imagine natin na puro pine trees yun and acidic yung environment, then wala halos magtutubo na ibang organisms surroundings niya. So if um, there is a pest that will attack these pine trees, what will happen to the forest? Makakalbo siya. So it will take decades before siya makarecover. So what will happen between those years? So magkakaroon ng flash floods, so magkakaroon ng landslides. Mawawalan tayo ng water kasi nga mag-drain siya easily papunta sa mga um, ibang areas. So walang mag, uh, walang, wala tayong catchment basin for rainwater and other um, things. And also for provisioning, syempre, nandiyan yung food. Um, biodiversity provides us food, um, ano ba, medicine, um, sh- mga materials for our clothing, for our shelter. So those are basic um materials that we can obtain from biodiversity. Regulating services such as um, forest serve as carbon sink. So yung ating mga carbon dioxide emissions, sila yung nag absorb nito, tumutulong sila para ma-absorb ito. And consequently, tumutulong itong forest na to as carbon sink sa pag, um, pag, pag uh, cool down ng ating temperature. So, ma-reduce yung um, ang tawag doon? Ma-reduce yung climate change. <laughs> what do you call that one? Yung accumulation ng carbon dioxide sa atmosphere. Okay? And uh, you have cultural services as well. So, nandyan yung mga rituals, mga traditions natin being supported by this um, biodiversity. So, without this biodiversity magiging wala walang magagamit ang ating community for their daily activities wala silang magagamit for their um mga traditional practices sa work traditional practices sa faith nila sa religion nila so wala silang magagamit na ganun and in addition mawawalan din ng aesthetic value yung mga halaman ay yung mga 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 organisms if we do not have much of this. So, for example, isa o dalawang species lang nakikita mo, then how will you put, um, I mean, uh, paano yung, um, paano ma-enhance ngayon yung cultural activities natin or yung mga aesthetic uh, materials natin sa mga paligid if we do not have much of this biodiversity. So, biodiversity also supports human health as um, 75% of those that we discover as drugs, nanggagaling sila sa mga natural products, sa mga na-extract from um, plants, um, mostly from plants, although meron din mga pro- um, drug products from animals. And then we have, um, in, a, um, in relation to what we experienced uh, this past years, so biodiversity keeps contagious pathogens from becoming pandemics. How? By um, serving as a nature system of checks and balances. So if, if there are, kasi karamihan sa mga um, emerging contagious um, pathogens natin, nanggagaling sila sa mga wildlife. So nagkakaroon ng um, transfer from one wildlife to another and then to humans if biodiversity is lost. So I will explain later kung paano na pupunta sa community yung mga pathogens na yan from wildlife if biodiversity is disturbed. Okay, so biodiversity loss is one of our concerns um, nowadays. And this is attributed to the loss of um, forest cover. That is because of exploitation of plant species, exploitation of animals, and also with climate change, kaya nga nakakatulong yung forest cover na yan to uh, reduce or to mitigate the um, effect of climate change 
dahil nagiging carbon sink sila, it also reduces pollution pero without biodiversity, lahat niyan ma-experience natin. And also, um, biodiversity loss is attributed then sa changes in land and sea use as um, nagkakaroon ng mga conversion of land, um, conversion of land, fragmentation of land. So lahat noon nagli-lead into biodiversity loss if not managed well. And then the spread of alien invasive species is one of the uh, major causes of biodiversity loss na nakikita sa ngayon. That is, um, when we say alien invasive species, these are introduced species. They are not native in the country. They are not native in the region. And uh, after its introduction, it has a tendency to um, it has a tendency to increase in number, occupying more spaces and possibly um, having negative effect on population of native species. So for example, we have Lantana camera, or in Ilocano, we call it Bangbangsit. So Lantana camera forms thick thickets. So malalim din yung mga ugat, ugat nila and they form network of root systems. So ma mahirap silang um, tanggalin sa isang area once na inoccupy na nila yung isang area. And uh, one thing more is, meron silang mga edaphic um, substances na, na nirelease. So may mga substances sa soil na um, nagpiprevent ng germination ng ibang species. For example, my seeds don ng native plants na gusto mag-germinate sana, but because of this um, chemicals being released by the roots of lantana camera, hindi hindi siya nagtutuloy na abort yung seed na yon. So that is one of the alien invasive species na concern natin ngayon. Another one is yung um, mga ipil-ipil, mabilis din silang kumalat. And that is because of their high reproductive rates then. Okay, so regarding biodiversity loss due to landscape um, changes in landscape use, nagkakaroon kasi ng edge effect. So kapag ka nag, yung isang buong fragment halimbawa ng, uh, yung isang buong mountain halimbawa, tapos nagkaroon ng, um, conversion dito into um, agriculture, nagkaroon ng conversion dito into housing, nagkaroon ng conversion dito into other purposes like poultry, for example. So, may mga remaining patches na lang, pero hiwa-hiwalay sila. What happens is, kung ano yung mga wildlife dati na nasa interior, they're being disturbed kasi nawawala yung mga gilid-gilid ng forest. So, either papasok, pa, uh, either pupunta sila sa gitna hanggang sa medyo mawalan sila ng space doon and definitely magkakaroon ng uh, magtatas ang mortality rate nila, mga ganon. Or they will move outward, increasing now yung um, species composition sa edge ng mga fragments. So just imagine if there are um, several fragments tapos lumabas lahat yung mga wildlife na nasa loob tapos they, they, they occupied the edges, then um, tumataas yung chances that they will have um, direct contact with the human communities surrounding those fragments. So whatever pathogens they are carrying, pwedeng malipat yon sa mga, for example, rodents or mga chicken na, na napupunta ngayon, lumalapit lalo ngayon sa community ng mga tao. So that's how some of these pathogens of emerging infectious diseases um, are transferred from wildlife into the human communities. So, yung concept na explain ko would look like this. So, we're in you have this big fragment, a big 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 patch of um of forest, for example, where wildlife are there. Mayroon ka interior species, and you have the edge species. Now, once there is a let's say nagkaroon ng conversion of land dito, so that um creates these two fragments. So the interior species may be reduced and at the same time the dummy ngayon yung population of the edge species. So 
if this um, species are are in, or if this species increased in number, then mas mataas yung chances na mai transfer nila yung mga pathogens to nearby communities. So in reality, this is how fragments would look like. So kung dati um, you have, let's say, malaking patch of forest dito, pero because of agriculture, na-convert na siya, so meron ka ng mga fragments na ganyan. So kung dati, just imagine how much biodiversity there is dito sa area na to, ilang wildlife ang nandyan, but because of fragmentation, ilan na lang kayang natira sa mga to. And they cannot even transfer or move from one fragment to another for purposes of food security or reproduction purposes. Hindi sila maka-transfer from here to there kasi nga meron kang mga um, areas na hindi nakakapag-provide ng food sa kanila. So in, they, they will not uh, travel across this one kasi threaten sila kapag na-expose sila dito. So if humans are 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 moving around this fragments, then mas mataas yung chances na kung may pathogens na daladala yung mga wildlife dito, they will be um, harboring this um, pathogens that may cause emerging infectious diseases. So forests then are significant, not only because they are carbon sinks, but because they are um, habitats for organisms, both plants and animals. So worldwide, um, we are uh, there is an estimate that 80% of amphibians, 75% of birds, 68% of mammals, and 60% of plants are within um, intact forests. So ganun karami or ganun kataas yung biodiversity na meron sa mga forests natin. However, this is how our forest cover is of, um, between 2002 and 2019. So there are, there are evidences na nagkaroon ng um, loss of the forest cover. Okay, so um, ito, lumiit yung... Okay, so na-reduce na yung... Ang UN naglabas recently ng statistics, um, 10 million hectares are lost every year. 10 mil million hectares of forest cover is lost every year for the past 100 years. Yun yung naging trend. So just imagine how much of this biodiversity is lost kapag ka nawawalan or nababawasan na nababawasan yung ating forest cover. So between 1990 and 2020, 1.78 million kilom uh, kilometer square um, ang decrease ng global forest cover natin. Okay? Now, syempre yung mga vegetation natin, yung mga halaman natin, mostly nasa mga forests sila. And this is, uh, this one gives us an idea of how much species or how much so, yeah how much species of vascular plants how diverse yung mga vascular plants na meron tayo worldwide so this is referring only to vascular plants how when we say pl vascular plants ito yung mga um this refers to the group of pteridophytes and uh, gymnosperms and angiosperms so ito yung mga may mga um, vascular system, xylem phloem, because bryophytes don't have such. Okay, so tingnan natin yung Pilipinas. Anong color ng Pilipinas? That is ito. Okay, so suggesting na meron tayong 3,000 to 4,000 species, number of species per 10,000 kilometer. So, yun yung um, diversity na meron tayo. Comparing it with other countries, let's say, for example, here sa Australia, so kulay green, so that is approximately 500 to 1,000 
number of species per 10,000 kilometer. So, ganon karami. Ang liit ng Pilipinas pero ang daming species na nakikita um, sa isang area. Okay, so kaya naman, tinatawag ang Pilipinas as one of the mega diverse countries at the same time, one of the hot spots. Why hot spot? Kasi, oo, mataas nga yung ating biodiversity. However, mataas din yung chances na mawala sila. Mapilis yung chances na ma-extinct yung mga organisms na to. Now, um, to be uh, classified as a biodiversity hotspot, may mga criteria ang ginagamit dyan. Like for example, presence or, or uh, presence of end endemic species. Yung mataas ba yung endemism niya? Yes, sa Pilipinas mataas ang endemism. There are um, a lot of species that can be found only in the country. So, mataas ang endemism natin. However, mataas din yung rate ng, bider, ng, ng habitat loss. So, there are chance, mataas yung chances na mawala yung mga endemic species na yon. And ano magiging impact nun sa worldwide biodiversity? Since endemic lang siya sa Pilipinas, and this contribute to um, worldwide biodiversity. So, once nagkaroon ng habitat loss sa Pilipinas, mawawala na yung endemic species na yon sa mundo. Hindi lang sa Pilipinas, sa buong mundo. Kasi nga sa Pilipinas lang siya makikita and it's counted as part of worldwide biodiversity. Kaya naman, um, though mataas ang biodiversity ng Pilipinas, it's also called a hot spot, biodiversity hot spot. Now, when we, um, etong mapa na to, as I've mentioned, it refers only to vascular plants. Ganyan na kadami. Now, let us take a look at other plants or other plant groups. So since our discussion is on floristic biodiversity, I would like to um, somehow touch the diversity of um, plants that um, is defined based on evolutionary history and defined based on their um, characteristics. So when we say plants, generally, this uh, um, ang, ang definition natin is these are green in color. That is because they have chlorophylls A and B. Okay, so there are other green organisms such as green algae, lichens, but they do not have both chlorophylls A and B. So what makes plant different from or distinct from these groups is that they should have a combination of chlorophylls A and B. In addition to that, they have cellulosic cell wall, they produce starch, and these are multicellular eukaryotes. So some green algae, they may be green in color, pero these are unicellular organisms. So, hindi sila kabilang sa plants. So, but the fact that they have, um, they have green chloroplasts, mayroon silang chlorophyll, minsan tinatawag natin silang mga chlor um, chlorobionta or mga green plants. Kaya lang, for the purpose of our discussion, we will cover only the embryophytes or the land plants. So, among land plants, kabilang dito yung mga bryophytes, the liverworts, mosses, and hornworts, and tracheophytes, or the vascular plants, kabilang na dyan mga ferns, the gymnosperms, and the flowering plants. So, ano yung mga distinct characteristics nitong grupo ng embryophytes na to? So, they have... Uh, the cuticle as their protective covering kasi nga they are land plants so they should have a protective cover that will um, protect them from desiccation since exposed sila sa, sa direct sunlight exposed sila ngayon sa water loss mataas ang chance ng water loss mataas ang chance ng um, desiccation so they should have a protective covering and that's the cuticle so they also have gametangia, where gametes are, uh, are uh, protected, so hindi exposed yung mga gametes nila. And they have this embryo, or 
uh, housed um, fertilized gametes. They have independent, um, so ito yung characteristic ng mga bryophytes. And for tracheophytes, they have independent sporophyte. Kasi yung kanilang sporophyte, um, hindi na siya totally nakahouse dun sa gametophyte ng halaman, hindi tulad ng mga bryophytes. And tracheophytes, katulad na na-mention ko kanina, these, are, these vascular plants have the vascular system, the xylem phloem. So, nandyan ang xylem phloem. So, makikita na siya among pteridophytes, the gymnosperms, and of course, the flowering plants. Now, the pteridophytes do not form secondary xylem tissues or we, uh, what we commonly call wood. So, yung presence of wood is a characteristic of the, the um, spermatophytes or the seed-bearing plants, which includes the gymnosperms and the angiosperms. So in addition to forming um, secondary xylem, and you have also the seed-forming um, seed organisms. So meron na silang seeds. However, yung seeds ng mga gymnosperms, differentiated from the angiosperms, yung seeds nila are naked. So it's not housed within um, ovaries. So nakadikit lang siya sa surfaces ng kanilang mga sporophylls. For example, sa mga pine cones, kapag titingnan mo yung mga sporophyll or yung parang bawat scale ng pine cone na ganun, nasa loob na, nakadikit lang doon yung seed niya. Hindi tulad ng mga angiosperms na yung seeds nila are housed within ovaries, yung sa fruit. Okay, so meron na silang among angiosperms, meron na silang flower, which has the ovary in it. Tapos sa loob ng ovary, nandun yung ovule, after fertilization, will become the seed. So that differentiates this group of organisms. Okay. And for the bryophytes, okay, now for the bryophytes, so just imagine, ilan yung grupo natin ng mga embryophytes? You have the bryophytes, the pteridophytes, the gymnosperms, and the angiosperms. So we have four major groups. Now, bryophytes is also one of the diverse groups of land plants. Approximately, they have uh, greater than 20,000 species worldwide. And this forms um, the basal group of plants. I, I mean, yeah, historically, they are the first land plants. They evolved, um, so, some evidence shows um, relationships between bryophytes and algae, suggesting aquatic um, origin. Yung ibang species ng mga bryophytes, meron silang mga aquatic origin. And these are also prone to desiccation compared sa mga, um, um, compared sa mga tracheophytes, mas prone ito sa desiccation kasi um, they have minimal to none cuticle, kaya naman mas adapted sila sa mga moist environment. So, um, punta ka sa, punta ka siguro sa, ano, sa, sa, sa sun June, hindi mo makikita tong mga bryophytes na to, kasi nga sobrang init doon. And they, these organisms have very thin gametophyte. So, this is the part of uh, the bryophyte. So, you have the sporophyte here. So, meron siyang capsule, meron siyang seta. And then we have the um, leaf-like structures, the phyllid. And then you have the root-like structures. Okay. Um, atong kanyang gametophyte or the phyllid, it's, most of them are one cell thick lung, especially the, the um, mosses and the leaf liver words, the horn words, one cell thick lang halos, karamihan, yung kanilang gametophyte. Kaya naman madali silang madesicate. Unlike other liverworts, katulad nitong mga phalloid liverworts na to, somehow medyo thicker na yung cortical tissue nila, yung cortex nila. Kaya medyo mas, um, mas adapted na sila to a drier surface. Okay, and in terms of their ecosystem services, syempre they, they made terrest animal terrestrialization possible kasi nga since these are the first land plants, so na, um, somehow na, na facilitate yung growth then ng ibang organisms by conditioning the soil. And after, after um, conditioning the soil, 
and facilitating the recruitment of other um, plants, then that favored naman yung animal terrestrialization or yung movement ng animals to land environment for them to um, get food or for them to reproduce in the land environment. Okay. Now, here are some of the bryophyte species, specifically mga mosses. Okay, gusto ko lang i-share sa inyo how, how beautiful these organisms are. Kahit malilit sila, there's, uh, they, they are attractive para sa akin. And I hope you will also appreciate it. Now, before I was able to look at... Um, the small details of bryophytes, wala lang din sila sa akin. Lumot lang sila na nakakapit sa mga trunks or nakalagay sa mga surfaces ng mga bato. These are just part of the lumot system. So, dinadead ma rin. Katulad ng iba, or katulad ng karamihan rather, halos hindi, rin, hindi ko rin sila pinapansin before. But, kapag kapupunta na tayo ngayon sa mga forest, isa na siya sa mga um nakikita other than just flowers interesting na rin silang tinan kasi in just one patch pwede ka na makita ng tatlong species dun sa isang patch na ganun ng mga bryophytes and they all exhibit different types of morphology so for example this one so sa isang bato nandiyan yung population na yan and if you look at it individually ganito yung isang individual. A closer look of that is this one. Now, what makes this group interesting is they are the only group of mosses na merong dalawa, tila dalawang dahon na mag, oh, nagka-overlap. So, you have this um, leaflet, you have this phyllid, and then on top of it is a dorsal blade Meron kang dorsal blade dito na parang nakadikit lang siya or nakapatong lang siyang ganun. So that characterizes this family of mosses, the Physidentaceae. So yan, may siyang dorsal leaf doon, may dorsal leaf, may dorsal leaf, may dorsal leaf, may dorsal leaf. So that characterizes this family of mosses. So magandang ipakita rin ito sa mga sujante para ma-appreciate nila yung structure ng ganitong halaman na hindi lang yung pag sinabi mong halaman, ito yung namumulaklak. Kung minsan pa nga, when I talk to um, um, non-science people, um, eto, ano pong bulaklak nitong halaman na to? Can you describe? Ano, ano po yung itsura ng flower nito? Ay, hindi man yan namumulaklak. But the fact that it's a, a, an, an angiosperm, syempre, meron siya dapat bulaklak. Pero dahil hindi, hindi na mumulaklak, hindi nila pinapansin. I mean, dahil hindi nila nagkikita yung bulaklak, hindi nila pinapansin kung kailan siya na mumulaklak or kung ano yung tsura ng bulaklak niya. Pero if you know that this is an angiosperm, definitely alam mo na mamumulaklak siya. At kapag alam mo na hindi siya angiosperm, hindi mo siya tatawaging na mumulaklak. Kasi kung minsan may mga ferns na pinapakita sa amin sa field, tapos Yung ang bulaklak po nito, yung ganito ang itsura. But actually, that's not the flower. It's, they are referring to um, the sporophylls or yung spore-bearing structure niya. So, maiging may pakita yung actual na specimen sa mga sujante for them to appreciate yung ganitong klase ng mga halaman. That there are a wide variety of um, plant forms. So this is Nyasii, characterized by this, um, this, what they call it, um, benzo spiral, na spiral na um, gametophyte, and the nodding capsule of the sporophyte. Plus, a closer look of the leaves, meron kang makikitang border um, cells sa margin niya. So, meron kang parallel um, cells that are arranged in parallel position dito sa margin. 
Okay, and then we have the Dikranasii. Dikranasii, meron silang parang hair point tip. If uh, meron silang hair point tip sa dulo. And then you have this um, group of leukocytes. Uh, leukocytes. Um, yeah. Meron kang mga no, um, cells dito na walang pigment. And then, yung characteristic ng capsule nila, so meron silang hood, may hood sila na nakabend. So that is um, the um, hood na kaliptra, kaliptra ng peristome nila. And then you have the leukobriasi, leuco, the leukos, uh, marami silang mga leukocytes or cells na walang pigment, kaya naman, Kapag natamaan sila ng araw, ganito yung magiging kulay nila. Parang parang walang uh, parang whitish yung surface niya. Kasi dito, ito yung transverse section or yung cross section ng dahon niya. Yung mga upper layer of cells niya, mga surface layer of cells niya, walang pigment, walang chlorophyll. Ang may chlorophyll lang yung mga nasa gitna na cells niya. And taxonomically, significant kung saan distributed itong mga cells na may chlorophyll. Okay. And we also have the family or orthotricaceae. So, characteristically, ma-identify natin itong pamilya na to by looking at the calyptra, yung capsule niya. So, yung, ito yung capsule niya, yung calyptra niya extends or yung kalipta, when I say kalipta, yung pinaka sombrero niya, it extends um, doon sa baba ng mismong capsule. So, mas mahaba yung kalipta niya than its capsule. Okay. And then we have um, this phagnasii. So, phagnasii is common sa mga mossy forests. So it's characterized by having this um, curled branches. So meron siyang mga dikit-dikit na branches. So, saan yung individual leaf nito? That's not the leaf. But rather, yung maliliit na yon yun yung kanyang phyllids, yung kanyang mga leaf-like structures. So ito isang branch yan, isang branch yan, isang branch. Tapos nandun yung mga maliliit na dawan. Okay. And we also have the diasii. So this one is um, medyo woody naman yung kanyang uh, mga branches. Woody and then planar yung arrangement ng dahon. Tapos hylocomyasii, kung papansin nyo, ito mas woody, tapos planar yung dahon niya. Ito naman mas kalat-kalat yung dahon and it's not woody. Pero kapag unang tingin, parang pareho lang sila. And we have Nekarasii. Nekarasii niya man, um, ito hindi siya woody, hindi katulad ng Subiasii. Pero yung dahon niya, medyo planar din siya. Although, pagkakaiba niya dito, ito, spirally arranged yung dahon. Well, this one, distikus yung dahon niya. So, may mga pag ganong pagkakaiba. And then we have Spiridentasii. Spiridentasii is one of the um, mosses na mahaba. So, karamihan kasi mga mosses, mga malilit lang, few centimeters um, long lang. Pero ito, um, pinakamahabang nakita ko sa field is approximately one foot road. Yung yung one, eh, mga 12 inches. Mga ganun yung haba niya. Okay. And then we have brachyphysiasii. So, serrated yung margin ni brachy. Okay. Marami pang iba't ibang klase ng um, mosses, but I've included here only some of the collections we had from Mount Data in Wauko Mountain Province. Okay. Now, moving to um, the other groups of plants, ganito naman sila ka-diverse. So, this one is taken from um, Coast Digital Flora of the Philippines. So, 
recorded families that are present in the country, meron tayong 40 for eridophytes or mga fern and fern allies, six families of gymnosperms, and 239 families of angiosperms. So, ilan sa mga ito ang um, and ilan ang may endemic genus tayo? For example, one for um, teridophytes and 19 for angiosperms. So, in each genus, take note that there may be one or more um, species. So, kung 19 genera, at sabihin mo nang may 10 species kada genus. So, yun yung contribution natin sa world flora. So, sa Pilipinas lang yan makikita. Now, if, the, uh, if their habitat is lost, then these endemic species are lost, pwede siyang ma-extinct, ma ma so mawawala na rin sila sa listahan ng world flora. Okay? So, the total number of species that are native to the country, so there are 1,037 approximately for ferns and fern allies, 42 for gymnosperms, and 8,351 for the flowering plants. When we say naturalized, these are introduced, but then somehow fa uh, found their ecological niche in the country. So we have six for teridophytes, 539 for angiosperms. How about endemic species? So we have 4,518 species for, uh, for flowering plants and 269 species for ferns and fern allies. So total mo yan, plus yung sa gymnosperms. So yan lahat yung contribution natin sa world flora. That if forest cover in the Philippines will continually, um, continually um, decrease, there is a tendency that this will also decrease at the same time magdi-decrease yung maapektuhan yung 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 world flora natin. Bababa din siya kasi sa atin nga lang nakikita ito. So kung mawala siya sa atin, definitely mawawala na siya sa bundok. Okay? So, 50.9% of our native species are endemic to the country. Ang taas ang endemism natin, kaya naman we are also classified as a biodiversity hotspot. Now, let me just share to you um, yung uh, floristic survey that we conducted in one of our research areas. Because biodiversity varies across countries, biodiversity varies across regions, it varies across provinces and also municipalities. So in the Philippines, the northern part of Luzon, in the northern part of Luzon, we conducted a floristic survey sa isang maliit na municipality. Maliit lang yung area na na-cover ng survey, but then we were able to document 21 families of ferns. Okay? Ferns, um, teridophytes mga to. So there are 21 families of teridophytes belong to 32 genera for a total of 44 species. So that includes one of the critically endangered Platysorium, Platysorium coronarium, and then we have the um, other threatened species category, uh, yeah, uh, assessed as OTS or other threatened species by the DNR, and Chopteris effecta, or this is the giant fern. And then we have um, other ferns found in the field, the plagium, like godium, pleochnemia, and others. So we have here ceratopteris, calictroides, which is an aquatic fern um, assessed as endangered species. And we have the oceanopteris egregia, classified as vulnerable species. Other vulnerable, we have Shinjia ferox. And other threatened species, we have the Lanasium banksifolium, which is found near river systems. And we have also another endangered fern, Tectaria somiocarpa. Okay. And we have also 38 families um, of flowering plants for a total of 93 species, which include 
yung kalanthe species, mga kalanthe, Aeskinanthus, Argostema, Calamus, Aglonema, Plocoglotis, iba't ibang orchids, Lasianthus, at iba-ibang Zingibara, si E, and um, representatives ng mga Pandanaceae, Phrasinetia, and then we have um, Phytocrine, which is a, uh, one of the um, earliest plant groups, mga paleontological groups, ang mga Phytocrine, Ikatisinaceae, and then we have other orchids here. So, marami sa mga halaman na nandun sa area are actually first records for the area. Yung iba naman, newly discovered. Kasi sa sobrang, um, sobrang intact pa yung forest, madami species pa ang na-document dito. But then, if we look at it, nagkakaroon na rin ng conversion of land for farming purposes and settlements. Then pa man, malaki pa rin yung forest patch na pristine and maraming bodies of water na nandito that supports the forest as a forest of vegetation as well. So for example, you have um, this waterfalls, you have gullies inside, and we have also an open grassland. So iba't ibang ecosystems din, kaya naman, kahit maliit lang yung area, still maraming species na nakita. So one of the um, discovered species in this area is um, Amorphophallus adamsensis, which is an ally of um, Amorphophallus longispathaceus and Amorphophallus restratus. So longispathaceus is um, distributed uh, mula Luzon hanggang Mindanao, may records of distribution. Air stratus as well. Tapos mayroon din dito sa La Union area, si Rostratus. And Adam Census is recorded only in Ilocos Norte so far. Okay, and uh, this is how, so kung titingnan mo, <coughs> parang pare-pareho lang naman yan. Meron siyang, <coughs> sorry, meron siyang um, spathe, meron siyang spadix, pare-pareho lang naman tsura. But actually, when you look at closer um, examination at their reproductive structures, pag hinati mo sila, then you would notice the difference between the female and the male structures. Okay, so these are the female structures of the three species, and these are the male structures. Okay, so yan yung tinatawag natin, species diversity, at the same time, genetic diversity kasi pare-para silang amorphophallus but then you will see genetic variation as exemplified by their phenotypic variations. Okay, and then um, pagdating naman sa pitule, iba-iba din yung kanilang markings. Pagdating sa dahon, iba-iba rin yung shape nila. Okay, so kapag ka um, na-expose yung mga sujanda natin sa mga actual na vegetation at hindi lang sa pictures or hindi lang sa descriptions, they, I believe, would appreciate more our biodiversity, floristic biodiversity. Okay, so this is my ongoing work on the Ardisha species in Greater Luzon. <clears throat> So thank you for Mr. Peñales and Mr. Pagaduan for uh, the map. Tinulungan nila akong uh, i-plot yung distribution ng mga Ardisha dito sa Greater Luzon. And um, these are just some of the 39 species that, is uh, that are found in the Luzon area. Greater Luzon area, that's from the north down to Sorsogon. So, um, ilan sa mga na-document po sa field includes Ardisha serata. So, these two are Ardisha serata. This one is from high elevation, and this one is from a lower elevation. Though, 
uh, medyo may variability yung dahon nila. Those that are in high elevations have shorter, smaller leaves compared to those that are found in lower elevations. Magkaibang lugar within, uh, within mainland Luzon, magkaibang provinces mga to. But then again, the general morphology, um, kung hindi mo i-consider yung size ng dahon, magkamukhang magkamukha sila sa description. So I, I believe um, yung, yung um, variation nila sa sizes ng dahon may have something to do with elevation, yung habitat conditions nila. And then we have um, Ardisha um, marginata, <clears throat> Ardisha geysanthoides, tomentosa, Warburgiana, Simosa, and this one is a new species um, described from the, prod, um, the, the site here in central Luzon. <clears throat> Sorry. So we were able to document this one in central Luzon, specifically Nueva Ecija. So this is Ardisha kalimbahin. So kapag titingnan mo, magkakaiba lang naman sila sa kulay. Pero after examining um, yung kanilang reproductive structures, a section of the anther, a section of the ovary, measurements of the anthers, measurements of um, the calyx, the corolla, presence, absence of glands, presence, absence of indumentum, um, the structure of the style and the stigma. Is the stigma pointed or... Um, Meron ba siyang parang bulb or meron ba siyang parang beak? Mga ganun. So magkakaiba yung kanilang structures pagdating dito in addition to other vegetative um, differences. Differences in leaf um, shape, leaf margin, leaf structures. Lahat nun would add up to um, the, their distinction as separate species. So... Kapag ka, um, tinitingnan ko yung mga examples, ay pag tingnan natin yung mga examples na binigay ko, lahat nun were gathered from forests. However, nowadays, floristic biodiversity is not only exclusively a product of those natural environments or natural processes as well, but also caused by human activities, lalo na yung introduction ng mga ibang species. So, yung floristic biodiversity natin, yes, nag-increase nga ng, ng species richness by introducing other species not native to the country or not native to the region. But then, how would this introduced species impact the existing native populations? Will it, um, will it really increase biodiversity, enhance biodiversity, or will it negatively impact the population of native species? That is one of the questions. <clears throat> now, um, appreciation to floristic biodiversity is also enhanced by human active, other human activities such as the way they use um, yung mga halaman sa paligid nila. So if you go from one region to, uh, from one place to another, from one province, for example, to another province, they might be using one species of plant for different purposes. So, maaring ito ginagamit nila for, uh, for food, pero dito sa area na to hindi nila ginagamit as food, but, oh, but, but rather pang aesthetic lang yung gamit niya. So, if we want our students to appreciate floristic biodiversity, kailangan um, alam din nila yung gamit nung halaman na meron sa paligid nila. So, ano yung usefulness value niya? Ano yung utility value niya? At the same time, ano yung aesthetic value niya? So, kung minsan kasi ang titignan lang natin is yung aesthetic value. Ay, ang pangit ng bulaklak niyan. Ang liliit. Ito na lang, mas malalaki. So, bibili ka ngayon ng introduced species. Kasi sila yung may mga lalaking flowers. Whereas yung mga native species natin, karamihan maliliit ang flowers. So, um, dinidisregard natin yung mga native species natin because of hindi sila appealing, wala silang aesthetic value. So kung minsan ang binibigil lang natin ng pansin is yung ma-aesthetic value. But if we are going to introduce other 
functions or other services that these um, native plants may serve, like for example, provisioning, support services, mas ma-appreciate nila ngayon yung, yung diversity ng mga halaman. So, is um, utility services or utility yeah utility um, value plus aesthetic value that the intertwine lagi yan if we are going to explain biodiversity to our students kasi nga hindi nila ma appreciate yung isang um, halaman kung hindi naman nila alam kung ano yung gamit niya or how will this um, have impact to their life so at this point gusto ko itanong sa inyo um, can you name some plants that have an impact sa life ninyo? Like, for example, three plants at least. May makakapagbigay ba ng at least three plants na merong malaki impact sa buhay ninyo? You can chat your, uh, you can write your answer dito sa ating chat box. Wala. Guava. Okay, why guava? Um, sir. Roel, may I ask please, bakit guava? You may, um, um, mga host natin, pwede ba silang mag-audio? <laughs> or sa chat box na lang din? Okay, so may nagsabi din aloe vera, katakataka, tsaka ang gubat insulin plant may sino pong mag-volunteer um, ano yung naging impact nitong mga halaman na to sa buhay ninyo mm -hmm. you may raise your hand po to uh, for for the secretary secretariat to unmute yung inyong okay beetle leaf beetle leaf beetle lo vegan what is lo vegan sorry lo vegan aloe vera dangla mm, first time ko pong marinig ang lo vegan <laughs> ano po yun source of sati Hmm. Well, natutuwa po ako at may mga na-mention na kayo ng mga halaman. Now, I just hope na kapag tinanong din natin yung mga sujante natin, they can name some of it. Kasi um, may mga, lalo na po yung mga sujante ngayon, base sa aking experience sa klase at sa mga bata rin, mga pamangkin, anak, Minsan, hindi nila alam kung ano yung kanilang mga binibiling gulay. <laughs> Kamukha lang daw nung dahon, kaya binili na lang mga ganon. But actually, hindi naman yun yung pinapabiling gulay. Ayan. So yes, nagkakaroon ng impact to our life because of its utility value. Ginagamit siya for trad as traditional medicine. Okay. So, para sa kanyang medicinal value. So, that's it. So, kung meron kang, kung alam mo yung gamit ng isang halaman, you will put importance doon sa halaman na yun. So, hindi mo lang siya pararamihin, i-conserve mo pa siya. Hindi mo hahayaang mawala sa bakuran mo kasi you know that it is uh, something that you can use. It is something that you can, um, yeah, you can drink or something that can use as medicine. So, kung alam mo yung gamit niya, alam mo siyang, protektahan din, i-conserve. Okay? So, for income, uh, yeah. So, meron siyang income value. Meron siyang economic value. So, yung bang halaman. Yes. So, there. It is also good 
kapag ka alam ng mga estudyante natin kung ano ba yung gamit ng mga halaman na yun, hindi yung um, basta na lang sila kakain ng mga gulay-gulay without knowing anong gulay ba yon saan ba galing yun, saan, saan ba tinatanim yung gulay na yon Kasi, for example, if they know that vegetable and they eat it, tapos kung alam nila yung pangalan niya, alam nila yung ecological background ng vegetable na yon then more or less, alam nilang bigyan din ng significance yung ganong type of ecosystem. Ah, dito tumutubo itong ganitong halaman, so we might as well maintain it as it is, huwag natin i-convert or huwag natin siyang sirain para tutubo pa rin yung ganitong halaman, mga ganon. Okay, so parang yung isang kakilala ko, may um, may iniiwan ako mga halaman sa likod, mga weedy plants, mga mabilis kumalat, but actually these are vegetables, okay, yung mga weedy vegetables natin. Tapos, etong isang kakilala ko, hindi niya alam itong halaman to to, so pinagbubunot niya lahat ng naglinis siya. Pinagbubunot niya lahat. So, nung naghanap na ako ng tatalbusin, wala na yung mga halaman na gusto ko sa likod. So, ang nangyari is, kinakain naman niya yung halaman na yon pero hindi niya alam kung anong itsura niya. In situ, anong itsura ng halaman mismo, kinakain lang niya yung talbos, hindi niya alam yung halaman. At hindi niya alam, nag tumutubo lang siya sa ganung type ng environment. So, yun. Dahil hindi niya alam yung itsura, plus hindi niya alam na sa ganung environment pala tumutubo yung halaman na yon So wala siyang pakialam kung ano yung mabunot doon na halaman. Pero once na alam niya na yun pala yung favorite niya na halaman, favorite niya na gulay, then bibigyan niya ng importansya yung, yung halaman na yun. Okay? So, yeah. So kung hindi kilala yung halaman, binubunot lang siya. Like for example, the saluyot daw. Yeah, it's a weedy, uh, weedy type din kasi yung saluyot eh, kung saan-saan lang siya kumakalat din. Kapag uh, once may isang halaman siya ng saluyot, dumadami din yun kapag uh, nag, uh, nag, na, ano to, nag disperse na yung mga seeds niya. Ang dami din nun. Yes. Okay, so what we can do then is um, we may um appreciate by for, uh, flourishing biodiversity by first recognizing their value recognize and value their uh, this biodiversity and all its levels so for example um bibili ka ng beans so kung monggo lang yung nandun sa palengke pero hindi naman yung gusto mong hindi naman yun yung lasa na gusto mo gusto mo yung lasa ng black beans or gusto mo yung lasa ng white beans so if you know If you know that there are this um, kind of variations ng beans, alam mo kung ano yung binibili mo. Alam mo ngayon kung ano dapat yung ipinatanim or ano dapat yung pinaparami. Pero kung wala kang alam sa klase ng mga beans, definitely kung anong nandyan, yun na lang din yun. So parang the rest na, na hindi available sa market, hindi na siya nabibigyan ng significance, hindi na siya napoproteksyonan. Okay, so determine plant characters that are significant in taxonomic identification. Because if, if you are going to recognize the value of each species that's present within an area, dapat alam mo din kung paano sila i-identify. Dapat alam mo how to determine kung ano yung mga characters that will separate it from the other species. Like for example, um, Amaranthus. Kalunay ba yun? O kalunay. Yung amaranthus um, or yung kalunay na inuulam natin, it's also a weedy, it's also an underutilized plant. Katulad ng mga saluyot na underutilized. Okay, so yung kalunay, we have the spiny type at saka yung walang spine. Though both are edible, both are edible, yung minsan may nag-serve sa amin. Yung kalunay na sinerve niya is the amaranthus spinosus. Tinitingnan ko yung tinitingnan ko yung ulam kung may sahog ba na fish kasi na, parang may tinik. <laughs> Kapag kakakain mo parang may tinik. Yun pala yung spinosus ang niluto. 
at hindi tinanggal yung mga tinik pa. Di naman luto yun, edible naman siya. But you have to remove the spines. So, kesyo siguro alam na kaluna yun. So, kinuha na lang. So, hindi nila alam ngayon yung distinction ng dalawang species. One amaranthus doesn't have, one kalunay doesn't have the spines. The other one has the spines. Amaranthus viridis and amaranthus spinosus. So, yan. So you should have the uh, you should have a knowledge of how or what characters are um, to to identify or ano anong characters yung kailangan nating spot to identify these organisms to separate them from one species to another okay and let us make it a practice na kapag ka um, may pinupuntahan tayo or may kinakain tayo why not try to identify para alam mo kung ano, malay mo, ma-develop mo rin yung culinary skills mo ba tawag doon. <laughs> Kapag ka, nalaman mo lahat ng ingredients na mga gulay-gulay doon sa pagkain mo, at least alam mo yung hinahanap mo ngayon sa palengke, alam mo yung hinahanap mo sa environment. O ito lang pala yung, ito lang pala yung sinerve sa akin sa restaurant, nandito lang pala sa bakod. At least alam mo yun yun. Okay. So, develop that culture of plant identification and conservation. Kasi, um, i, i, sabi ko nga, if, if, if um, the students are exposed to this, then wala tayong problema sa sustainability ng biodiversity natin in the next generations. Kung as early as now, ma-appreciate na nila yung value ng floristic biodiversity. Okay po. Okay, so for the lecture part, mag-end na po tayo dito ngayon kasi I, I think meron pa tayong continuation mamaya. So kung meron po kayong katanungan for this, um, binabalik po na sa'yo, Ma'am Kim. Thank you so much, Ma'am. Napaha-rich po ng discussion natin with that, within that ilang minutes, ang dami ho nating na-cover. Uh, before we proceed to the question, siguro magandang i-review natin yung ilan sa salient points na nabanggit ni Ma'am Mizel. Of course, we had there yung overview ng biodiversity, ano yung uh, role ng biodiversity. I think yung isa sa pinaka-striking and dapat alalahanin natin lahat na yung biodiversity, it's actually related din sa may naka-unmute ko yata, uh, pag-increase ng tendency or factors that can contribute to the pandemic. So, akalain mo yun, uh, social concerns can actually be linked to biodiversity loss. Ayan. And then, of course, uh, pinakilala din sa atin ni Ma'am Lizelle yung ilan sa mga plant species which she has actually encountered sa field. So, yung mga introduce natin sa students kayo, hindi na lang yung mga temporary species na makikita natin sa textbook. So, we had, uh, we, ha we were able to familiarize, familiarize ourselves with some bryophyte, pteridophyte, and spermatophyte species. Ayun, and then, I think yung isa sa pinaka-main point na this discussion, since we are talking about rekindling appreciation in students, yung paulit-ulit na in-emphasize ni Ma'am Lizelle kanina, yung importance ng pag-alam kung ano yung mga plants na nasa paligid natin. So, doon papasok yung taxonomy. And then, yung importance ng bawat plant, uh, ma mahalaga rin na alamin natin, which I think is also a theme that was somehow covered in sa earlier lecture natin. And knowing these things are actually important for us to, kumbaga, magkaroon ng mas direction yung ating species conservation. Ayan, so, we're seeing reactions from the chat box po. Mukhang very... Uh, engaging po and na-appreciate po ng ating participants yung ating na-cover for this particular lecture. But if you have questions, uh, prepare lang po natin siya mamaya. I think we'll be having a break before uh, before tayo mag Q&A. But before that, uh, I think meron pong nag-raise hand kanina si Ma'am Christina. Is she here po? Kung may questions po kayo or concerns. Hello po. 
Diyan ko ba si Ma'am Christina? Medyo, ma, uh, medyo echoey po yata yung audio natin. Ayan. Okay po. Sige po. So, uh, ayan. So, we'll be having a 15-minute break muna. So, siguro we'll return by 3.05 to entertain all your questions. So, um, see our break muna tayo, stretch, and then should you have any question, you, you may use the Q&A portion of this Zoom meeting or maybe raise your hand later if you want to. Uh, voice out your question to Magizel. And so thank you, Paul. I will see you at around 3.05.
Okay, it's already 3.05 and we're now back from our break. Nandito na po ba lahat? And I hope ready na po kayo sa another fruitful discussion with Ma'am Nizel. So we'll be officially opening now our open forum. So ang buwan naman po nating question ay from Francis Mo Suspina. Ma'am Nizel, nandiyan lang pa kayo? Um, yes, Kim. Ayan. Ayan, hello po ma'am. Ayan, so first question po ma'am is actually related dun sa utilization na sinasabi natin. So, uh, tanong po ay, what can you say po about the medicinal value of katakataka, especially for dengue patients? Hmm. Um, katakataka, for kalanchowe, uh, usually what we have here is kalanchowe pinata, right? So yung katakataka niya tawag natin, Kalansho Epinata, na-document siya from, in one of our student thesis, na-document siya as one of the medic medicinal plants being used in Banao, Banao Baoko, Mountain Province. So I guess um, Kalansho Epinata, kung hindi ako nagkakamali, is also called a miracle plant. <laughs> as it is uh, found to cure or to treat different illnesses, including cancer-related illnesses, um, kidney-related illnesses, um, surface lesions, skin lesions. Mga skin lesions, mga ganon. So I think... Ah, wait lang. Wait lang, Kim, ha? <laughs> so, ako lang po, ma'am. Ayan. <laughs> It's not applying. Hindi siya nag-apply. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna lang later. Anyway, um, Kalansho Pinata is also um being used for yun nga, mga skin lesions, may baron kasi siyang antibacterial property at the same time antifungal property. So it's not a common medicinal plant in the areas I've visited, I've visited here in northern Luzon, pero na-document siya as one doon sa mountain province. So I think, um, I don't know po sa ibang regions kung ginagamit din siya. Pero yun, um, based on scientific studies, meron siya mga pharmacological tests na good siya for different uh, medicinal purposes. Thank you, Ma'am Nizel. Ayan, so sabi nga ng Ma'am Nizel, there are researchers na we can, we can check those later. Ayan, so importante naman ay science-based ang ating yes. uh, ayun, claims sa mga ganito. Uh, another question, Ma'am Lizelle, now, uh, ngayon po, it's more on the education side of things. Can you give any tips daw po on how, uh, tips sa lessons in biodiversity, kung paano po siya i-introduce sa students? This is from Ma Maria Feliciana Eloreta. I think uh, she's from PSH PSHS BRC po. Mm -mm. Um, for senior high school, I think um, mas magandang may, may actual specimens to be brought for the laboratory and then you will examine the different um, characters observed in each. Kasi nakakatulong yun. Kasi for example, um, based on experience sa class eh. Diba parang, if you, if you bring with you specimens in class na may iba't ibang taxonomic characters like presence, absence of tendrils, um, different types of, uh, different shapes of leaves, different um, apices, bases ng leaves, mga ganon. And then if you let them observe kung ano yung differences ng mga margin, I think that is one way for them to appreciate yung, var uh, yung, yung variability ng mga um, plants. And that will, um, th those variability will result to biodiversity. And Mas maganda rin po siguro, base this experience, nadalhin yung mga sujante sa field. 
So kahit backyard lang ng school, <laughs> kahit sa likod lang ng school kung saan may mga iba't ibang halaman that's not managed by by the gardeners. So yung natural environment nila para makikita nila yung association mismo ng mga halaman. Kasi if it's managed by the gardeners, usually ano yan, mga exotic species na may designated areas, hindi, na, hindi nila pinagtatabi itong halaman na to, yung mga ganun. So if it's um, if, if this vegetation is observed in situ, mas ma-appreciate nila na ah, ito palang vine na to goes well with this kind of plant. Tapos etong plant na to, dito pala dapat siya nakat, nakatanim sa ganitong type ng lupa, mga ganun. So mas ma-observe nila yung yung mga um sim, ano to, mga association ng mga halaman at the same time yung ecological um structure na requirement ng mga plant communities na yon. So yun po yung lumalabas sa mga ano ha, sa mga um sa mga evaluation ng mga sujante that nas mas na appreciate nila yung biodiversity concept once na nandun sila sa field pag na experience nila kaysa yung um, definition of terms lang ang binibigyan natin sa classroom and then pictures nga sabi nga ni Ma'am Kim kanina mostly temperate pa yung mga pictures na ginagamit natin as example hindi talaga nila ma-appreciate kasi paglabas nila ng classroom hindi naman nila nakikita yung ganung halaman So, mas makaka-relate sila if um, yung nasa bakuran nila yung nakikita nilang halaman at the same time, na-experience nila mismo yung um, ecosystem kung saan nandun yung halaman na yun. Ayan, I hope nasagot po yung question ninyo, Ma'am Eloretta. And so, emphasize po natin ulit yung experiential learning sa mga students. Very important po yun. I think isa, isa to sa common theme from this morning session. And gaya nga nang sabi ni Ma'am, pwede naman siyang gawin na backyard science. Lalo naman kung high school, just to parang ignite their interest pagdating sa plant taxonomy. Siguro ma'am, follow up lang po dun sa question kanina. Uh, in relation po dun sa experiential learning for students when it comes to plant taxonomy, are there any specific skills po na sa tingin nyo ay critical when they study etong field nga po na to, yung plant taxonomy? Hmm. Um, isa sa mga importanteng kailangan uh, sa mga importante in-note kapag nagpa-plant taxonomy is yung mga taxonomic characters, mga spot characters ng mga halaman. So, the student should have an eye, a good eye, dun sa mga taxonomic characters na yon So, yun yung, <clears throat> yun yung next na activity natin, kung ano, paano i-spot yung mga characters na yun um, sa mga halaman. So, Later, papakita natin kung ano yung il, sa ilan ilan sa mga characters na pwede nating um, pagtuunan ng pansin when we go sa mga field or when we, when we have the specimens with us. Kailangan matuto silang i-differentiate yung pagkakaiba ng mga structures, especially mga shapes, presence or, presence or absence ng mga structures, mga ganun. Kasi... Kung hindi nila na-appreciate yung ganong level na titingnan lang, ah, halaman, ah, okay lang, dahon yan, <laughs> ganun lang, hindi talaga nila uh, magagawa ng maayos yung taxonomic identification ng halaman. So, they should have the, um, anto, the skill to look for differences in structure, not the similarity. Kasi kuminsan, mas madalas na natin similarity ng mga halaman. Kasi kapag similarity, ginugrupo lang natin sila, kinaklassify lang natin sila sa mas malaking classification group, sa mas malaking rank sa classification system. So halimbawa, family, uh, sa, sa, sa level ng family, makikita mo mag, maraming pagkaka, pagkakahalintulad yung mga species na yon Pero para ma-appreciate mo yung diversity ng family na yon you should look for the differences between these organisms. So, paano ba na iba from the other? That's also one of the, um, parang yun din yung mga pinaglalaroan namin pag nasa field kami. Uy, iba to ah. Hindi, uh, ito ba si species A? No, hindi, tingnan mo. Iba yung dahon niya, iba yung, yung tip niya. 
although nag-curl lang yung tip lang na ganun, hindi, iba yan. <laughs> Kasi we are looking at, parang na, nakastick yung mind mo na look for differences, look for naiba. Parang ganun. So, kaya kung minsan nakakakita kami ng iba't ibang species sa field, kasi yun yung unang tinitingnan namin, alin yung naiba? Ano yung pagkakaiba nila? Hindi yung, ma, magkamukha yan. Oh, form lang, kamukha lang yan nung nakuha, nung, nung, nung previous na, na area natin. Oh, kamukha lang din yan nung unang na-collect natin. So, tendencies, hindi mo na siya ko-collect, hindi mo na siya inonote, hindi mo na siya observe Kasi ang nasa mind mo is, yung kamukha lang niya. Pero actually, when you look at it, at ang hinanap mo ay yung difference nila, yung variation nila. So, possible na ibang species yon Possible na magkaiba sila from your first collection. And tama po ba, ma'am? This is a skill that can be developed through exposure. And yes, hands-on. definitely. Kasi parang ako din naman, kap nung nasa classroom lang, medyo hindi talaga ganun ka-enhanced yung skills ng pag-identify. Kasi nga, limited ka sa nakikita mo sa book, limited ka sa mga pictures na pinapakita sa classroom, limited ka sa kung ano yung available na specimen na nadadala sa classroom. But once you're exposed sa field, ayun nga, makapunta ka pa lang sa kahit sa paanan lang ng bundok, hindi ka pa umaakyat, makikita mo na kaagad yung variation ng mga nandun na halaman. Ayan, thank you, Ma'am Liz. So far, mukhang wala na pong mabon na question. So that being said, since nabanggit na nga po ni Ma'am Lizel that will be having a workshop related doon, uh, I'll be giving back the floor to you, Ma'am Lizel, para po sa uh, workshop proper po natin. Okay. Sige, Kim. Share ko lang yung slide, ha? Sorry, nawawala ko. <laughs> uh, na-share na ba, Kim? Yes po, ma'am. Currently, ang nakikita po namin ay yung desktop po. Ah, oh, okay. Wait lang. Hmm, 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 hmm. Nasaan yung PowerPoint ko? And so, habang hinihintay po natin si Ma'am Liz, siguro magandang time din po to to emphasize ulit yung sinasabi natin kanina na aside from experiential learning on the side of students, it's important with that as educators, you also gain the skills sa mga ganitong bagay. So, dito papasok ngayon importance ng workshop that we will be doing this afternoon. Ayan. Ma'am Liz, okay na ho? Yes. Um, ayun. So, good afternoon po ulit. Ako yung nagbabalik. <laughs> so, for this Um, afternoon, continuation ng ating naunang lecture, um, let us try to classify and identify some plants that are within our reach sa ating mga bahay-bahay. Meron po ba kayong halaman dyan na katabi or can you grab some plant samples sa inyong garden? Pwede pong nakapaso, ganun. <laughs> and... Um, Let us try to differentiate itong mga halaman na to, and then we classify them, group them according to first their similarity and then separate them or segregate them according to their differences. So in order to do that, you need to um, have a good grasp of the taxonomic characters na kailangan makita ano ba yung kailangan hanapin ng mga taxonomic characters for us to classify these plants as either belonging to the same um, family or belong to the same genus or to segregate them as different species or different families. And after which, we will try to make a dichotomous key. So I believe um, one of the activities sa senior high is to make this 
um, Plant by Koto Muski. Tapos, after um, coming up with the dichotomous key, then let's try to identify yung scientific name or yung pangalan mismo nung halaman. Okay lang po ba sa inyo yun? Meron po ba kayong madadalang halaman sa table ninyo? Okay. So, while um, looking for some plants, um, this is how a dichotomous key looks like. So, what we need for a dichotomous key is we should have a couplet. So, we call this a couplet, itong dalawang ito. Um, and each... Sorry po, uh, hindi po ata siya naka-share screen ulit. I do. Wait lang. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you po. Um, sige, check ulit. Ah, okay. There. Okay na ba, Ma'am Kim? Yes po, Ma'am. Okay na. Thank you po. Okay. So, katulad nga po nang sinasabi ko kanina, we will try to classify plants and identify them by using... Um, at dichotomous key. So, if you have some plants with you, kindly um, take at least 10. <laughs> May 10 ba kayong makukuha dyan sa paligid nyo ngayon? <laughs> but anyway, uh, at least three different plants. Um, kahit hindi nyo pupitasin yung mga dahon, ganun, kahit nakapaso, okay lang. Or if, if you have some twigs na pwedeng i-cut from your backwood, from your backyard. Let us try to observe some of the characters na magagamit natin for classification. So we call this mga taxonomic characters. And we want, um, isa sa mga skills na gusto natin i-practice dito is yung spot identification. Spot character identification. So ma-identify natin, ma-recognize natin yung halaman by looking at the taxonomic characters na nag-identify um, na nag sa kanya. So yung distinguishing character niya. Ano ba yung mga distinguishing characters na yun? So, uh, to make it a, um, a member of the family Begonia, si, ano ba yung dapat makita natin? To make it a member of the friend, a friend group, ano ba dapat yung nandun? So kapag ka meron siyang um, meron siyang mga sporangia. Pag meron siyang mga sporang clusters of sporangia, do we have uh, do we group them as flowering plants or as ferns? Okay, so nabanggit ko na kanina na um, ferns do not burn flowers but rather meron silang mga spore producing structures. So kung hindi siya nag nag nagpo-produce ng flower but it has this sporangia, clusters of sporangia, then we segregate them from the flowering plants or from the angiosperms. Tapos, among the angiosperms, what other characters should we uh, look for para naman mapaghiwahiwalay pa natin ulit, mahimay natin ulit pa yung mga nasa flowering plants. In that way, makakagawa tayo ng isang dichotomous key and eventually we would be able to identify the plants. So katulad nga nang na-mention ko kanina, sa so pagkakalam ko, um, isa sa mga requirement sa senior high student requirements is to make their dichotomous key. Kasi parang ganun ginawa ng anak ko. <laughs> Hindi ko alam. Isa sa mga requirement niya nun, nag-ano siya ng mga dahon-dahon, then make um, a dichotomous key. Gamit yung mga dahon na yun, something like that. And what is a dichotomous key? So this one is an example of, we have, two types actually of a dichotomous key. We have the bracketed key and we have this um, non-bracketed key. So here we have, ano ba kailangan natin, alam, ano ba kailangan natin ilagay sa isang dichotomous key? We should have a couplet. Itong pair of uh, statement na nandito is what we call a couplet. Then we have the second couplet here. 
and the third couplet here. So each statement in a couplet is called a lead. So meron kang, ito yung first lead mo, ito yung second lead mo. The first statement may lead to this group of plants or may lead you to proceed with another couplet. So pupunta ka dito. So um, in, in drafting or in writing your dichotomous scheme, make sure that you start with the same, um, dapat parallel yung mga statements mo in a couplet. So if, uh, if it's a statement one is, uh, is about the flower, absence or presence of flower, then that should also be the context of the second statement. And uh, um, here, uh, this is regarding the presence or absence of seed. And preferably, kapag gumagawa din kayo ng um, couplet, the first uh, words being used in the, um, the couplet should be the same. So, ovary superior, ovary inferior. Um, flower, uh, flower um, free or flower fused. So, mga ganong um, mga ganong statement dapat yung mga papares. So, that, pareho yung first word mo and at the same time, contrasting yung dalawang leads doon sa isang couplet. So, the first statement at second statement should be contrasting. Now, if you're going to do, uh, if you're going to follow a dichotomous key, so for example, I have this specimen, titignan ko siya, so may flower ba siya o wala siyang flower? If it has a flower, then it is an angiosperm. But if it does not have a flower, then what could it be? It can be a fern, it can be a gymnosperm, it can be a bryophyte, kung walang flower. So, I will go to number two. Okay, so number two, is it seed, uh, wala ba siyang seed or meron siyang seed? So kung wala siyang seed, then I'll go to number three. So is the plant body differentiated into root, stem, and leaves? Or is the plant body not differentiated into root, stem, and leaves? So wala siyang seeds. Pero meron ba siyang totoong root? Meron ba siyang totoong leaves? Na-mention ko kanina na yung mga bryophytes do not have true leaves but instead meron silang mga phyllid, mga ganun. So, kung hindi true roots ang meron sila, then those are the mosses. Kapag wala silang flower, wala silang seeds, and they have root, stem, and leaf structures, then these are ferns. What if they do not have flowers but are seed bearing, then these are the gymnosperms. Now, following this dichotomous key should be a description of an angiosperm, a gymnosperm, a fern, or a moss. Pwede, continue natin sa ganong, um, na, na, pwede natin i-continue ng ganon. So, for example, nakalagay dyan is a fern, then we have here a description of a fern and probably uh, the, um, some species of fern representatives. Okay. Um, so, what are the sources of um, evidences that you can use in classifying those plants? So, in here, pwede mo gamitin as source of evidence mo yung shape ng leaf. Okay, so shape ng leaf, um, type ng margin, Type ng apex, type ng base, venation pattern, parallel ba katulad nito, or palmately netted ba katulad nito, or pinate ba katulad nito, or uh, simple pinate, or meron kang double, uh, anto, double pinate. Okay, so meron ka bang, uh, meron ba siyang undulation sa margin? Parted ba yung margin niya or um, deeply lobed lang siya? So kapag parted yung margin, nagpo-form ba siya ng leaflets or hindi? Does it form a compound leaf or just a simple leaf like this one? Okay, so ito. Um, this one is a common morpho leaf morphology ng mga ferns. Okay. So in this example here, 
Ito, kinat ko lang ito sa mga leaflets ng Amorphophallus with this as reference sa kanilang measurement. So, one block here is one centimeter. Mm -hmm. Para makita ko yung differ difference nila in terms of size. So, sa size sa width, tsaka sa length niya, and at the same time, yung kanilang apex. So, from here, ito, yung apex nito, this one is acute. Pero meron itong extension. So, accumulate. At if, 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 if I'm going to compare this two, they're both accumulate, yes. But this one is um, mas, mat, malak, mas mahaba yung accumulate tip niya. And in terms of leaf shape, this one is more um, lanceolate. Linear, um, yeah, lanceolate, elliptic lanceolate. To. This one is, um, this one is elliptic. This one is lanceolate. Tapos we have here. You have here. Uh, sorry. Tripinnate leaves for compound leaves. You have um pinately compound leaves. Now, there are possibilities na itong leaflet na to ay ma-dissect ma pa siya into smaller leaflets. So, that is bipinate leaf. So, there are those different terminologies we can use in differentiating leaf structures. So, also yung mga dahon niya, yung venation niya. So, you have uh, kapag parallel na ganito, actually dalawang klase yan. But then parallel siya from midrib to margin or parallel siya from base to tip. Okay. And pansin nyo rin itong likod ng amorphophallus leaflet na to. So yung kanyang venation, nagmamerge siya. Nagmamerge. And then um, nagjoin din siya after merging. Forming now a uh, marginal vein. So, meron siyang parang vein malapit sa margin. So, may marginal vein. Other leaves do not have marginal veins. Plus, another one to note here is between, so this is the midrib or primary vein. This is the secondary or lateral vein. Sila yung nagmerge dito. And then, meron kang isang vein dito na hindi umaabot doon sa merging nitong dalawang lateral veins. So we call this the intersecondaries or um, interlateral veins. Mga intersecondaries or interlateral veins. And then if you look closer sa mga veins niya, may makikita rin kayong variation sa pag-form uh, niya ng mga tertiary and quaternary veins. So pwedeng nagiging box type or pwedeng open type yung mga veins na mag-form nila. So just from the leaf alone, ang dami na natin pwedeng makitang characters. Actually, um, some taxonomic papers focus on leaf architecture alone. Sa leaf architecture pa lang, nakakapag-classify na sila, nakakapag-identify na sila ng mga plants. Kasi um, it's, um, it's proven in studies that different venations or the leaf architecture suggests or can be used to separate one species from the other by looking at how the veins are arranged or the leaf area of um, the species na, of the samples. Pwedeng magkakaiba yun na pwedeng sources sila ng variation or sources sila ng um, characters that separates one organism or one species from the other. Okay. Um, Ma'am Nelma, are you raising your hand po? Ma'am Nelma? Anyway. Sige ma'am, kung meron po kayong tanong later, paki uh, sabi na lang po sa host later. 
here I'm going to show you some um, characters to note kapag ka tinitingnan natin yung mga specimen natin. I'm showing here Acanthaceae as example. So the family Acanthaceae is usually characterized by having anisophilus leaf. So when we say anisophilus leaf, hindi pantay yung um, dahon niya. So family Acanthaceae is characterized by having opposite phyllotaxy, opposite leaves siya. But in that pair of leaves, one is smaller, the other one's larger. Kuminsan naman, by being too small, nawawala ito. Nag, na, na, na huhulog itong mas maliit na dahon to kung sobrang small siya, nahuhulog siya, that it may, it, it may, it, it may look like um, alternate yung dahon. Magiging parang alternate lang siya kasi instead na opposite siya, instead na dalawa, so sobrang liit nitong partner niya, nahulog. So kapag matured yung tinitingnan mong twig or branch, nagmumukha siyang parang alternate. So dapat, um, pagka ina-observe mo yung halaman, tingnan mo rin kung totoo ang al uh, alternate yung dahon niya o baka naman may leaf scar dito, suggesting na opposite yung dahon. Okay? Now, other than it's a phyllotaxy and having anisophilus leaf, um, Acanthaceae also have this interpetular ridge. Okay, so parang merong um, hardened tissue na parang scar na lang din siya connecting these two petioles. Pero it's not actually a scar. So para siyang hardened tissue lang siyang connecting these two opposite leaves. So interpetular ridge ang tawag natin sa kanya. Okay, so if we are going to combine these three characters, opposite ang dahon niya, anisophilus yung mga dahon, and meron siyang interpetular ridge, then alam na natin na kabilang siya sa family Acanthaceae. Kasi no other families have that set of distinguishing characters. Okay, now what if opposite ang dahon, Sorry, that's interpetular reach there. But if opposite nga yung dahon, ha, hindi matapos. Okay, so um, we have also here the swollen node as additional character for acanthaceae. So medyo, medyo nag-bulge siya dito. Okay, so kapag nakakita tayo ng opposite ang dahon, hindi agad-agad acanthaceae yun. Kasi there are other families with opposite leaves. So sabi ko nga kanina, tingnan natin yung dahon, anisophilus ba o hindi? Kasi kung hindi anisophilus, then hindi yan acanthaceae. And, and one thing more is, for example, this one, rubiaceae, opposite ang dahon, tapos tiningnan mo kung meron siyang interpetular ridge. Ito, hindi siya interpetular ridge. But instead, meron siyang stipule. Now that stipule, connects one petiole to the other petiole in this pair of opposite leaves. So kapag ka merong interconnecting petiole na ganyan, meron siyang interpetular uh, inter stipule, so may opposite leaves ka, and then that is Ruby CE. Okay? So again, anong pagkakaiba ng dalawang family, Akantay CE, dapat nandun yung tatlong characters, idagdag mo na yung swollen node. Pero for Rubiaceae, instead of having an isophilus leaf, walang pagkakaiba yung dahon niya, yung pair of dahon. Plus, instead of an interpetular ridge, meron siyang interpetular stipule katulad nito. Now, that stipule may, var may, may, have, um, may, may vary between species ulit. So, pwede solid siyang parang solid structure siyang ganyan, or pwede rin siyang parang hairy structure lang na nakakonek from here, Hanggang dito. Parang hairy structure lang siyang ganun. Okay. So, meron siyang entire um, leaf margin. So, walang, walang serration, walang lobing yung leaf margin niya. And it's simple leaf. Okay. So, that's interpetular stipule. Another interesting family or interesting group of plants is yung may mga 
um, may mga tendrils. Yung mga may tendrils. One, we have Corbitasi. So if you look at Corbitasi E, meron siyang alternate na dahon. Isang dahon lang siya per node. So ito lang yung dahon niya. But other than the no, uh, other than the leaf, may ma-observe kang tendril dito. Yung pangkapit niya sa mga mga um, support structures niya, mga bakod, mga ibang stick, ibang branches. So yung pangkapit niya na yun, that's the tendril. Now, how do you identify kukurbitasi from the other tendril bearing plants? Yung orientation ng tendril niya is 90 degrees. 90 degrees in refer with reference to um, this leaf. Okay? So ito yung dahon niya, naka 90 degrees yung tendril niya. Kapag ka itong dahon na to, naka-insert siya dito sa axil nung, da, nung, nung, nung halaman. So for example, ito yung stem niya, tapos meron siyang leaf dito. Tapos yung tendril is nandito siya sa axil at wala siya sa side. Okay? Then that is Passiflorasii. Family ng mga passion fruit. Okay? So meron siyang tendril dito sa loob. Okay? Now, kapag ka naman ang tendril niya is 180 degrees with, um, with, res, uh, ito to with reference to this leaf. So, limaw, ito yung stem mo, tapos nandito yung dahon, tapos yung tendril niya is directly opposite, or that's 180 degrees, directly opposite siyang gano'n, then that is Vitasii naman, mga grape families. So, pansin nyo yung tendril ng grape, um, opposite siya nung dahon. Okay, 180 degrees siya. Whereas, kapag ka kukurbita si E, kung ito yung dahon, 90 degrees yung tendril niya. Dito yung dahon, 90 degrees. Kapag ka pasiflora si E, pag nandito yung dahon, nandito yung tendril niya sa axi niya. Sa, sa, sa angle between nung leaf at saka yung stem. So, those are the differences between this... Um, three ten, tendril bearing families. Now in addition to that, Cucurbitaceae also have this palmate venation. Okay? Now, another tendril bearing family, but it's not the tendrils are actually not attached to the stem is Ismilacaceae. Now, where is that tendril? Nandito siya. It's a modification of the petiole. So instead na nasa naka-attach sa stem na, it's actually a modification of the petiole. So ito siya, may tendril siya dito. Ito um nahulog na or yeah, natanggal na yung tendril niya, nahulog na and nag-form na lang siya ng parang spine dito. Okay? So that is Smilacaceae. So it's the tendril is not attached directly to the stem. Now there are other characters, interesting characters na pwede ninyong observe. Okay? So after ninyong i-observe mga yun and you find it interesting, then you can collect a sample for your class. So for example, um, nasa likod bahay lang ninyo, nasa bakod lang ninyo, and you found a vitasii or cucurbitasii, or you found a... Um, Convolvulaceae, yung mga Ipomea family. At gusto niyo yung i-share yung character na na-observe niyo with your students para din ma-appreciate nila. Then you can press some samples. So in pressing samples, all you have to do is to get your sample with you. Parang ito, may cutting ka ng sample halimbawa. And then ilagay mo lang siya sa newspaper. Iipit mo lang siya sa newspaper and then um, ayusin mo lang yung pagkaka-layout niya sa newspaper para kapag uh, nag-dry na siya, para nag-dry na siya, nakaayos yung mga parts niya. So, make sure na kapag ka nag-layout ka or nag-press ka sa newspaper, yung isa sa mga dahon, one or two of the leaves, naka um, baliktad siya. So, naka-upside down yung one or two of the leaves. Why? Kasi, um, maaaring 
yung mga characters na nakikita mo sa surface is different from the characters na nakikita mo sa sa kabilang side ng dahon. Or, yung mga hindi mo na-observe sa surface ng dahon, na-observe mo siya sa kabilang side ng dahon. Like, for example, venation. There are those leaves na prominent ang venation underneath, pero halos hindi mo makita sa surface. So, you have to turn the leaves upside down kapag pinapress mo siya. Another thing is, maaring sa surface, may makapalang cuticle niya, kasi nga yun yung naka-expose sa sun, pero sa under surface naman niya, sa kabilang side niya, may mga um, hairy-like structures, mga trichomes or mga indumentum na nandun, tomentos, uh, indumentum, mga ganun. So, pwedeng may mga trichomes na nandun sa ilalim. So, maiging nakabaliktad yung ibang dahon. And then, if you are dealing with flowers, make sure na nakaspread siya para makita yung arrangement ng mga flowers dun sa inflorescence na yun. Okay? So, after After that, para hindi masira, okay, um, kapag ka din nag-press, kung hindi kakasya yung sample mo sa isang newspaper, you can also bend your samples. So, gusto kong kunin mula ugat hanggang doon sa pinaka-tip niya. If it's a small plant, you can do that. So, halimbawa ito, Um, nung prines ko siya, pinold fold ko lang siya. So you can, kapag sa sobrang haba niya, pwede kang paikot-ikot mo siyang i-lay out dun sa newspaper bago mo siya i-dry. Or pwede mo siyang gawing letter V, letter N, letter M. Ma-capture lang lahat yung structures na meron siya para mas madaling i-characterize. Okay? And for succulent leaves naman or structures, pwede mo siyang hatiin sa gitna para mas madali siyang madry. And then after drying, for future use at hindi lang pang single use sa klase kasi baka masira-sira siya pagka nakanus paper lang, pwede nyo siyang i-mount sa isang herbarium sheet. Or, if you do not have herbarium sheet, pwede nyo siyang i-mount siguro sa isang, um, ako kung minsan ginagamit ko, slow paper, o kaya yung drawing, ano to, sketch pad, minsan may mga gusto lang akong i-press na malilit na specimen, I'm using those, so pwede nyo siyang i-mount na ganito, para nakaspread na siya, pwede nyo itago, and then, pwede nyo ipakita later on sa mga susunod na klase ninyo, para hindi lang siya for single use, sayang naman yung, na i-prepare ninyo na specimen. So, for example, sa klase ko, uh, kapag ka nag-field kami at may nakita kong interesting character ng isang moss, halimbawa, then I collect a small piece of that moss tapos pinapress ko na siya para pag nagla-laboratory kami and I would like to show the diversity of mosses and I have several samples to show in my class. Parang ganun. And also with this um, angiosperms, So I'm using all uh, I'm using the specimens from research, mga collected specimens from research kasi hindi ka rin basta-basta pwedeng mag-collect from field without permit with a gratuitous permit from DNR. So what I'm using is yung mga specimens na naka-voucher from research projects from projects. So yun yung ginagamit namin pang supplement doon sa mang um doon sa klase sa requirement for class, especially during discussions ng biodiversity, para makita namin yung wide range of morphological variations from uh, of different um, specimens. Okay. So, meron po bang nakakuha ng halaman dyan? Meron po ba kayong may papakita na halaman that we can classify? Wala po. Um, anyway, sige. Homework nyo na lang po yun. So, kung wala po kayong makuha ngayon na halaman, at least after this discussion, 
please try um, observing the different morphology po ng halaman na meron kayo sa backyard. So kahit ano lang pong makita ninyo, kahit weedy plant yan, kahit hindi yan interesting, kahit umaakyat lang siya sa bakod or kahit gumagapang lang siya sa, sa ground, still meron, meron kayong makikitang variations ng dahon, variations ng kanilang um, stem structure, meron at meron kayong makikita mga taxonomic characters. And uh, who knows, maaari yung gamitin yun later on pagka nagbibigay kayo ng mga examples sa klase. Okay. You have questions po? Ma'am Kim, um, <laughs> Ma'am Ethel, sige po, pwede nyo i-share. <laughs> pwede nyo i-share yung mga plants nyo dyan para, na, para makita natin yung variation. Ayan. Sige po, ma'am. Wait lang po. Si Ethel po yata yung maraming katadalaman nyo. <laughs> Abang hinihintay po siguro natin si Ethel. Pwede kong uh, mag-remind lang po ako sa participants. Ayan, for our participants, reminder lang po, we, uh, we have an evaluation form that you can fill out. Yung link po ay nasa chat box, both sa Zoom and YouTube streaming. So, yung accomplished form ko na to will be the basis for your recording, basis in recording your attendance and consequently will be used in determining whether certificates will be awarded. So, we have to meet at least two out of, or we have to be in, uh, out of three days, we have to be in at least two webinar sessions or days dun sa sinisam po natin for you to be eligible for the certificate. Ayun po. From Ethel, okay ka na po. Hello. Hello po ulit. Ayan. Ito po siya, ma'am. So, malaki-laki siya. Hindi ko, hanggang ngayon po, hindi pa rin namin sure kung ako, personally, kung ano yung classification niya. So, ganito po yung leaves niya. Sana po nakikita ng lahat. Okay. Ganyan po yung margin niya. Ayan po siya. Tapos, underside po niya ay medyo violet. Ayan, dark pala, dark, dark violet po yan. Tapos, eto po, ganyan siya. Ayan, yun lang po. Okay, anyone please from the audience, thank you mo, Ma'am Ethel. Anyone please from the audience, kung sino pong familiar sa bulaklak nito, anong itsura ng bulaklak niya? Anyone po from the participants? Malamang nakita nyo na po yung bulaklak niyan. Okay? So, yung bulaklak po niyan, it has a space with, uh, meron siyang space, tapos meron siyang spadix. Right? So, kapag ka meron ganong inflorescence, type of inflorescence, definitely that is family arasi. Pamilya ng mga gabi. Okay? So, kapag ka meron kayong space, tapos meron siyang spadix, then that is family arasii. Okay? Family ng mga gabi. Now, in this particular plant, okay, take a look at the shape of the leaf. That is a common, um, common characteristic of the genus Alocasia. Okay? So, pag titignan yung... Uh, pag, Pag titignan yung base niya, medyo partly parted yung base niya, that's alokasya. Pagka medyo hindi siya parted na ganun, kolokasya, yung gabi talaga, yun. Okay? So, yun. Isa yun sa mga characters na tinignan natin. Plus, if you're not yet, uh, isa sa mga characteristics kasi ng arasi is other than the inflorescence, meron siyang shiny, shiny na upper surface. Shiny na upper surface ng dahon. And that's because of the thick cuticle they have as protective coat. Kasi exposed din sila sa, uh, sa sunlight. Gusto nila na-exposed din sa sunlight kasi. And then, in addition to that, 
meron silang core. Yung stem nila, hindi mo nakikita sa surface, but rather it's an underground modified stem. Meron siyang core. Imagine niyo yung sa gabi mismo na nilulutong pansinigang. So bawat guhit ng gabi na yon, that's actually a node kung saan naka-attach yung dahon. So the whole thing is a stem. Meron din siyang ganyan. So those are the characteristics of that family. Um, si Ma'am, uh, may mga ilan pong participants na hindi siya nakikita. Siguro po, uh, itry lang po muna nating i-stop share. Tapos para po makita nila in full view. Ayun po. Yes, Ma'am. There Thank you. you. Ayan. So ito po yung um, pinapakita namin kanina at dinedescribe din ni Ma'am Lizel. Ayan. So ganyan siya. Okay, ayun lang. Thank you, Ethel. Ah, may gusto pa pong magpahabol ng pa-identify sa mga plantita, plantito po natin. Ayan. Oh, okay na po sila. And so, doable, very doable po, no? Ah, uh, Kung wala na akong question doon, pwede ho bang mag... May na-miss po kasing question kanina, Ma'am Liz. Uh -huh. Pwede ho kayang balikan ho natin sa glit. It's a question from YouTube po. From Geraldine. Ma'am Liz, ano kaya possible research researchable areas with regards to plant biodiversity? Oh, okay. Recently, na-involve ako sa isang urban biodiversity assessment. So, kasi it's a move ng DNR na i-assess yung biological resources natin sa mga cities. Actually, not only cities, also mga protected areas. So, isa sa, kasi sa ngayon, we do not have a complete plant survey sa Pilipinas. So it's um it's a big project to do local uh, to do this plant surveys, but you may start with local surveys. For example, campus survey. For example, campus um flora cam uh, uh, um plant survey ng ng campus ninyo. So you may start with that. Another thing is um, since isa sa mga threats to biodiversity loss is yung um, pagdami ng mga invasive alien species, one research area is to identify this uh, invasive species, invasive alien species, and uh, um, look for yeah, look for measurements. Sorry. Look for um, the possibility of eradicating yung mga invasive alien species na to, or to minimize yung kanilang pagkalat, yung, yung reproduction nila, propagation nila. Kasi for, um, isa yun sa mga pwedeng i-research, identification ng mga invasive alien species within your surroundings or within your locality. And then, um, ano yung mga measures how to mitigate yung further expansion nila. Kasi um, yung expansion nila is actually invasion. They will invade um, invade the communities of native plants. And later on, i-displace nila yung mga native plants na yun. Ganun kasama yung mga invasive alien species. So, isa yun sa mga Pwedeng projects ng mga bata. Another one is, um, we may look at sa plant biodiversity, sabi ko kanina, na-enhance yung knowledge natin ng plant biodiversity by appreciating or understanding their utility value. So, it is also a research, uh, uh, parang maganda rin research topic yung alamin ano yung mga resources ng na plant resources ng community ano yung mga plant resources ng community we have few documentations of plant resources being used by local communities madalas 
ang tinitingnan lang natin yung mga IT communities. Madalas yun yung mga research natin na areas. Ano yung mga ethnobotanical uses ng ganito in this IT community, mga ganun. Kasi we know that they have rich knowledge on, on um, folkloric use of um, plants. Pero why not try to do local surveys na kahit hindi IT community? Malay mo, iba yung application ng mga halaman nung na nasa urban setting from the um, interior part ng mga forests or yung mga para sa mga communities with access sa mga forest products yung sa urban city dahil ito lang ay sa urban areas dahil ito lang yung mga plants nila then ano naman yung mga ginagawa nila sa mga to ano naman yung gamit ng mga to kasi yung mga communities na malapit sa mga forest of course they, they may have various um uses para sa mga halaman nila, various species being used kasi they have direct access sa mga resources na yun, forest products na yun. Pero what about the, the, the other community settings? Ano naman yung gamit ng mga halaman sa kanila? And what are these plants? Are these plants the native ones? Or are these plants all introduced? So in that case, if we are propagating the introduced species, are we contributing to local biodiversity or not? So, um, yung, yung floristic survey ng buong Pilipinas may not be a one-shot research, but malaking contribution yung local surveys. Malaking contribution yung malilit lang na surveys conducted within your local, especially if there are no studies being done yet. Thank you, Ma'am Liz. And so, we were able to get a uh, number of ideas po when it comes to these researches and sana nga po may magtuloy after this webinar kasi nga po gaya ng sabi ni Ma'am Zell hindi siya nakukuha sa one shot survey sa dami ng sa taas ng floral diversity natin relatively sobrang konti nung nag-aaral so malaking area talaga siya for research and in relation pa rin sa research, ma'am, we have another question from Alma Segismundo. Ano pong sampling technique ang pinakamaganda for plant biodiversity? Sampling to? I'm sorry? Sampling technique po, ma. Ah, sampling technique. If we want to get the, the diversity indices, we have um, standard methods in getting biodiversity indices, such as if you are after trees, then you can employ the plot, uh, plot sampling method um, wherein you can um, you may lay out 20 by 20 meter quad um, parang plot and then um, you observe mo yung mga trees na nandun. But if you are after a sm um, the underscores, yung mas malilit na halaman, then you can reduce the plot size to 10 by 10 or 5 by 5 kapag ka yung mga ground species. But if um, pagka, pagka malilit lang na halam, like grasses, mga ganun, then the one by one plot may be enough. But if you are after, um, let's say, elevational biodiversity na isang mountain, then maybe isa sa mga uh, mas efficient na gamitin would be the transect para ma-check ma mo yung elevational uh, biodiversity. Mag-transect ka from lower elevation going up and you may employ um, what do you call this? Um, the blanket from blanket method. So, meron kang specific intervals between um, intervals within the transect and then in, in each um, sampling point, meron kang maliit na quadrat to sample yung mga underground uh, species or understory species as you're saying. Tapos, um, iba din yung sampling method pagdating sa mga bryophytes and lichens. So, meron ka lang maliit na uh, 5 cm by 5 cm na quadrat na pwedeng ilagay lang sa trunk northeast southwest ng trunk at a specific height from the ground. So, ganun naman yung sampling method pagdating sa mga bryophytes sa trunk. Thank you, Ma'am Liz. I hope uh, na-answer po sufficiently yung question nyo. Um, Alma, uh, follow-up 
question po siguro ulit ma'am to tie this uh, since nasa usaping research naman na po tayo and to tie this back to the workshop proper kanina uh, for those who are just starting with plant tax so lalo na ho yung mga senior high school uh, teachers natin are there any what resources can you recommend for them na pwede nilang pagsimulan po okay um for 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 plant taxonomy, especially if you are um, into identification of plants, classifying and identifying plants, we can do kasi, um, identification in several ways. One is through comparison. So, kumuha ka ng picture, tapos hindi mo alam kung anong pangalan ng halaman. And then, what you do is Google and then compare picture. Ah, kamukha niya. So, ito siya. Ito, ito siya malamang. No? So, isa yon sa mga ginagawa niya. Pero hindi 100% na, na tama yung identification ha? kasi hindi natin alam kung may variation sa loob nung napicturean mong flower. Halimbawa. Okay? So, one is comparison. Another one is um, recognition. Siyempre, kung medyo exposed ka na sa field, exposed ka na sa mga vegetational communities, then medyo at first glance pa lang, ah, family rubisi yan. And what about rubisi? Ah, coffee yan. Kasi alam mo na yung tsura niya. Sa, mas, ano to, exposed ka na sa ganong klase. O, ah, ah begonia yan. Kasi by, by looking at it, just the leaf, the flower, begonia yan. Kasi nare-recognize mo na siya. May, may prior knowledge ka na doon sa kanyang identification. Pangatlo is by using the taxonomic key. So may you, you may use some books or publications that are available with taxonomic keys para i-key out mo kung anong species yung hawak mo na specimens. For example, one of the oldest references that we have for taxonomic key is the Flora of Manila by Merrill. So in Flora of Manila, mag-start siya with um, ovary, ovary position. So, ovary inferior or ovary superior. <laughs> alam na alam yung umpisa nung kino. <laughs> so, ovary inferior, ovary superior. Tapos, um, kapag ka inferior ovary mo, then meron ka na namang susunod na lead. Okay? So, you may use taxonomic keys. Marami na rin namang nagpa-publish ngayon ng updated na taxonomic key. Mga, ano to, once they, kasi some journals ngayon and do encourage publication of new species na may kasamang taxonomic key na din with the inclusion of that new species, parang ganun. And fourth one, kapag ka hindi pa rin gumana yung comparison recognition and the use of taxonomic key, ask for an expert na. Okay, so ask for an expert. Now, for new beginners, if you want to compare, kung wala talaga kayo knowledge pa and you want to compare, you can visit um, the, Philipp uh, the Cost Digital Floor of the Philippines somehow isa yun sa mga pinakaaktibong website ngayon doc in, in documenting our Philippine flora. So there are botanists all over the Philippines contributing um, their photo documents plus identification doon sa um, digital flora na yun. So you can go to Cost Digital Flora of the Philippines. That's uh, philippineplants.org. So meron ka doon families of families Tapos, meron kang checklist within that family, meron kang checklist. Tapos, meron din mga photos of each species. So, yun yung pinakita ko kaninang table and statistics ng mga vascular plants. So, yung mga nakalista doon, most of it are photo-documented na din. Na, naka, naka deposit na dun sa website na yun yung mga photos. So, you can compare specimen with that. And, kagandahan noon is, they are posting or they are they are curating mga native plant photos. Okay? Hindi sila or madalang silang maglagay doon ng mga non-native naka-specify naman sa distribution niya if the photo was taken in the Philippines or not. So, yan. Ayan. So, as we can see, ang dami po palang resources. No? So, there's really not a big reason for us not to introduce taxes as students natin. And siguro follow up 
question, ma'am, in relation dun sa nabanggit na resources. Uh, ma'am Alma is asking po if you have any recommendations of a very good reference material for plant taxonomy for both lecture and lab. Um, for plant taxonomy, we are using um, Michael Simpson, Plant Systematics by Simpson. Michael Simpson is um, a good reference, simplified in discussion, niya, but um, nandun lahat yung elements. Tapos, um, we have also book of phylogenetics. Ah, sino kasi yung author ng plant systematics na meron ako ng libro? <laughs> I forgot yung author niya. Can I get? Check ko lang ha. Okay po ma'am. So habang inihintay po natin si ma'am, uh, kung may pahabol po tayong questions, please feel free to use our Q&A uh, portion of this of this uh, Zoom meeting and then you also have our YouTube. Here. So, ito, for the basic principles and theories behind um, biological systematics, I'm also using Shu and, Bra um, and Brower, Plant Systematics by Shu and Brower. And maganda kasi ito, kasi medyo historical yung, I know, kung gusto mong Medyo, in, uh, medyo alamin kung anong background, historical background ng plant systematics taxonomy. This one is a good reference. Tapos, ito, maganda rin tong book na to kasi medyo simplified. Uh, ano to? Med, ma, malawak yung discussion at the same time simplified yung approach. So, yes. Uh, plant systematics by Jude Campbell et al. Jude, Campbell, Kellogg, and others. Maraming references. And actually, para sa plants, isa din sa mga starting reference natin na maganda is the APG. So, the Angiosperm Phylogeny Group. Angiosperm Phylogeny Group, nag-evolve na siya. Ang pinaka-recent is 4, APG 4. So you can check uh, yung, yung classification na, na, in, na inilagay nila sa APG or Angiosperm Phylogeny Group 4 is based on phylogenetic studies. So mga molecular uh, data ang ginamit to come up with that classification, to enhance the classification system ng plants. We also have PPG, PPG1, um, Teridophyte Phylogeny Group 1. It's the first attempt naman to... Um, systematize yung classification naman ng mga fern steridophytes. Wala pa sa bryophytes. Yeah, thank you very much for the very genuine sharing, ma'am. Siguro just to cap everything off, we'll be entertaining our last question from Gilbert Morente. What is your stand or idea, ma'am Lizelle, on experiential learning on the field for plant diversity study or research versus over-exploitation that shall result to environmental degradation? That's my follow-up question po ulit siya. And on what state are we now in the Philippines? Is our floral resources already over-exploited? And last po, medyo mahaba po yung tanong, what are your tips on students, researchers, biologists, plant hobbyists who want to explore our floral diversity? Okay. So yung, ano na nga pa yung unang tanong? First question po, ma'am. Ano po yung stand niyo daw po on experiential learning versus okay. over-exploitation? So an experience ay yung yung sa experiential learning and floral biodiversity especially sa field. Um yun pa rin sa tingin ko yung pinaka best for students, experiential field learning kasi um they would be able to appreciate yung morphological diversity ng mga halaman. They may not be able to identify everything in the field but at least they would be able to appreciate yung variation ng morphology ng halaman. And when we do um, field uh, class field work, we make sure that 
collection of specimen is, is still within um, it we observe um, and the minimal collection with no to minimal damage to the site dun sa vegetation site for example if there are no um, flowers then they are not advised to be collected since mahihirapan din mag-identify yung sujante without flowers and if there are flowers then we get only maximum of three um, copies for vultures, especially that we have herbarium. So, yung iba kasi for class use, and then the other is for herbarium deposit, uh, for herbarium purposes. It deposits just herbarium as collections. But if you are for purposes of taxonomic identification lang within class, then one sample may be enough, basta nandun lahat yung characters, nandun lahat yung mga specimens. So exploitation of these specimens is discouraged. Damage is damage to the population or to the individual na nandun sa site is also discouraged. Hindi um nakalagay din sa mga pangalan nakalagay din sa mga communications with LGUs if we are doing class field work. Yung um number of individuals to be collected once na magko-collect na ng specimen. Pero, in, in recent uh, field works, para ma-reduce nga yung extraction, yung, para ma-reduce din yung extraction ng mga resources sa, mula, sa, mula sa sites, we encourage plant photography, phytophotography. So, uh, fo plant photography for taxonomic purposes not for um not for blogs or for posting sa social media so one picture of the entire plant the entire habit is enough and then more pictures and specific details like the nodes the leaves underneath the surface based uh, other characters to be captured so doon na nagfo-focus so para malesan din yung collection ng um, specimens. And for, for the state, what state are we now in the Philippines? Um, for taxonomic studies, ano kasi yung tatlong stages, Kim? Exploratory stage. <laughs> Nasa exploratory stage pa lang tayo, wherein we are still doing assessments. We are still doing um, floristic surveys. We are still making our list. We are still coming up with a database. We do not have yet a comprehensive um, flora of the Philippines. What we have so far is that flora of Manila by Merrill, which was published in 1917 by Yun something like that, or 1970 or 1930 something. That is, so far, yung pinaka-comprehensive pa lang na document na meron tayo. Pero we are trying um, our best naman, our, our botanists in the Philippines, with, in, in collaboration with other botanists abroad, are trying to come up with a more comprehensive list of Philippine flora. So you have there the cost digital floor, which is a voluntary, voluntary ano lang siya, effort ng mga um, botanists and enthusiasts. So so far yun yung pinaka working working um, site na meron tayo. And for bryophytes naman, oh, yung pinaka comprehensive list na meron. Palang tayo is that uh, Moses of the Philippines by Bartram. And that is 19, kaedad lang ng Meryl din. <laughs> Early 1900s, yung edad, lang, edad ng Moses of the Philippines by Bartram. And then, yung nagiging reference ko, for example, sa Moses, is um, yung mga recent publications nila, kalat-kalat pa siya, localized, public, uh, localized surveys on mosses. Like most of the most publications ngayon, graphite publications ngayon is from Mindanao. Okay? <clears throat> Tapos medyo 
um, konti-konti lang yung nang, nanggagaling dito sa Southern and Cordillera ng Luzon. Tapos, um, so, so yun, parang we do not have yet a comprehensive flora of the Philippines. We are still in the exploratory stage kung saan active, na, uh, nagiging aktibo tayo ngayon sa pag-document ng ating flora. Pero because of lack of, minsan may mga challenges kasi. Um, like um, yung, yung, yung sinalihan ko na NGO and, and, and this, uh, whose agenda, uh, which agenda is undocumenting Philippine native plants. Um, ano yun? Sariling effort sa paghanap ng pondo para makapag-field work. So walang government support, kumbaga, on doing such um, research. Maliban na lang kung ilalobby siya sa mga ibang organizations like NRCP. They also call uh, proposals for biodiversity-related researches. So medyo limited lang kasi yung opportunity for funding to, to, to do researches in biodiversity. Kaya naman, maintindihan din kung bakit medyo, medyo um, mabagal tayo sa pag-document ng ating Philippine flora. Pero recently naman, yun, mas medyo nagiging active naman sa pag-explore ng ating Philippine flora. Now, is our flora resources already overexploited? Um, the floral resources are not exploited I may say that kasi kung titingnan natin ang daming underutilized na flora ng Pilipinas, most of the um, plants that we use for timber, for economic purposes, for park purposes, for aesthetic value, mga introduced species. For the native plants, they are not exploited. I may say that maliban lang sa ating mga hardwood species ng trees. Pero, though they are not exploited, overexploited, their habitat are being lost. So, nawawala na yung mga habitat nila and so are the floral resources. Nawawala na din yung mga native species natin. So, for students, researcher, uh, researchers, biologists, hobbyists who want to explore our floral diversity, you may start with capturing photos. Nauuso ngayon ang citizen science. Citizen science that is um they are they are contributing what they found in their own backyard or in their own um trek. Kung may mga lakad sila, they they usually do photo documentations, share it to experts or share it to fellow enthusiasts hanggang sa um makapag-create sila ng record of distribution. Isa yun sa mga ginagawa din ng ilang researchers natin. Citizen science on distribution of plants. So, photo documentation or digital uh, digital phyto, I'm sorry, digital cyber no. Um cyber taxonomy as they call. Using photos in documenting or in documenting flora is also acknowledged as one method at hindi lang yung at hindi lang yung actual field work tapos collection of specimens. Um, the publication of Lefranchi, James Lefranchi, um, in-emphasize niya doon yung paggamit ng photography, digital photography, as, um, as a way of um, doing plant surveying. So there is no need for extraction or there is no need for collection of specimens. Kasi if you do collection, you have to ask permit from DNR. So, kailangan mo muna ng may clearances ka pa sa mga LGUs, mga ganun. So, it's not really that um, simple or not easy to collect specimens for taxonomic purposes. So, what we do kung minsan is to simply photo document. Okay, so that can, that can be done by students as well and um, other researchers. 
Thank you so much, ma'am. Ayan, marami po tayong natutunan today. Actually, sa participants, para po tayo nag-crash course ng isang semester ng Botan Course. And hopefully, na-appreciate nyo po. And uh, hopefully, nagka-idea din po kayo kung paano nyo i-implemento sa ating kanya-kanyang klase after this uh, webinar. Ayan, uh, of course, we would also like to thank Ma'am Lizelle for her time. Alam na yung busy kayo, ma'am. And we have... Uh, Gaya nga ho nang nasabi ko, ang dami namin natutunan. And we have the your rich experience to thank for that. And that being said, we would like to present this Certificate of Appreciation to you, Ma'am Nizel. So let me just read the citation. Certificate of Appreciation. This is presented to Prof. Lizel M. Magtoto for serving as a resource speaker for the talk entitled Introduction to Floristic Biodiversity, Rekindling Appreciation in Our Students during the virtual 27th Summer Institute in the Natural Science and Mathematics with the theme Upgrading Senior High School Science and Mathematics Education, Content and Competency Part 2. And with the Department of Biology sub-theme, Rekindling Appreciation of Biodiversity from Classroom to Community, held April 25, 2022. Signed by the Chair of the Summer Institute in the Natural Sciences and Mathematics or Cynism, Prof. Nejiti Baggangao, and then our Dean of the College of Science, Prof. Dimpna N. Javier. Again, thank you so much, Ma'am, for your time. And we would also like to thank our participants for gracing this event with us. Please do not forget to join our community on all our social media platforms. So we have the Facebook page for the Cynism, and then we also have the Facebook group para sa biology cluster. So please make sure that uh, you are a member of that group. We might be posting the announcement through that uh, Facebook group. And also, a uh, final reminder for today, for tomorrow's activity po with Ma'am Zenaida, kindly document some insects. I sorry, uh, Prof. Bagkangal, uh, kindly document some insects that you will encounter po this afternoon or kahit tomorrow ng early morning. That will be used in your workshop activity. And for the certificate of participation, as we have said earlier, uh, you have to answer yung evaluation form na yung link ay nasa chat box ng ating uh, Zoom and YouTube streaming. I think the tech team has already uh, forwarded the link in the chat box. Ayan, so thank you again, everyone. This has been the day one of the 27th Cynism under the biology cluster. And we would like of, uh, to thank, of course, yung organizers and facilitators natin primarily your Cynism Committee and the representatives of the Department of Biology. We would also like to extend our special thanks to the SNO, uh, lagi po namin maasahan ng SNO, and our team of technical personnel, so yung mga nasa behind the screens po natin, and moderators. Again, maraming maraming salamat po and magandang araw po sa ating Thank you po. Thank you, Ma'am Liz. Salamat din. Thank you po, Ma'am Liz.